Good morning, uh, everyone who is watching this um, telehealth conference. I am Suhail Chuktai, and I am based in London as an orthopedic surgeon and also a telehealth uh, strategist and consultant. Um, I welcome you to this uh, International Telehealth Conference 2021, and we are going to be discussing sharing experience and knowledge on the innovations and the latest trends of telehealth. The very idea of this conference is to update you with what's happening and what is transforming healthcare delivery services in developed world and also in the developing world. So today I have the player of having the audience in various parts of the world this conference is being live streamed at multiple points. So the audience is divided in various streams. In certain areas, it is being translated, transcribed on the screen in local language. And in others, uh, as the English spoke, spoken English is heard and understood in many other countries, so it will not be transcribed in those streams. So I welcome you again as you join this initiative by Medical City Online, jointly with Adam Global and the Adam Global's healthcare division. Dr. Afshin Gofrani will also be joining us. Uh, I want to start with a message from one of the leading authorities on telemedicine. It's no other than Professor J. Sanders. Professor Jay Sanders is the founder and current president of American Telemedicine Association. So I want to display at the moment in America, it's about 4 a.m. or 3 a.m., uh, depending on which part of states you are. So I didn't want to wake Professor up. I asked him to send a message which we uh, voiced over and I want to play that now. Professor J. Sanders' message coming on screen. Thank you, Suhail, for asking me to say a few words at the opening of your Telehealth Innovation Conference 2021 on the 6th of November in England, the UK. I applaud your efforts in helping to make my mentor, Dr. Kenneth Bird's dream of the impact that telemedicine could have on the healthcare delivery system a reality. Having started doing telemedicine in 1969, we fought technological, infrastructural, legal, regulatory and reimbursement issues back then. The progress of telemedicine in those days was quite inhibited in contrast to the current times. Sadly, it took a pandemic to awaken everyone to its potential benefits in addressing the delivery system's access, cost, and quality issues. Your efforts and those of your colleagues at this conference, I am sure, will assure that access to affordable, up-to-date healthcare will be a universal right, wherever and whoever you are. Thank you, Suhail, again for all your so meaningful efforts. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. J. Sanders, for always being a mentor, a supporter, and you've done incredible work for telemedicine around the world. So uh, I, I, I am taking time from Professor Angus Wallace, but I think this time, Professor, you can add to your conversation, to your lecture, so it's not I'm not stealing your time. I just want to take out this opportunity to introduce uh, Adam Global, which is a consulting company based in Dubai and England, and Professor Tahir Akhtar, who is a consultant ICU uh, physician and also an anesthetist at a very senior level in the management and academics in um, Basildon University Hospital. He is the founder of Adam Global, and he has uh, come forward with this idea to join hands with my company, Medical City Online, which is a telehealth company based in London, to do a joint venture and get the education on telehealth around the world through us. So it's a joint venture between Adam Global and Medical City Online. And uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Afshin Gofrani 
He's the uh, not only the lead UAE conference coordinator, but also the head of the um, Adam Global Healthcare Division. So without further delay, I want to invite the session chair for this next set of six lectures. And that is no other than Professor Ruthimi Jaisimi. Now, Professor Ruthimi Jaisimi, I want to briefly introduce and then I'll ask him to uh, explain further. He's a consultant gynecologist based at Basel University Hospital. At the same time, he's a telehealth enthusiast and has done a lot of work in this field. So I take opportunity to invite Professor Jessimi on the podium. Professor Jessimi. Yeah, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending from what part of the world you are listening onto this conference. Uh, it's a delight to be with you. I'm Rotimi Jaisami, and as you've been told, a consultant in obstetrics and gynecology. More recently, I've had the experience due to COVID of having to see patients virtually, including obstetric patients. You might wonder how that is possible, but you'll get to hear about that as we go on later. And more recently, I published a book, authored a book, Emerging Technologies in Healthcare. Uh, it was published uh, this year, and you'll find it on Amazon. Uh, it's not an advert, but just to let you know that these things are possible. Today, you will be hearing from eminent speakers about the value of telemedicine in healthcare and why we need to adopt it. If we don't, we will be left behind. And telemedicine can take place in any part of the world, whether urban, rural, low resource, or rich countries. Our very first speaker for this session is Professor Wallace Angus, who is the founder of Health Informatics Department at the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. I'm going to invite him to the podium, the virtual podium, because he's not here in Southend, and he will tell us a little bit about himself. He's got about 15 minutes for his talk, and we'll take questions and answers after that. The title of his talk is Compelling Issues for the Adoption of E-Health-Based Healthcare Practice. So over to you, Angus, and thank you for joining us. You're welcome, and I'm delighted to come and join you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen from all over the world, I apologize for not being there, and I also apologize for not wearing a tie, but I'm officially on a family holiday at Glen Eagles. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and show a window or screen. Can you see my sheen, my screen? Not yet. Ah, right. Okay. Let me go back. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Right. So that should be full screen. Agreed? Yeah, that's fine. It's on, on full screen now. Yeah. Uh, I am delighted to talk about compelling issues for the adoption of e-health-based healthcare um, because I think it is really important. And this is a presentation both from the UK and from Scotland. Uh, I live in England, but I am uh, allegiant to Scotland. And this is where I am at the moment. I'm at Glen Eagles, um, amazing place up in Scotland uh, with the Grampian Hills in the background. Now, so, sorry, Prof, your slides are not visible. Can you select the right screen to, to share? I tried to. I think that uh, shared, but you need to choose the right tab where the PowerPoint slides can be seen. Okay, right. Let's go back. 
No uh, worries. That's why I asked you. We can see your screen, but not the slides. Right. So you can see my screen. I've got the slides up on my screen now, but you can't see that. Uh, maybe you can uh, stop share and share again the right screen. Right. It will come uh, as you press the share button. It will option offer you options. Are we there now? Yes, we got it. Please go ahead. Right. And you can so the first slide is the play title the slide. Show. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. So this is Glen Eagles with uh, Grampian Hills uh, close to the hotel. But I really want to. Uh, talk about uh, uh, telemedicine, where you have the medical staff in one location and the patient in another. This has been stimulated by the uh, coronavirus. And one of the only certainties in our coronavirus experience is that if you are medical staff in hospital and you're treating a patient with telemedicine through telemedicine at home there is every evidence that you cannot get coronavirus from your patient in that arrangement now that is really important and i'll explain why in a minute in a minute our Prime Minister and our Health Minister in the UK have stated that GPs should now see patients face to face. We have not got through this pandemic and there is still a risk of infection to both doctor and patient in a face to face meeting. And it's inappropriate at the moment to have a face to face meeting without masks. Whereas if you are carrying out a telemedicine consultation, no masks are required. Uh, so, sorry, Prof, can I interject? Can you select the slide you are speaking about? I think you're again on a different slideshow, but can you select the slide from the left side panel uh, where the PowerPoint outside the slideshow so that people can see your slide? Yeah, like this. You can carry on like this. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Right, okay. You don't get such a good show. <sighs> right. Now, in Scotland, where I am at the moment, <clears throat> they have used a lot of telemedicine, partly because Scotland is a country with a relatively small population spread out over a large area. This year, a review of video consultation services in Scotland was carried out by Wharton, Greenhalgh and Shaw, and that has been published in the Journal of Medical Internet Research. It has shown that Scotland provides an important national case study from which other countries may learn. It stated that they had no problems with their telemedicine platform. That was interesting because when that same platform, Attend Anywhere, was used in England, it caused a crisis in the middle of the coronavirus epidemic because it did not work properly. And many doctors and patients wasted many hours because the platform was not up to the job of delivering telemedicine. 
This is why it's really important to have a good platform that delivers telemedicine well. And at the moment, the platforms available to do that have not really been structured very well. <clears throat> the virus resurgence is a real problem. And this week, our deputy medical director in England, Professor Jonathan Van Tam, warned that we had months ahead of ongoing coronavirus problems. So we really ought to be looking at the best use of telemedicine to help us through this ongoing pandemic. We now know that a number of things work really well with telemedicine and e-health. The things that work well are prompt advice and guidance given to patients from the hospital using telemedicine. Dermatology has been a particular uh, subject where uh, taking a picture of skin rashes and ulcers and sharing that through telemedicine has allowed better management of patients. And the dermatologists have found that telemedicine has been a godsend for their practice. You can also do good ophthalmological quick screening, looking at conjunctivitis, but not in detail at the um, using a, an ophthalmoscope. Cancer screening, I'm going to talk about shortly, but the area where we really should be using uh, telemedicine is with patient reported outcomes. When a patient has a treatment, a procedure, their outcome is uh, assessed using patient reported outcomes, that can all be done virtually. And it is a nonsense now for patients to have to come up to hospital in order to have that established. Um, what does not work? We now know that lower abdominal and gyneco gynecological assessment should not be done using a telemedicine platform. You, you do have to examine your patient. Uh, a recent study has indicated that rheumatology patients don't like uh, telemedicine, and I'll come to that. And if a patient has a major mental health problem, you cannot deal with that using telemedicine. <clears throat> this is a good study of rheumatology that's just been published, uh, where they showed that both doctors and patients did not find telemedicine uh, very satisfactory. And one senior clinician, said the rapid digitalization and use of telemedicine must stay, but appropriate patient selection is key. It is perfect for some, but disastrous for others. If we look at my own specialty of orthopedic surgery, uh, there has been a lot of work done on how satisfied patients are with telemedicine uh, undergoing orthopedic care. And these studies have shown that telemedicine has been very successful with orthopedics and is currently being used around the world for orthopedics. And if you look at uh, cancer screening, uh, this is something that is a real concern at the moment because GPs have been uh, accused of not doing sufficient cancer screening for their patients. If you look at the red flags that are recommended by NICE to identify patients with a cancer screening assessment, a lot of this can actually be done completely with telemedicine. How old is the patient? They will tell you. What are the symptoms like? They can tell you in a virtual consultation. Do they have severe unremitting pain? They can tell that to you virtually. 
Do they have localized spinal tenderness? You cannot do that with a telemedicine consultation, but you can develop diagrams and ask a friend or a local nurse to help with that part of the assessment. No symptomatic improvement after four to six weeks. You can pick that up with telemedicine. Unexplained weight loss, you can. Past history of cancer, again, you can pick all that up. So GPs should be seriously thinking about using telemedicine for cancer screening. One of the things I feel very strongly about is uh, training teams to use telemedicine. One of the things that has not been done well is how you treat, how you train doctors, nurses, medical staff to use the telemedicine platforms. Now, I'm a retired orthopedic surgeon, but I started working with health informatics in 2000. And I set up one of the first NHS telemedicine clinics in 2011. I'm also working with Suhail um, with training in informatics, both here and in Pakistan. It's important to train the medical team members. They've got to train on the equipment. They've got to know about the patient before they start. They need a checklist of information required before starting a telemedicine consultation, a referral letter, patient's contact number, list of patient's medication, medical notes through the electronic patient record, x-rays through the PAC system, and other information. Most patients will use a mobile phone or a tablet. Some will use a laptop or desktop, but they are few. The patient's device should be fully charged and plugged in. Identification is required because you have to be sure that the patient at the other end is who they say they are. And before the consultation, you need to get consent from the patient and ensure that the patient has the equipment that is needed. Tell the patient that a confidential place is important because you will be wanting to speak to them face to face and some of the discussion may be very confidential. And avoid noisy places. There is no point in getting a patient to carry out a telemedicine consultation from a busy street with cars all around them. And it's important to prepare your environment to get the best out of the facilities and avoid local noise. Get a comfortable seat, arrange good lighting, avoid noise disturbance, have a good background that will suit your patient and ensure you can take additional notes as necessary. It's also really important that the discussion from your consultation is documented, transcribed, and included in the patient's notes. Now, I'm happy to take any emails and deal with any questions that arise, but I'm now throwing this open for people to ask me any questions they may have uh, about telemedicine and uh, uh, about how we are going. So I'm now going to uh, stop sharing, come back to you, yeah, thank, thank you. Problem. Thank you, Angus. Um, we will take questions uh, virtually uh, if there are any questions at the moment. Um, one very important thing you highlighted in your talk was the fact that appropriate patient selection is key. And I think that's one of the take home messages from what you've delivered today. Uh, and it also heartening to know that one can screen for cancer uh, by using the red flag uh, symptoms or signs. Uh, so that's reassuring. 
because these are things that worry the public and these are things that I think telemedicine can overcome. Uh, at the moment, uh, we've got people virtually. Uh, I can't see any question, uh, but I would want to ask you one question about gynecology because, you know, I am a gynecologist and you've said um, gyne assessment is not possible. Uh, that is correct. Um, but one of the things we do, even after undertaking a pelvic examination, is an ultrasound examination. Uh, yeah. So we call took a history uh, via telemedicine and organized for the patient to have pelvic imaging and then review thereafter. And if it's possible, live um, imaging. So that's how I think in gynecology, we will overcome that. What are your I, views? No, I agree with you. And I think that we have not even touched on what is possible uh, using uh, telemedicine because you can connect equipment to your telemedicine platform. You can actually monitor heart rate. You can monitor uh, ECGs uh, with a device connected to the telemedicine platform. And that can all be done from a distance. Uh, but people haven't quite taken that on yet. They haven't realized what is possible and at the moment in the UK, there's a huge emphasis on building new hospitals. I actually think that that is illogical in this day and age, that what we want to have are telemedicine stations that people report to and then are linked to hospitals. And you don't need to build new big hospitals to carry out consultations. And it amazes me that nobody in our government and our Department of Health has realized that this is an option which is being neglected. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'm sure people are listening, uh, those who write our policies and our policy decision makers. Uh, there's a question here for you, and it says, are there any differences to note or consider in rural versus urban health settings, especially in the developing nations? Well, Suhail and I have written a book on telemedicine in Pakistan. And one of the chapters in that book focuses on how in Pakistan, you can deliver a much better medical care system uh, in the rural setting if you use telemedicine to do that. And um, uh, this book was uh, produced fairly quickly because it was stimulated by the pandemic, uh, but it actually has all sorts of tips and tricks about how you can uh, improve rural health care uh, by using telemedicine. And uh, in fact, in Pakistan, that is happening and Suhail has already been given national awards for the work that he's done in that area. Lovely, thank you. Uh, while you were speaking, I did show uh, a picture of the book that I could both see it. You, yeah. you, you saw it, right? And I will recommend it. I have read it and I will recommend it to people. Uh, there are no further questions. And uh, Angus would like to thank you for uh, a very insightful. Uh, presentation. Uh, what a way to start the day. Uh, thank you and enjoy your holidays. I'm driving back to England, so I can't take part in the rest of the meeting. Uh, have, a, have a very successful meeting. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, you've heard from Professor Angus Wallace, and I'm going to call on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Suhail uh, Chudai, who is an expert in telemedicine as well as an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he's going to tell you more about this. Uh, he's central to today's conference, uh, but he will be sharing his experience of telemedicine with you. 
So I will be inviting Suhil over to the podium, please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Professor Jasimi, for introducing, and what a wonderful talk we had from Professor Angus Wallace. Uh, I'm going to share my slides, and let me just turn them on. My topic today is the essentials of telemedicine, that how can we actually do telemedicine? But before we do that, what are the basic steps? So I'm going to share my screen. So hope you can see my screen. I'm going to start with that. So uh, without further uh, kind of prologue, let's go straight into the topic. What are the types of telemedicine? Now imagine that a patient sitting and talking to the doctor from their laptop. There is no intervening person. That is direct telemedicine. This would require the use of an app, mobile app, or a website. Both doctor and patient are directly communicating. There is no helper, there's no coordinator. And as you know that increasingly, the devices are getting better. Mobile phone, megapixel resolution is touching the resolution of a, a DSLR camera. And the bandwidth is improving the RAM on the mobile phone is improving. So direct telemedicine is becoming easier and easier. In fact, there are 30%, thir there, are, there are about 20 governments which have invested more than 30% from the previous year budget into the bandwidth speed. So direct telemedicine is very convenient. It's like a doctor's visit to the patient's home. Patient is comfortable, relaxed no waiting time, no traveling, no social or logistic burden on the patient except the laptop and, or mobile phone. So that is direct telemedicine where patient doctor communicate without help of anybody. The essential part of that is the software design has to be very, very simple. It should be manageable by even a five to six year old child using colors and pictures. So the essential part of this is the de design of the software from the patient end. At the same time, we have a little compromise on the information flow from the patient side because we cannot put an ultrasound scan next to it. We cannot in, in do sophisticated EMR, but the patient can take pictures of x-rays, investigations, and upload from that. So that is some uh, lack of sophistication, but at the benefit is the patient is at home, not leaving and this is very useful in pandemic. So the example of that is this software, where you can see the doctors are online. That was the one I designed for National Telemedicine Helpline for Pakistan in the first wave of pandemic, COVID pandemic. And patients were at home, confined. They could not go out to see a doctor. So they wanted instant available doctor 24 seven. And that online button was ticking inviting patients to click, put name and the, the city and meet the doctor. It was kept deliberately simple with an idea to improve the access and the speed. Now, what, what if we want to add sophistication or we want to get the patient out of perspective of telemedicine, just get the patient somewhere and be seen by a doctor. Now, the specialist doctor could not reach that place but the patient can go to a pharmacy, a kiosk, with, which is operated by a trained telemedicine assistant. And that person can connect the patient to a specialist far away. So that means there is zero learning curve from the patient side. We control the training by training the telemedicine assistant. What does that mean? That we have very little variables where we have no control. We control the devices we can attach, 
अल्ट्रासाउंड मशीन अ माइक्रोस्कोप ई एन टी कैमरा आई कैमरा एट द सेम टाइम पेशेंट विट कम सेट एंड स्टार्ट एंड देन वी कैन हैव अ जी पी इन्वॉल्व देयर सो वी कैन राइट अ प्रिस्क्रिप्शन इफ इट्स एन इंटरनेशनल कॉन्वर्सेशन सो द लोकल डॉक्टर कैन बी द प्राइमरी केयर रिस्पॉन्सिबल फिजिशियन फॉर दैट पेशेंट हु इज सीन बाई अ स्पेशलिस्ट अब्रॉड and that is called as assisted telemedicine or hub and spoke telemedicine spoke is the place where the patient comes hub is the point where the doctor sits that can be fixed like a pharmacy can be a mobile spoke like a motor a motorbike rider reaching with a tablet to the patient's home this is an example where uh, there are groups of specialists who can be contacted by the patients attending a pathology lab or a pharmacy the third model is hybrid which means that you can start direct but the doctor says i want more information go to some some local spot where there is ultrasound machine or vice versa patient says well i can do this my home at my at my home i've learned enough so that is both ways hybrid model and this is getting very popular in fact this model one of the example is here where both possibility exist possibilities exist now clinical types general opd does not require much sophistication simple emr where patients can take pictures upload specialist opd telemedicine which means that you can attach probes like a stethoscope a digital stethoscope telepsychiatry you can put depression scores in that you can put even spirometer in a telepulmonology clinic you can put gyroscopic measurements uh, devices for neck movement for back movement for knee shoulder joints in orthopedic practice the third type is third clinical type is integrated telehealth hospital system ITHS that is where the whole hospital is paperless the surgery the clinics the operation theaters the pharmacy they're all integrated even the ward rounds are happening on tablets with doctor not there unless the doctor has to be there ambulance based telemedicine the moment the patient is picked up the digital triage by a doctor starts the doctor is not in ambulance but the tablet picks it up and gives instruction now this could be life saving because those critical instructions when the patient is transferred are very relevant and that can save life there is actually a research paper on that that some of the patients who die or die on arrival because they could not get the right instructions telemedicine in a box mobile unit a suitcase good for the barracks army barracks in the front or villages so tele supervision of surgical procedures a junior surgeon can be supervised by a senior surgeon through a very well designed telemedicine software uh, all what i'm talking about has been developed and i've been working around 20 years on such uh, technology uh, luckily um, we have them all, all working in practice and available now what about telediagnostic services where a patient can get instant result like a swab or a zn stain of the for tuberculosis the digital microscope can connect a pathologist far far away and then while the patient is waiting the results are possible in fact the pathologist in a city can even manipulate the microscope sitting in a in a in a, in a village so other types are electronic types single channel like a doctor patient talking and just one cam one camera one camera on each side and audio a multi channel when there are two doctors consulting the same patient like a rheumatologist and orthopedic surgeon multi channel can be when a patient gets um a relative involved because they cannot speak the same language or for the sake of confidence or you can connect multiple devices like ultrasound machine multiple cameras that's all multi channel so what are the service delivery models telemedicine can be done at a workplace people with minor back aches minor shoulder pains can be seen there without taking day off can be at school like a 24/7 nurse or school time nurse online army de deployments the front barracks don't have to have replacement that means the soldiers don't have to be replaced for minor illnesses charity camps ship air journeys mass public spots and of course kiosks at shopping centers and places for basic health check and screening so the evolution of technology i want to emphasize on this and i want you to carefully listen to this part as well that telephone calls to doctor patient that's long gone now 
we are talking about bandwidth. When you're using WhatsApp, that is, you, you're not using tele network, telephone network, using internet, voice over IP. So that means the telemedicine is no more a telephone call to the patient. It's actually a live two-way video set side by side. But if that is not within the medical records, that's again not the true telemedicine. That's not clinical telemedicine. That means you've got a spreadsheet and you've got a video window like Skype or Zoom and you're putting them together. That's not telemedicine. That's video chatting on spreadsheets or data. The telemedicine is when you make a single code and everything is merged securely, GDPR compliant, HIPAA compliant in one single code. Live video plus a clinical decision support system, hospital management system, and all the specialized gadgets embedded in that. That's called telemedicine. So clinical telemedicine has patient registration, appointment, practice management, text, images, sound, and video, video part. You can save that video clip for a review. Two-way consultation, of course, video. You collect the data. There are forms, like if you have a knee pain symptom, then the knee pain form will come up. That means a junior doctor can be guided through that system, that how to examine the knee. Do not miss the checklist. Nice guidelines can be put in that system. Clinical decision support system. For example, there could be possible four to five differential diagnoses. Artificial intelligence system can be embedded within telemedicine. So that helps the clinician. Against the critical decision has to be taken by the clinician, but there is uh, working memory support in the form of artificial intelligence. Prescription management. Interspecialty referrals, disease screening and research tools, clinical audit and governance system. Now, that's not possible through simple video chatting software. They are meant for video chatting. They're not meant for telemedicine, especially the patient education portal, when you have kept certain information which you want to train the patient and teach the patient and improve the compliance of the treatment. So this is a design of the software, one of them. I want to show you how the layout is. The middle window, this one, is the patient. The doctor side is small because it's a doctor screen. So the doctor can see the patient in a bigger window. And these are all the clinical decision support system tabs. One tab will open a wealth of information and controls, but I've kept them single tabs so that it's not cluttered. On this side, you see more tabs, patient education, send diagrams, preview summary, check e-prescription, send prescription. All that is the design, the way I see telemedicine. For example, a patient and doctor can share the same screen within the software to see the form. The form can be filled with the help of the doctor. Doctor can share the result and talk to the patient live. This is what it is. And the patient can ask questions. Patient is no more looking at the doctor's face to, to guess it's a bad report, it's a good report. They are looking at the same report. X-rays again, the patient can question, what is that lump? What is that white, white shadow? Patient's pictures can be saved and restored on the subsequent visit to say, well, look, antibiotics are working. The swelling is down. Same in information can be added. And then patient can be visually examined. Brief notes can be made. Diagnosis can be put for research. Further tests can be requested. Prescription can be written and sent directly to the uh, patient. Doctor can educate by their videos. Doctor can play their own video. Like in this case, there's a doctor who is using her YouTube clips to play the video. Then doctor can show pictures and the pictures can be sent to the patient as a reference. So this is where we stand. And I believe that telemedicine is evolving at such a pace. If you don't keep tab with that, we're going to be losing the advantage of giving the best care to the patient. Thank you very much. I can take some questions if there are any. Uh, or we can, if the time is short, uh, please let us know. Yeah. I invite uh, Professor Jasimi. Yeah, thank you, Suhail, for that um, wonderful exposure to what telemedicine is, and more importantly, uh, differentiating. Uh, the difference between clinical telemedicine and just a phone call. Uh, I stress that because in certain places, even in rich countries, 
uh, we are still just using the phone call. But the way forward is to be able to have eye contact with the patient and the patient being able to interact directly with you. And so thank you for taking us through the different uh, clinical settings that one can use uh, your portal for. I think one of the questions that have, has come up is what is the security uh, behind uh, these systems? Uh, you hear about hackers, and one of the questions that has been raised is how secure are uh, my records when I speak to you over the telemedicine portal? Uh, thank you, Professor Jashimi. Uh, this is a, a very relevant question. In every country, there are data regulation acts. In UK, we have GDPR, ICO, in America, HIPAA, and countries are increasingly putting data control act. Uh, along, along with that, the software has to be SSL uh, labeled. That means secure socket layer. That means the website should be known. Then there should be a triple level encryption, which means that the password is not going to be seen by even the admin. At the same time, the retrievability should be minimized to one known person. Uh, along with that, the, the data encryption uh, it should be based on the folder levels. There's also uh, advanced security in the blockchain manner. The non-crypto part of blockchain is coming up to help telemedicine. And uh, we, I think we are lucky that we're living in an era where there is so much technology available to protect the data. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, giving that response. Uh, I think it provides reassurance uh, to the public that uh, your details are kept confidential and they are safe, uh, just like you would normally uh, be uh, keeping the hospital records safe uh, in the hospital setting. Um, there are no further questions here, but I understand that... Um, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Javed Akram, uh, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Health Sciences, Pakistan, is going to speak to us virtually. And I'm going to invite him uh, to come and talk to us. Like I said, he also leads the telehealth project uh, in Pakistan. So over to you, uh, Javed. Uh, please introduce yourself so that the audience can know uh, more about you. Thank you. We're trying to get him on board. Uh, while we try to get um, Javed on board, uh, I will just say one or two things about telemedicine. Uh, people wonder more so about the rural areas that how would people in the villages have access to this? But one thing we have to realize that over the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen how the use of mobile phones, Android or iOS, has taken place. Even in rural areas, people who are not educated have mobile phones. And with each version upgrades that's coming up with mobile phones, it's now possible to use your mobile phone as a, a portal or as a source to engage with your clinician. Uh, so it's possible uh, in rural areas as well. Uh, people talk about also, what about broadband coverage in those areas? Uh, but where, wherever you have a mobile phone, there will be some broadband coverage. Yes, it may not be as fast as what you'd expect. But one of the good things is that at the receiving end, yes, the uh, loading speed might be low, but when it gets to the doctor's portal, it is faster, the pictures are clearer, 
And that is one reassurance one can give, more so when you're examining the skin or other images. Uh, so it is possible. Uh, I do know that uh, grandparents, uh, people over 70, use the mobile phone. And it's convenient, as uh, Dr. Suhil has said, Coburn spoke. Patients don't have to travel for many miles to see a doctor any longer. Even people in the, in the urban areas, you don't have to get or hop onto buses. You don't have to, I mean, look for where to park your car. It can be difficult in hospitals. And these are things that telemedicine is going to help. Now in Glasgow at the moment, we're talking about climate change. Imagine the number of cars and buses on the road when people go to hospital. With telemedicine, you will not have to do that anymore. And it's going to reduce the carbon uh, footprint. So it is uh, uh, the way forward. And COVID has shown us that it is possible uh, to undertake these things. We've seen videos or images on the television of people in ITUs, that is intensive care units, are speaking to their family members at home. And that's because during COVID, which we still are in, people were not allowed to visit physically uh, hospitals. And so they couldn't uh, get in touch with their uh, family members physically. But with the use of tablets, that was made possible. And so as we progress, things are going to get better. That much I can say. And I would encourage our young ones in the university because they have access to the mobile phones to show an interest in tele, uh, the use of technology in their various uh, specialties, not just in healthcare, it can be used in finance, in banking, in accountancy. So don't just use your mobile phones for social media purposes. Think about what you can use it for. Remember how Facebook started? It was in a dorm in a university. And so it's a challenge to our young ones globally to continue to think about innovation innovation, innovation. That is what we would like to see in the coming years. Uh, we'll see if we've been able to connect through to Javed. Uh, we had some traffic issues, so we'll give him five minutes. Right. Uh, we will uh, give him five minutes. I understand uh, there is traffic issues. You see, this is one of the things I initially told you about. Uh, if he were going to do that from home, uh, he wouldn't have had to be in the car stuck in the traffic. Uh, you will be seeing him live direct from his desk uh, talk. Um, so while we do that, uh, we'll take a short break uh, and we'll be back with you in a few minutes. And to those who have joined us uh, globally, virtually, uh, we welcome you again. Uh, Please, if you do have questions for the different speakers, please could you put it in the Q&A box and we will take uh, the questions. Thank you. I will try and look at the comments um, on from the virtual audience. Uh, one person said, looking at the screen, nine to five can be very draining. 
Uh, yes, I know where you're coming from, um, but you would know that computers, laptops, desktops nowadays have filters uh, to protect the user's eyes. Uh, so doctors or healthcare practitioners will not have to strain their eyes too much. That's been taken into consideration uh, in the development of laptops or desktops. In addition, one would not expect any clinician uh, to sit down from nine to five. Uh, it's not good for one's health. Uh, you should take short breaks, have a walk around, let the circulation go in. Uh, in doing so, you revitalize yourself, uh, you refresh your eyes, uh, and that is good. I'm just looking through the questions. Uh, and the comments show that in, re in respect of the talk by Professor Wallace, uh, it says, thank you, very insightful. Uh, about Suhil's talk, it says, a uh, brilliant program with eminent speakers. Thank you so much for this learning opportunity. And these comments are coming from various people uh, in different parts of the world. Another one says, thank you, Professor Wallace. Right. I understand that uh, Javed is around and he's going to join us in a minute. And while we wait for him to join, uh, there's no perfection in life. Uh, even with technology, for as long as you have that human interface, there will, there will always be imperfection. But we always strive for improvement. Uh, you will hear people talk about quality improvement, self-improvement. And yes, with technology, you will get glitches. Whether it's flying men to the moon, you may have to abort flights at times, uh, cancel even airline flights or, or ships going on cruises. Uh, but we'll learn from situations such as this. And I can promise you that in the coming years, we will be at a situation where perhaps we'll even be almost virtually in the same room when discussing with a patient. Um, yesterday, I was at a meeting, and one of the questions, it had to do with telemedicine as well that somebody raised was when we go technical we're all talking technical technology what's going to happen to the physical contact between human beings uh it's still going to exist there's no way technology is going to replace human beings uh whether it's robotic surgery or robotics in whatever we do human contacts is important. We are relational people, and there will be opportunities to socialize physically, uh, to still attend meetings, scientific meetings, physically, uh, if you want to. The beauty of technology is that it's giving you an option to either attend, for example, a scientific conference uh, virtually, or whether you want to go there physically, and add a holiday to it. So uh, let, uh, be reassured that the um, physical contact between human beings uh, is not going to be erased from uh, our people. No, not at all. We are relational people. Right. Um, 
One of the other things that we would like to discuss while we wait for Javed, uh, what is the benefit, really, of telemedicine uh, to our patients, as well as to professionals? Now, for patients, you don't have to be in the waiting room. Or even before the waiting room, I had spoken about having to drive, thinking of child care. Uh, but let's assume you solve that. Then you get to the hospital. There's no risk of transmission effect. The doctor is at your home. That is, you can see the doctor virtually. I understand Javed is here. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, Professor Akram. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you, and uh, we are looking forward to your talk. Uh, please introduce yourself briefly, and then we'll listen to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, um, my, my, I am Professor Javed Akram. Currently, I am the Vice Chancellor. Uh, I hope I am audible uh, of the University of Health Sciences, Lahore, Pakistan. Um, and uh, I will be just briefly presenting um, about uh, telemedicine in Pakistan. Uh, I'll try to share my screen and then we'll start uh, with your permission. Uh, the Please proceed, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, not, not yet. Uh, if you can uh, press the share screen button and then choose. I, I, yes, I'm pressing the share screen and then video file or share screen? Uh, share screen, yes, share screen. Yeah, I'm share, sharing that. And then you can choose the screen which you want to show us today. Uh, actually, it's uh, probably, okay. Uh, I'm it's not showing actually in that. Um, can you can you unshare and share again, and then uh, it'll it'll possibly. Uh, okay. Yeah. Chrome has lost the permission. To... Okay. Uh, uh, it's not sharing actually, so I'll try again. But if you share me, or you are Karan, yellow. नहीं उसके बाद आ रही है शेयर स्क्रीन दोबारा शेयर स्क्रीन हां जी फिर विंडो एक आ तो रही है लेकिन उसमें मेरी स्क्रीन नहीं आ रही पता नहीं दो स्क्रीनें आ रही हैं ऊपर विंडो वाली करें हां 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 जिसमें माइक्रोसॉफ्ट पावर पॉइंट आ रहा है हां लेकिन उसमें वो खुल नहीं खुली नहीं हुई वैसे खोल लो आप कर लो आप मेरी प्रेजेंटेशन दिखा दो मैं नहीं 
प्रेजेंटेशन तो पीछे खुली है लेकिन इधर से शेयर नहीं हो रही I have shared your presentation. You can please go proceed now. I have shared your presentation. वो मैं वो कर रहा है वो he's he's sharing it. उसको करने दें क्या नाम है फरक को. Please proceed now. You you can just ask me the next slide and I'll move the next slide. आप कर लो ना फरक आप कर लो. फरक ने कर लिया है. आप. No no I have I have first of all I have done the slide sharing. थोड़ी थी हमने थोड़ी सी बदली थी इसलिए कह रहा हूँ. So please proceed. ओके कर ओके राइट थैंक यू सो मच आई होप आई आई एम विजिबल नाउ स्वेल यस यू आर क्लियरली या ओके बिस्मिल्लाह रहमान रहीम आई एम वेरी नेक्स्ट प्लीज सो आई एम ग्रेटफुल टू डॉक्टर सुहेल चुगताई हु हैपेंस टू बी अ ब्रदर टू मी एंड अ वेरी गुड फ्रेंड we share loads of things uh, not just that uh, we are of the same descent but also many interest we interest that we share uh, i he has asked me to talk about uh, telemedicine and uh, how the telemedicine helped us especially during this pandemic um, in pakistan um, especially the uhs the university of health sciences which happens to be the largest uh, health university because we do have specialty universities in pakistan uh, and also uh, pakistan society of internal medicine of which i am a president how we uh, used uh, this technology with the help of medical city online and with the help of dr sohail chitai in particular to the advantage of millions of patients next please next for right telemedicine um, uh, and telehealth in us uh, at university of health sciences obviously telemedicine is a broad term and um, you can uh, starting from a video conferencing you can uh, start uh, you can go on to even operating systems not only that it's used for the diagnosis but for the interventions all over the world through robotics Uh, and through other means now it has advanced a lot but basically we use the cloud and we had uh, um, uh, patient uh, physicians interaction uh, we had um, access to the laboratory systems hos hospital records and also we were sharing this thing with the uh, rescue services uh, the services which will bring uh, out the Um, uh, patients uh, to the proper uh, point so uh, this uh, obviously is not uh, uh, a new thing to anybody uh, because um, this is the basic basis of uh, any uh, re uh, respectable telemedicine system uh, we were having asynchronous uh, asynchronous or synchronous Uh, real time interactions amongst the patients and the healthcare providers and also um, there were remote patient monitoring through actionable data remote dashboards so these were the basic infrastructure that was used um, by, by the physicians by the patients by the paramedicals whether in ambulance or in remote clinics Uh, and uh, or uh, from their uh, ease of their home through the smartphones through the tablets the patients were being um, consulting the their doctors or talking to the hospital similarly we also had an experience of conducting virtual ward rounds where the patient uh, the, the uh, specialist uh, were not required to come to the hospital and expose themselves to the covid a 19 virus but on the comfort of their home they can they could take remote rounds through the laptops uh, mounted on the trolleys um, so this is uh, how it was done next please so as i said uh, so this is uh, how uh, uh, uhs live telemedicine system 24/7 was uh, Uh, perceived in the beginning and then implemented very very successfully we had lo uh, live audio video interface calls um, uh, doctors and patients could 
talk in any language Punjabi because we are a very diverse country where more than seven languages are spoken. So we had um, doctors or interpreters who could uh, understand the patients in their own local language. Uh, we had video uh, windows embedded within the software, uh, high resolution interaction. Uh, instant appointment 24-7 could be obtained. Basically, the frontliner doctors would interview the patient and if that doctor, she or he thought that needs to be seen by a specialist, she would refer the patient to the specialist and then the specialist would take over, uh, take over from there onward. The doctor had um, the basic electronic um, medical record interface which would be passed on to uh, the consultants so there was no duplication uh, the uh, photographs could be shared from for example a rash or something like that uh, through the mobile device by the patient the lab results or radiology reports which are usually sent to patients uh, uh, electronically, they could easily be shared and similarly images like X-ray, CT, MRIs, uh, like in this case, wrist X-ray uh, could be shared in high resolution uh, with the uh, frontline doctors, uh, the first responders or the consultants. Similarly, video clipping, uh, for example, uh, the gait analysis, um, the tremors, things like that, the video clips real time could be shared. Uh, fits. Um, epileptic fits recorded could be shared so patient uh, so the doctors could have a better tool uh, even in personal interaction one to one we asked them what was the aura like what was the tonic clonic fits like and whatever but if some onlooker had recorded it it helps us to make the diagnosis more correctly uh, the patient recorded readings uh, like temperature charts blood sugar charts blood pressure charts could be easily shared and similarly, uh, after online video consultation, uh, the consultation summary was made uh, available uh, in the records and also the prescription, e-prescription could be generated and sent to the patient with the signature. So he, that patient need not go to any other doctors and get it written if, if he's, uh, he or she wants a prescription medication. Next, please. Here you can see that um, uh, a, a rash in high resolution, a foot ulcer in one of the diabetic patients, uh, various lesions in sickle cell anemia uh, was shared by the patients. And <clears throat> also we taught the patient how could uh, um, they dress the uh, wound in aseptic environment under our instructions, live instructions. And um, also, even a paramedical could do that. Next, please. Uh, as you can see, more than half a million telemedicine uh, consultations were done during the pandemic. Obviously, uh, the most of them were re uh, related to COVID uh, itself. But there were non-COVID uh, calls which we took with a player. Um, and most of them were either mother and child related or surgery, dermatological uh, lesions, things like that. And this was done absolutely free of cost for all the patients. Next, please. Here, this is how our telemedicine center looked like. The call agents were there to take the call and redirect the calls to uh, any, any person anywhere uh, in, in the world or across the globe, even uh, Professor Sohail Chuktai, being a very eminent uh, orthopedic surgeon, was forwarded so many calls which he um, uh, took up uh, very willingly um, and gave us ortho consultation. Being an orthopedic surgeon, uh, we were getting calls from not just from Pakistan but from all over the world. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, when, when the COVID struck us in Pakistan, our OPDs were closed down like most of the countries because we didn't want to expose this uh, um, uh, flow of uh, millions of patients that would come to our OPDs and in crowded environment without masks. So, to avoid this, 
we shut down our OPDs and we converted the OPDs to uh, telemedicine clinics. So we uh, asked them to contact and, and electronic medical records were made available and the anxiety addressed and they could not only uh, hear, listen to their doctor, but also see the doctor. Uh, the only problem was the gentle touch was missing, but um, uh, this was not a huge price to pay considering uh, decreasing the crowded environment of the hospital. Next, please. Uh, so the idea was conceived uh, by us and uh, I went to my chancellor who is the governor of the Punjab. Punjab, if it was a country, it would have been the fifth largest populous country in the world. We are, Pakistan is 220 million people and 65% uh, so of these people live in Punjab. Next, please. And here you can see that... Uh, the, our um, governor of the Punjab, um, uh, Chaudhary Muhammad Sarwarsa, wearing a University of Health Sciences tie, you can see, and Professor Dr. Sohail Chuktai uh, wearing a tie of Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine. So these were the two organizations with their logos there, um, which came on forefront and uh, which uh, filled up this gap of uh, patient for patients and for the clinicians. And here you can see the inauguration of the first uh, telemedicine center in the region. Next, please. And then you can see, uh, then there was no end to it. It still continues. We were having workshops, training workshops for the college agents, for the consultants, for uh, the people at large, for public at large. We advertised this helpline with the help of doctors 24-7 online. And um, all the organizations got together and then it became a huge success. Success to the ex extent that now our university is geared to a degree program in health informatics, where one of the module, uh, the first module of six months is telemedicine. Next, please. Here, the, even the president of Pakistan, after he was appraised through the media, through us, uh, about the success of telemedicine. He came all the way from Islamabad, about 400 kilometers from Lahore, uh, to see for his own self that how telemedicine looked like. And then we uh, realized that there were, since we are 95% are Muslims, and uh, our uh, majority of the females, they uh, observe uh, wheel or they... Uh, do not want to expose themselves in front of a male doctor. So we also inaugurated a pink telemedicine line where the doctors were or the agents were female, the patients were female, even the support staff was female right in the university. So this was, was a unique initiative uh, along with Women Chamber of Commerce, which was inaugurated by no less than the president of Pakistan, who himself is a doctor, a dentist, Dr. Arif Alvi, in the presence of Chief Justice of Pakistan. Next, please. Here again, you can see that um, more than half a million calls in just a few months related to COVID and other diseases. And also, we developed so much literature uh, that we were sharing uh, with different universities. And this pink telemedicine, you can see right on the top there uh, and apps uk came in and they took up many consultations for us next please here you can see the nishtar medical college uh, vice chancellor supervising the telemedicine center we training general people how to use telemedicine to their advantage uh, here you can see a very quick demonstration of there so in the pandemic, it decreased the anxiety, uh, took away the anxiety from the patients. They, they were always easy for them to connect, even um, uh, much more easier than the normal times. Uh, so in-time medical help right from the comfort of their home. Next, please. Next. So uh, WHO observed it. 
and then many many media reports you can see it was it became the top trend on twitter it tech became a real success story in not only in pakistan media but the global media projected it uh, so uh, here you can see uh, the do's and don'ts and we also used it for the education of general public to prevent uh, the disease spread next please here you can see a few glimpses from our mainline media you can see uh, projecting the telemedicine there again and you can see also the bbc uh, also professor angus wallis uh, a friend of telemedicine one of the pioneers in telemedicine and telehealth uh, was interviewed also and so uh, was dr sohail chuktai next please so a book an excellent book with the foreword written by professor j sanders who is a household name to people who deal with telemedicine you can see uh, president of uh, world telemedicine association at john hopkins school of medicine uh, he wrote the very good foreword and the book itself has a chapter about pakistan uh, it has 17 chapters 280 pages it's a bible for telemedicine and a very well recommended book for anybody who wants to work with telemedicine next please here you can see uh, there were many uh, uh, citations about the book and about the chapters you can see that it's still being referred to this is a very book which is now referred to by all over the world appear in all the references of research paper that is that are coming out next please and here you can see this book was inaugurated again by our chancellor the governor of punjab and also we connected when when the israel bombarded gaza uh, in palestine again we used telemedicine to our advantage and we were giving and we still are giving consultations to our uh, brothers and sisters and families in gaza uh, especially al quds hospital we established in gaza a telemedicine center and we took we are still taking virtual rounds next please next so i think dr sohail chiktai will be much more qualified to talk about design of telemedicine center but just very quickly next please this is what he implemented uh, software part uh, it is a dynamic software so kept on improving throughout the time next please you can see patient registration by the individual or any family member next please appointment practice management software came in next please hmis as we call it electronic medical records text images sounds videos live two way video consultation next clinical data collection clinical decision support system which will give us the differential diagnosis the most likely diagnosis and then the prescription and any interaction within the prescription will be alert will be generated and then inter specialty referrals from primary care to secondary or to tertiary care and amongst the tertiary care peer reviews and things like that could easily be done disease screening research tool uh, we can use it a big this huge data for the research purposes and also not increase the clinical governance and clinical audit system next please patient education i already referred to uh, that we could prevent this is a, a screenshot of our telemedicine consultation with our doctor and a, a patient in gaza next please next here you can see uh, the corona evaluation score automatically the software will give a score so we know that what score we are dealing with are we dealing with a stable patient or a critically ill patient who, who will need referral and then if the referral then emergency uh, services shall be alerted next please here you can see every patient had the, its own uh, portal 
and would be reflected on the dashboard, could be shared with the uh, healthcare providers. Uh, even the results of his PCR, his or her PCR could be easily shared with the MR number and things like that. And then we had all the major laboratories on board in this telemedicine software. Next, please. Radiology high resolution X-rays could be shared and the previous records or digital digitally will be stored uh, for an indefinite time. So one could always refer back. Next, please. Uh, lesion rashes, drug induced or disease induced, could also be referred, uh, um, you know, very easily. And dermatological um, um, uh, consultations could be sought. Next, please. Again, you could see that the patient uh, feeling very comfortable from his home uh, with this huge smile on the face of the healthcare provider as well as the patient, uh, which is the real award for us, for uh, uh, Medical City Online, for Suhail Chukhtai, for everybody. Uh, this is what is the biggest earning for any doctor or any researcher or any software company or any hospital. This smile is priceless. Next, please. Here again, uh, you could go into the detail and everything could be stored, uh, recorded with the permission of the patient, with the consent of the patient and reused later on in the consultation. Next, please. Next. Next. You can see share, save and share. So you could use this portal very, very easily. You can see over there in the local language at the end, giving them messages how we could prevent COVID-19 spread or how we could spread. Uh, right now, we are in the middle of a dengue epidemic. And, and so we are using different messages now than just COVID-19. But this portal can be used easily to the advantage of human beings uh, to save them from these communicable as well as non-communicable diseases. Next, please. Next. So at the end, I'm very grateful uh, to all of you for the patient listening and especially to Dr. Suhail Chuktai for the opportunity. And I hope everybody stays safe and I hope uh, we can meet in person also on such a important Yeah, thank you, um, Javed, for uh, your uh, very insightful uh, lecture. Uh, what it shows is that where you have the political will, as well as engagement by those who are going to deliver the service, then it is possible uh, to uh, deliver these uh, projects. Uh, to do so, in short a time is very uh, commendable. And you said the population of uh, Pakistan is over 200 million, and that of Lahore, uh, perhaps about uh, three quarters of that. Uh, it shows the rich you can get with uh, telemedicine. Uh, one of the questions we have says, uh, what about patient satisfaction? Have you undertaken any survey uh, about how satisfied patients are? And if you have, yeah. what is yes, the we, experience yeah, we, of patients? We did, we, we, did, we did ask them about the patient uh, satisfaction uh, with, on the scale of 0 to 10. Uh, majority of the patients, because uh, they are not that literate, they are using the technology through their son or a daughter or somebody like that. So they did not um, respond it, but the people who responded about 40, 50%, uh, most of them about 35% were very satisfied, uh, about 30% uh, uh, satisfied and 10% not satisfied. So that's the rough breakdown.
Well, that's good. And I am aware that in an American study in Los Angeles, uh, looking at patient satisfaction, uh, most of the patients were satisfied uh, with telemedicine uh, as a tool for undertaking consultation or engaging with patients. Uh, it will get better. Uh, one question or one important thing you mentioned here, uh, which is a takeaway uh, message, I think, is that training of users is very, very important. So thank you for stressing that, uh, that patient, I mean, the users of the equipment need to be trained and continuously. And again, out of this has come the introduction of health informatics in your university. Uh, and I hope that people listening, uh, other institutions, will take this on board. Um, I believe you may have your last message that you want to convey to us. Your last word, please. Thank you so much uh, once again. Uh, I do not think really that, uh, frankly, the telemedicine is ever going to replace or neither we should intend that it should replace the uh, uh, physical one-on-one one -on -one consultation because the doctor's gentle touch, the doctor's hand-holding, the doctor's, um, you know, uh, emotional and personal interaction, I think that's extremely important. As a physician, I can tell you that um, especially, um, you know, spending quality time with the patient sometimes helps much more than the drug itself. Okay, whether you're dealing with cancer patients, cardiac patients, strokes, things like that. And also then, you know, counseling the family and the attendants, that's also part of it. So I think telemedicine is going to complement our practice not contradict. We should be aligned. There are many things that we can do with telemedicine, but still there are many things which we are unable to do. So there is a limitation there. It cannot replace the physical contact sessions. So that is what we know. Only thing is that um, I think uh, as a humble student of science, I think if anything is going to kill more than five million people in the future, like 20, 25 years, it's not going to be a nuclear missile. It's going to be a microbe. And once the microbes are going to be there, whether virus or bacteria or fungi, uh, we will need to, you know, look at the transmission and use telemedicine in the future also. We should be ready to do it in crisis and in non-crisis time. It can supplement our physical contact session. So Lovely. I think health health informatics uh, is not just telemedicine. It is electronic record system, the security of those records, uh, the secrecy of those records, and then much more importantly, uh, the user friendliness of those records because they are not only going to be used by qualified doctors like you who are uh, at a very high status, but also by nurses and nurses in Pakistan, they are not all of them are computer literate. So they have to be user friendly. The, and also then we also ending the pandemics, how to deal with the pandemics is part of the health informatics. So it is yeah. not just telemedicine. Telemedicine is just one part of that, but very important part of this. So that is why a six months module in there and six months module in tele. Uh, telehealth uh, te uh, health uh, uh, informatics in um, the public health. So, you know, like, uh, uh, sorry, ep epidemiology, entomology, those things are there. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, for that, um, people will think perhaps we've compared notes uh, because earlier on I had said telemedicine is not going to replace human beings. Uh, the physical aspect uh, will still exist. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Akram. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen and ladies, uh, we're going to go to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Suhil Choktai, 
uh, who you've heard from before, uh, the chairman of the Medical City Online uh, United Kingdom. Uh, he's a doctor and he's got an interest in uh, telemedicine. And he's going to talk to us about designing a clinical telemedicine hub and spoke service. Uh, over to you, Suhail. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jasimi. It's, uh, it's been a player uh, having very uh, uh, literate speakers, experienced speakers in this conference. Professor Javed Akram gave a wonderful view of what he has done in the University of Health Sciences. I'm going to share an experience where a country struggling with healthcare at times, needing telemedicine to solve their problems. Now that is in relation to the topic that how can we set up a specialist hub and spoke telemedicine service to take the specialist where the specialist cannot reach or people cannot reach the specialists. So allow me to take you through this where I share some experience and share some actually design of the service. We are talking about a mobile telemedicine clinic. When you say mobile clinic, that becomes the spoke where the information of the patient will be picked from. Now, this uh, concept, which I'm going to discuss with you, has the ability to connect more than 10 specialists. The specialists don't need to go to the rural areas in this case. They can be sitting in a centralized hub, like in Namibia. We are hopefully going to be setting this up. We, are, we had the discussion with the president of Namibia only last night, and I'm giving this an, as an example because this is something already in sight. So this specialist telemedicine lab or specialist telemedicine hub spoke has ultrasound scanner, has an eye examining slit, slit lamp, has ENT camera, has ECG, and all the cardiac tools as well. So the patient will be just traveling a short distance to reach a centralized point in their village where this telemedicine van will reach. And what will happen there? There will be a GP in the van who will become the coordinator of telemedicine for the patient, connecting the patient to the specialist. The advantage is that the patient does not have to learn any software. They will just come and sit next to a clinician who is a GP, and that GP is connecting the patient to a specialist through the special tools, which means that the there is no deprivation of information that can go from a patient to the specialist. If you want an ENT examination, the GP will pick up the ENT camera. If you want a heart, if you want to listen to the heart, the GP will pick up the auscultate, auscultation device configured to the telemedicine software and connect that patient's information live in real time, as if it would if you were in a clinic. So in this scenario, we have a GP traveling in the van, a telemedicine assistant who will basically triage the patient's non-medical information, like um, name, registration number, date of birth, identification, and copy and paste all medical records the patient might bring, like even paper slips, even medical, even the wraps of the medications. And then there will be a driver who will serve also as a manager and put up the systems like chairs, a small tent next to the van, and this three-member team will be a mobile hospital, a clinic. So telemedicine van connected in real time to 10 plus online specialists. This, this has increased from 10, reaching to the rural areas to provide specialist tele outpatient consultations. So what will be included in this model? Of course, fast telemedicine PC, high-definition webcam, speakers, good light, a clinical telemedicine software with electronic medical record facility, cameras for ENT, dental camera, skin examination, ultrasound scanner configured to the software, 
a patient vital sign monitor configured to the software, and then glucometer, spirometer, weight, height scales, printer, and scanner. So that is the hospital on wheels, the clinic on wheels. Imagine the benefit. Take example of mother and child care. Take example of placenta previa. How many people, how many mothers, expectant mothers get killed near the delivery time because of undiagnosed placenta previa? So mother and child clinic is one big utility. Diagnosing cancer, diagnosing dengue, tuberculosis, infectious diseases, hepatitis. All that can be inbuilt into the system. So that can serve as a great support to a national healthcare service. So that is the setup like a small room where the doctor is sitting far away, whereas the GP is putting the probe in the air, just like a doctor would do the camera. And then this information will be live seen along with electronic medical records. So there, there will be a form for disease history. There will be a visual medical examination with the help of the GP by the specialist. There will be a glucometer temperature reading, body mass index. In fact, this has allowed us to standardize a consultation. The way we'll collect the information, we'll do it for every patient. So a lot of data will be, will, be, it will be at hands. And the advantage of having a data would be that we can do disease, disease studies. What disease is prevalent in what, what part of the country? Where is iodine deficiency? Where are people more obese? Where is diabetes? So all that can be done because the patients don't have to travel to main hospitals. The hospital travels to the patients. And that is calling, that's called as taking care of your people, taking care of people who are underprivileged. So what actions the online specialist can or will take to initiate clinical management? Now, the person sitting in the main city, what can that person do? How empowered that person is, he or she will save the images or videos of the medical findings, such as swellings and limping gait. A medical diagnosis will be established. Medical investigations, if required, will be, will be actually requested for the, from the local um, dispensaries. In fact, we will have a kit for instant simple tests. There, there are spot test kits, and we are equipping this van with a spot test kit even thyroxine, T3, T4, and TSH. So we are equipping more equipment, more investigations, spot investigations in the kit so that people don't have to leave the van to get the test done. Surgical procedure, if required, will be, will be recommended. Medications will be prescribed by the GP sitting in the van on the instructions of the specialist. Or even the medications will be dispensed, the basic medications, like antibiotics, painkillers, creams, and gels will be, will be dispensed, eye drops. And they will be referred to a higher super specialist if required be. Patient will be educated. A follow-up appointment will be given if required, as the van would have a schedule for a month, like four times a month, visiting a community. And they would know where the van would come, what day it will come, what time. And then there will be an auto summary of each consultation done by the artificial intelligence system in the software to save that and go back to the mainframe. Now. I think we've gone through all this before me and Professor Javed Akram, that this soft clinical telemedicine, let me emphasize once again, video chatting on Zoom and Skype using a superimposed patient data is not telemedicine. They, they are totally disconnected. Let's say if Zoom service stops in one area, what will you do? Let's say if that data is taken away and not connected to the patient in, a, in an automatic way, you can mix and match. So telemedicine is when everything is in one system. You can't have engine of a Ferrari put in a showroom and drive a Toyota and say, well, I've got engine of Ferrari. It's in the showroom. It has to be in the car to make it a Ferrari. And that is what clinical telemedicine is. It has to be clinical to make it a replacement, not a replacement, a support to the patient-doctor communication. So that design you've seen through me before, Professor Dr. Javed Akram has gone through this. It has taken me several years to reach a simplistic design. And believe me, I'm still learning. Because every patient that talks to me on this software, I've got my series of around 1,000 patients, 1,073 patients I'm publishing of my own. I've seen in my clinical practice since COVID. And I'm learning from my patients. Like there was a patient sitting the other day, 
with a cat in the lap. And she was moving her hand on the back of the cat. And said, I said, what, what are you doing? She said, I feel so comfortable as if you've come to my home and I can talk to you my heart out. So that is where we are standing now. We are standing where the doctor can visit the patient and save a lot of hassle to the patient. So this all software you've already seen. Now I want to show you the actual happening of a live ultrasound scan that what will happen if you put the probe on the patient's neck in this case how will a far doctor look at that? This is a doctor, my colleague sitting in America. I was watching in Britain, whereas this is patient in Pakistan in, uh, in a host private hospital, uh, Citrus Telemedicine, uh, Citrus Health in Pakistan kindly arranged all that uh, uh, setup. So I appreciate Dr. Khurm Shazad and Citrus management team. So this probe was put in on the neck of the patient on instruction of a cardiologist in America. This person putting the probe is not a technician is not an ultrasound technician. Please remember that. This doctor was able to guide through a specialized multi-channel telemedicine software window, put the probe here, I want to see the scan. And how the scan looked like, take a look. So you can see the image resolution. And this is an ordinary scanning machine. You can see the probe. It's not clarious or butterfly. It's a ordinary ultrasound machine placed in Pakistan, but converted into telemedicine system through an interconvertible kit, which, which we have devised in London. And we have several of them in Pakistan. We've sent them to Pakistan to citrus telemedicine systems so that they can use the existing hospital equipment, convert them into telemedicine systems, and have the quality resolution. Take a look at another one. That's a tele-ICU dashboard where you can look at the monitor with eight parameters, live display. You can do, you can convert any monitor into a tele-monitor through an interconvertible kit on the telemedicine software. And that is where things are. We are standing at a point where the information flow, if you can control by hub and spoke telemedicine system, it's like a doctor sitting there physically it's like a doctor physically sitting there. I repeat that. And I can actually discuss it in more detail at some other occasion that how a doctor trained in good communication skills can do a visual examination almost as good as physical examination. And the gaps of information can be filled by investigations if need be. Take a look at another one. In this example, I am. the patient goes to a hub, a spoke, and then a small probe is put on the neck, and that helps us to analyze the range of movement objectively. Take a look. So this patient is flexing, extending, 64 degree extension, 43 degree flexion. So that is very good for medical legal industry, where people want to know, is the patient getting better or worse? And what about the effects of muscle relaxants? You want to see, are my muscle relaxants working or not? That's called gyroscopic measurement of that and telemedicine allows that. That means you can be very effective in rheumatology and orthopedics and physiotherapist. Take a look at the last one. Telecardiology. You can look at the heart scan, four chamber scan. On the Ziffy sternum, you put the probe and you tell the technician to do that. That does not require an experienced te technician, whereas your eyes as an experienced clinician can tell what is the heart like through this. And you can have another doctor in the window who can oversee this. So the last part of my this set of slides is where I'm giving you actually a, another practical example. Whatever you've talked about today is not theoretical. We have done it, we are doing it, and we will be doing it. So we have done it, we are doing it, and we will be doing it. One example is this tele-ICU where a BBC picked up actually that how doctors in UK are doing ward rounds in Pakistan in COVID ward. Doctor, Professor Dr. Ashraf Zia, head of uh, ICU, COVID ICU at Jinnah Hospital, kindly allowed us to um, connect his ICU to London to an ICU consultant. And the BBC filmed that. And let's see how it looked like.
So what, what they're saying is that there is actually sound issue at the moment because the sound is directed to uh, auditorium. So we, we are unable to connect the sound coming up. But that shows that BBC is looking at Jinnah Hospital ward. And then this tablet in the hands of the doctor is connecting to a UK consultant. The UK consultant is looking at the oxygen level, talking to the patient, looking at the monitor, not like a picture, actually live connected to the monitor as you've seen before, and saying, in my experience, this patient should get this and this. And they're discussing it. And the BBC uh, actually was very impressed that how Pakistan and deaths, deaths in Pakistan were lesser than developed countries. One reason was that telemedicine was deployed pretty quickly. The, the snag of regulations was less. So the, it was a very worthwhile uh, uh, opportunity that we, we were not strangulated by regulations uh, in that uh, country because telemedicine was new and we were able to uh, save lives. Regulations sometimes can be obstacle, especially when its time is critical. Uh, I am a fan of regulations, but when something is new, which is developing, we ought to move and take bold decisions. So that's my talk today. And I think uh, digital health is not something a thing of future. It is a thing of present. It is here and it's going to stay. Namibia is one example where 2.54 million people living in a huge area, they have disconnect because of distance. And we plan to connect that through mobile telemedicine van. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Uh, Choktai. A very erudite speaker there. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it has um, uh, brought in many questions. And I think the very first one, uh, you said it's a hub and spoke, and you said it could go to rural areas. And one of the things that people have said, and it's uh, a question that's been raised, that the doctor-patient ratio in low resource countries is very uh, low, and that can you teach uh, healthcare workers, uh, community healthcare workers or extension workers uh, to use this tool? Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, the question relates to a non-medical person operating at the patient side. Uh, training is one thing and certification is the next level. Training part is where you train the technician on the software, connectability of the software to the hardware, and then using it in a patient setting. We have to sensitize them to the patient's psychology. Patient is not a customer. Patient is like a, a person who's wounded, hurt, in pain. So that part of training, along with the technical training, has to be brought in. And uh, referring to Professor Javed Akram, uh, we are setting up a department of health, informatics, telemedicine, and artificial intelligence at the University of Health Sciences. And the plan is to get the training across to the non-medical up to the medical uh, telemedicine operators. Uh, we have done, we've already managed, run three courses so far, and we'll be doing more. I hope that answers the question. There are more questions. In fact, uh, I want to sh put on the screen some questions. The GMC view. GMC is looking at it more deeply. They have mentioned a telemedicine policy, but at the same time, uh, I believe that more questions have been raised than answered. So at the moment, uh, we I have already sent uh, my four-page this more four-page proposal. I'm going to reiterate that, and I will try and, and also discuss that with the president of GMC. What I whatever I I know and what whatever my experience is. But there are people who are approaching him, and the president and GMC is uh, very kind to consider. And I'm I'm sure GMC is very upcoming, and they will make sure that the patient's health is firmest and they will use telemedicine. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you demonstrated uh, using a machine there how you could look at flexion and extension of the neck. Uh, one of the questions that has come up is that can you use this for 
ocular ophthalmic examination? Uh, regarding the gyroscopic examination, where you put a band on the head and a probe on the neck, the relative distance between the two is measured. So that requires a hub, hub and spoke telemedicine. You can give this kit to the patient if you're regularly examining the patient on serial basis, like a physiotherapy, like a critical, like sports therapy, uh, an athlete, a high performing athlete, and you want to monitor daily. You can put that, give that kit as a loan to the athlete and examine the, the athlete on daily basis to see how much performance they're getting. Regarding the ocular examination, uh, it's the slit lamp. There are digital slit lamps which have special ports and the parallax between the port and the software resolution can be removed through an interconvertible kit. So the answer to your question is yes, the ocular information, not only the retina, but the chambers, they can be looked at detail through a small camera, which has a digital port and that can be in interconverted into the systems. Lovely, thank you so much uh, Suhil for uh, your presentation. A uh, very excellent presentation. Um, one of the things that came out of it uh, is population health management. Uh, because you have said people can be in the rural areas, you can collect data, and one can use that data uh, to plan health services. So thank you for bringing our attention to that. And again, what you have shown to us, uh, you made reference to a meeting with a uh, Namibian president la uh, last night is that Africa is not going to be left behind. Asia is not going to be left behind. Uh, telemedicine is going to go global, and we do hope that no nation will be left behind. That's part of what the Sustainable Development Goal 3 is about, that there should be no, I mean, people should live well, good health and wellness, and uh, as they do one, no poverty. And I believe that with telemedicine and good health care, uh, it will contribute to the economy of nations and we achieve the sustainable development goal. Um, I'm looking through the Q&A box. Um, somebody says, alternative is to use an app which will measure the angles and movements of any joints and that is validated will share details in message we'll be looking forward to that we are mindful of the time and i will take one last comment uh, of somebody who has experience uh, it says i have experience of using telemedicine in the national health service which is the united kingdom uh, using NHS near me in Scotland and will be happy to share his data and support the letter to the General Medical Council. Uh, you may wonder why we're talking about the General Medical Council. In each country, doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals are regulated. And because telemedicine is fairly new, it is important that we carry our regulators uh, along with us. And that is why we're engaging them. So I'm mindful of the time. Uh, there is going to be a, uh, a 15 to 30 minute break. Uh, we'll try and shorten that. Uh, and we'll like to come back at, um, uh, it's about uh, 11 o'clock in the United Kingdom now. Um, so it's about 11 o'clock in the United Kingdom now. So rather than go for uh, my colleagues who are in the audience, uh, 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 give us perhaps another 15 to 20 minutes, then we'll go on the tea and coffee break uh, because um, we'll take the last speaker and that will be a natural time uh, for us to go for a tea and coffee break. Uh, the next speaker uh, is Michaelin Holdemarch, a uh, Dr. Michaelin Holdemarch, uh, who is an NHS digital clinical hazard expert, and she will be talking to us today uh, about telehealth 
how it improves overall healthcare outcomes, analysis of factors, and presenting the evidence. Um, she is backstage, and we are trying to get her on stage. So please give us a few minutes. Thank you, Suhail, for asking me to say a few words at the opening of your Telehealth Innovation Conference 2021 on the 6th of November in England, the UK. I applaud your efforts in helping to make my mentor, Dr. Kenneth Bird's dream of the impact that telemedicine could have on the healthcare delivery system a reality. Having started doing telemedicine in 1969, we fought technological, infrastructural, legal, regulatory and reimbursement issues back then. The progress of telemedicine in those days was quite inhibited in contrast to the current times. Sadly, it took a pandemic to awaken everyone to its potential benefits in addressing the delivery system's access, cost, and quality issues. Your efforts and those of your colleagues at this conference, I am sure, will assure that access to affordable, up-to-date healthcare will be a universal right, wherever and whoever you are. Thank you Suhail, again for all your so meaningful efforts. Uh, would like to express our thanks to our sponsors, uh, without who we wouldn't, I mean, we, would, we wouldn't have been able to um, organize this conference. Uh, Southend uh, University Hospital, which is one of the hospitals that makes up the Mid and South Essex NHS Trust. Uh, the University of Health Sciences in Pakistan, uh, the Ministry of National Health and the Government of Pakistan, uh, Patientory, Educast, Mobi Health, uh, which is a telemedicine outfit, um, IIWCG, uh, Abu Dhabi, APPS UK, uh, Trojan Medical Trojan Medical Group. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you will see on that flyer uh, other sponsors. Um, APPS UK, I have mentioned. Um, I think I think you can read it better. It's the uh, Health Services Academy in Pakistan. In Pakistan and Prism of. Uh, PSI and Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine. Lovely, thank you. And can you tell us what IIWC stands for? That is the largest wound care consortium in the world, which is based in Dubai. Lovely, thank you. So thanks to our partners. Uh, we hope when we call on you again, when we have a second conference, uh, you will join us. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to invite on stage um, Dr. Michaelin Holdemark, uh, who I told you will be talking to us about how telehealth improves overall healthcare outcomes. I shall be giving you the factors and the evidence. Uh, yes, you've been hearing the techno, technical, <laughs> technical, but she is going to tell you what the practicalities are. So um, please introduce yourself. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are at the moment. I know you are a global traveler, uh, but welcome to this conference. Please introduce yourself and take the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just, um, I do apologize to everyone for all the technical um, issues that I've been facing today, um, but I believe that, um, I will be able to share the screen with you. So if you can just kindly bear with me as I do that. Um, my name is Dr. Michaeline Holdemarch and it's a, a pleasure to be here today. And uh, can you, um, Rutimi, if it's possible, can you see? Um, can you see the, the, the screen? Uh, can you perhaps share, uh, press the share button and go for the share screen? 
Okay. Okay. Uh, it, it did come up for, for a few seconds. It did come up. Okay. Yes, it did. Okay, so let's let's do that again. Can you see it now? Uh, if you can press the share button and then select the screen you want. Okay, let's go back. Sorry, I do apologize about this. I don't know why I'm having this issue today. I hit the share button. Share and then the share screen. screen. And then select the screen. Okay, um, what I will do is, Rutimi, can I just um, send this over to you whilst I start talking, please? Is that doable? Okay. Good morning, everyone. I, I do apologize. You can't see my screen, and I don't know what's the issue, but I will just go straight into the discussions about telehealth. Uh, telehealth has been advancing quite rapidly over the past few years. It is a term given to, so that, so, to that sort of remote healthcare delivery and consultation to patients from a distance. There are many tools that make healthcare more accessible in this current period that we live in, and they are more accessible cost effective, and most importantly, it increases patient engagement. I know for some, it is very hard to embrace the philosophy behind telemedicine. However, telemedicine allows healthcare professionals to evaluate, diagnose, and treat patients at a distance using telecommunication. So what really is telemedicine? What is it really? You know, because so many of us talk about the Ebronic stage of moving from paper records that we are used to and going into this whole digital transformation. It is about thinking about how you can offer care, improve quality outcomes in a manner that it is going to actually meet the need and the demand of the population. And as for a fact, we know that COVID actually highlighted why it's important for us to actually be supporters of telemedicine. Note, telemedicine is not a new practice. I know some of you, no, it's not. The concept of telemedicine is dated back to the 19th century. What we began as a few hospitals wanting to reach patients in remote locations became an integrative system across the whole care continuum. So the history of telemedicine will unveil how we got to where we are today. Some of you may know Graham Bell, yeah? Graham Bell is, is one of the, I, I would say a, a pioneer of his time um, because he was really critical in actually patients having a telephone that launches the beginning of our telecommunication field. Uh, and then we have Dr. Hugo Gunsbach. He had something called teledactyl, which was a tool with robotic fingers. I don't know if some of you will remember that, but there's so much literature and research around that. Then we move away from that and we had our big desktops. Medical personnel start doing experiments with closed circuit television. But as we know, those are really clunky and outdated systems. So we move into when NASA start doing a lot of research into ways to provide healthcare to astronauts and improve telecommunication technology. I think that is one of the key. And then in the late 70s, what happened is that there was a golden age of telemedicine research and expansion. This 
was also funded by the US federal government to run many telemedicine programs right across the world. The UK was a little bit slow, and I don't know for other countries, but the United States really were the, the, the front runners in regards to telemedicine programs. Going on to that, we have to say that the first time a patient was successfully defibrillated by telephone was in 1989. And also, we know for a fact that this was actually a breakthrough in medicine. But here we are. We in a new global space, mobile health, AI technology. It is such an exciting time for clinicians. Today is telemedicine. People have access to basic teleme telemedicine devices mobile phones, watches, computers, laptops, tablets, uh, you, you name it. And what has it done? What, what has it really done? I want you to stop for a moment and think about it. Look around you. What do you have that can be used to diagnose, advise, treat, or even a referral in regards to your healthcare needs? There are so many home use medical devices that it made it possible for caregivers to monitor everything from vitals to glucose levels. Doctors can gather that medical information and make a diagnosis without patients stepping a foot into that hospital, doctor's office, or any other clinical environment. That is what you call raw advancement. Now, there is no doubt about it. There are many types of telemedicine types. Patient to provider, provider to patient, video conferencing. Uh, you know, uh, I do apologize that my um, presentation cannot be seen, but I'm going to give this to you in a way that you will be able to walk away and say, have I considered telemedicine in my practice? Two-way audio-visual links between a patient and a healthcare provider has found to have significant benefits, especially for patients who have mobility issues, especially for patients who have other issues in regards to economics, unable to travel, or are located in a very rural area. And the other thing is that the most beautiful thing about video conferencing is that it can be used to treat common illnesses. You can actually see the person and see what is happening with them, especially dermatology. You can also see wounds, infected wounds. Let's move forward. We know for a fact that beside the live video conferencing, that telemedicine surpasses the need for that medical practitioner to meet a patient in person, especially with COVID. There's enough data, a lot of data, that shows medical images or biosignals can be sent to the specialist as needed when required, either by the physician or by the patient themselves if they decide to get a, a third-party referral. Remote monitoring. The use of connected electronic tools is recorded personal health. I mean, I'm always surprised by my, I'm not going to um, promote any particular company, but my watch is able to tell me, um, you know, my heart rate, uh, my sleep patterns. So can you imagine this rich data? What are we doing as clinicians? What are we doing as healthcare professionals with this rich data? that can provide so much. I don't think we have really tapped into the data that we can actually extract from connected electronic tools, or as people will say, mobile health technology. The, the other point about it is that real-time interactive services. You know, forget about the waiting of the queues and, and long booking scenarios. These interactive services can provide immediate advice to patients who require medical attention. As you can see, I am really passionate about telemedicine. You know, radiology, a radiologist specializes, you know, in medical imaging techniques and all of that. But however, 
a radiologist could, through telemedicine, able to see that medical image and, and be able to diagnose and treat. Mental health. Let's go to one of the, the, the greatest transformation of telemedicine today. It is in mental health. Likely one of the most popular specialities that use telemedicine. And we know that it increases revenue because um, you can actually streamline your patients. You can streamline your patient flow. Um, you can also provide counseling sessions from anywhere. So that is one of the things. Mental health has really embraced this because of the counseling sessions. You can actually counsel your patient from anywhere. Are we fully utilizing it? So when you look at all of this great and, and, and you know, influencing factors that is, that is coming through the telemedicine, the technology, one may ask, what are the true benefits to the patients? And what is the really the healthcare outcomes we're looking for? You know, I, I, I really like telemedicine because I am from Trinidad and Tobago, although I'm British. And there are parts in that country where it's absolutely underserved rural and some parts are remote like in other countries. But telemedicine can give accessibility. And the other thing about it is it, it gives that you can actually telemedicine, you can have access to expert and specialist fields. So, it, so, for example, if you have a cardiologist and he's the, he's the best cardiologist that you have in that country, he can actually plan his whole referral by act for a larger population by going using telemedicine. We talk about the reduced visits to specialty hospitals or for long-term care. But what about the aged and terminally ill patients? Telemedicine has taken away the need for especially terminally ill patients to get up and get in a vehicle and go to be seen. And we know some of the waiting times could be horrendous. There's other benefits that we haven't talked about, have we? hospital and insurance benefits. There are significant reduction in unnecessary hospitalization for tertiary hospitals. You can have earlier discharge of patients leading to a shorter length of stay in hospitals. We can increase the scope of services without creating physical infrastructure in remote hospitals. So it reduces that whereby you don't have to do a business case and bill a specific unit because you're using telemedicine to the greatest, you're using all the, the features of, of telemedicine. Once you have a good supplier and once you have done a risk hazard assessment on it and making sure that it's tailored for that population. You know, there are medical specialities that can really use the full throttle of telemedicine, pediatrics. Parents can now avoid bringing their sick ch child out of the house to see a doctor. We talk about dermatology, he, dermatologists using smartphone. We talked about that. But I want to talk about something, benefits to clinicians. What is the benefits to a healthcare professional? I tell you what it is. Time, that word, time. As we have an increase in the demand to be seen by patients and carers, time, the element of time. Improved diagnosis, better treatment. You have comprehensive data, text voice images of your patients, offline as well as real time. Dr. Holdemar, uh, yeah. one minute, please. Thank you. We have a quick and timely follow-up, especially for palliative care. But you know what? Continuing education and training through video conferencing pre periodically. You can actually have that. So I know the time is against us, but I want to talk about something. Telemedicine, no transportation, 
No need to take time off work. Eliminate, eliminate child or elder care issues. On-demand options. Access to specialists. Less chance of catching a new illness, you know, especially with infection control. Less time in the waiting room and better health. We should utilize teleconsultation, sometimes referred to as an interaction between a clinician and a patient via a diagnostic or therapeutic electronic means. We have to. It is the only way that we can ensure that our patients have some sort of connection with us and that we are offering the best care that we can offer. And we have to embrace technology. Clinicians and technology, we must work together. We must advance care, better healthcare outcomes through telemedicine. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, it shows the passion that you've got. And passion comes from experience. And I think if anybody needs to be convinced that telehealth is here to stay and is effective, I think you have done justice uh, to that very topic. Uh, so thank you. Uh, it's interesting because uh, you've also reiterated a number of things that other speakers have spoken about. But And one area that nobody has spoken about, which is very relevant, is the mental health aspect mm -hmm. that telemedicine can be used for mental health. Mm -hmm. um, there's just the one uh, question that um, is on the chat line. And the question is that some people say some devices do not support telemedicine. Uh, is that correct? Uh, make it brief, a yes or no. Uh, uh, you know what? Uh, Technology is changing rapidly. Yeah. So the first thing we need to look at is the five prong, yeah? What is the network system in that, in that locality or country? Two, who are the suppliers of that technology? Third, the training of both the patients and the healthcare professional. Four, the understanding of the data, that valuable data that is held in that technology. And five, what do you want from it? What do you want to extract from it? Purpose, driven purpose. Once you have that, then you will be able to ascertain whether or not that technology meets the, the needs of your patients and also what information you want. Thank you for that uh, answer and for, again, educating us. Uh, on behalf of uh, Adam Global Health, and the UK City Online. We want to say a big thank you for taking time out on your Saturday afternoon uh, to give us uh, this uh, this uh, interesting lecture. Uh, if questions uh, come up on the chat line later on, we'll address them to you, uh, either by email or if you're still online, we'll ask you uh, to uh, answer them if you're still online. Uh, at this point, um, I'm going to hand over. I'd like you to know that uh, members in the audience have had coffee. So we're not going to have to take a break. As I said earlier on, people have stretched their legs and they've gone for their coffee and tea. And so we're going to continue uh, to the next session. So Dr. Michael in Holdemarch, may I thank you uh, for your lecture? And I also want to thank our previous speakers in the very first uh, session uh, for uh, delivering their lectures. I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Suhil now, who will introduce the chair of the second uh, session. Uh, over to you, Suhil. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Ruthimi. Uh, and also uh, the previous speaker. It's been a wonderful morning so far, and I want to uh, now uh, formally start the, this next session, which is going to be chaired by my able colleague from Dubai, uh, Dr. 
uh, Gofrani and uh, Afshin Gofrani, who is a plastic and hand surgeon, an eminent one, experienced one, very diverse experience around the globe. And he's uh, here wow. with us to take us through the next session. And we have already got speakers lined up. Uh, we have uh, uh, the next speakers who will be introduced by uh, Dr. Gofrani. So uh, Dr. Gofrani, uh, over to you and please enjoy. Thank you. So we are just trying to get him on board. And I think there is some issue with the microphone. So Kevin, can you take a look at the microphone of Dr. Gofrani? Uh, and we will add the next speaker. Meanwhile, um, the additional secretary uh, from Ministry of Health. And I think we, we got Dr. Gofrani back. So you want to check now? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, Dr. Gufrani, we can hear you now. Please go ahead. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yes, we can. Excellent. First of all, welcome to all from Dubai. I am excited and honored to be part of this conference. And uh, I also want to thank the organizing committee and Dr. Suhail and Professor Rotimi and everybody else involved for this great accomplishment so far. And without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker for today. The title of the talk is Telemedicine Adoption, Fusion of Scientific Approach and Strong Political Will. Uh, the presenter is uh, Barista Nabil Ahmad Awan, who is an additional Secretary of Health of the Ministry of Health in Pakistan. Mr. Awan, please start your talk and also introduce yourself to the audience. Thank you very much, Dr. Gofrani. It is indeed a matter of privilege and honor for me to, to be talking to you in Dubai and all of our friends and colleagues in UK and elsewhere. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I have a small presentation to make and if you allow, uh, should I uh, share the screen? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you can see yeah, see the slide. Not yet. Uh, oh, it's starting. Yeah, now we can see it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. The main aim of my small presentation, I hope I won't take more than eight to 10 minutes in going through this, and I won't go in the detail of many things which, which uh, this presentation contains. The main aim and object is to kind of share with all the worthy participants all over the globe that telemedicine is making inroads into our public healthcare system. And we are uh, welcoming it and we are kind of uh, increasing its ingress into our healthcare, uh, healthcare uh, service provision. Uh, in private sector, it is yet to go a long way, I believe. And it is one of those areas which, and, and this point is very important, that I believe that in it is one of those areas in which public sector for a change in a country like Pakistan is ahead of private sector because otherwise usually we find private sector uh, moving ahead of public sector in, in most of the areas. Nonetheless, we'll proceed. Uh, this is the sequence of my presentation. Moving on, uh, I will show in this part of the presentation as to how uh, we have piloted, experimented and practiced telemedicine in primary healthcare sector in, in certain areas of the country. The importance of primary healthcare sector in a country like Pakistan, which is the fifth largest population in the world, can't be overemphasized. It is indeed of critical importance in, up, in uplifting the overall health status of any country for that matter. And in, in our country, it is a basic health unit, which is BHU, and we have got 5,000 of them all over the country. Uh, it is BHU, which is supposed to be the first point of contact of any person with, with the public health care system. We, we have constructed or we have got BHUs for every, in, in theory at least, for about 25,000 people, whereas practically uh, in certain parts of the country, a BHU serves around 100,000 people. 
there is there are issues of geographical accessibility and uh, there are the uh, uh, most nearest bhu maybe in certain villages in certain parts of the country would be around 25 to 40 kilometers away whereas it is in theory supposed to be only about 5 to 8 kilometers away and then there are issues of infrastructure because in a developing country like pakistan we have got issues with our resources and uh, infrastructure uh, there are many bhus which in fafin survey were found operating without any uh, without uh, good infrastructure without hr and they were not in good condition the labs were not working and so on for instance when, uh, just to give you an idea how does a bhu look like i am i am showing certain pictures although uh, the government took many decisions in the recent years to increase the availability of uh, good professional human resource in bhus at the primary healthcare level through certain policy level decisions and uh, the monitoring and uh, accountability of doctors and paramedic staff was increased and uh, 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 with like the attendance with biometric thumb printing and so on but still there were many many and there still are many many issues with the with the supply and provision of good healthcare services at the primary healthcare level and that is where we we tried and piloted telemedicine system in in some of the bhus to see as to if we can use the telemedicine services to improve the provision of primary healthcare service at the lowest rung of our of our health infrastructure which is the bhu we have tried certain models in this respect like the uh, one we tried one hub to many facilities there was hub with their uh, containing doctors and certain facilities were connected with that hub we also tried bhu clustering like one or two or three bhus were clustered together and a doctor was was uh, asked to visit those bhus each day and uh, for instance if three bhus were clustered the doctor would vis uh, would visit bhu 1 on day 1 bhu 2 on day 2 and bhu 3 on day 3 similarly we also arranged on telemedicine basis specialized consultation and connected bhu with the with the tertiary care hospital which would otherwise be around 150 200 kilometers away but we provided services telemedicine services in the bhu for uh, for any tertiary or specialized healthcare services and additionally we also added certain probes on a pilot basis in a bhu whereby the doctor in a tertiary healthcare service uh, facility would be able to see the results and findings of uh, maybe 8 to 9 10 devices uh, on a patient uh, who would be physically present in the bhu in this pilot about which was we which we conducted in 2018 19 about 2 years ago in punjab uh, as you can see that we had uh, around 24000 patient registrations 698 patients were referred further we had 18474 telemed sessions and then you can see the medications prescribed the repeat visits uh recommended gynecology consultations of around 600 and male population was 51% uh, of the total population which was examined and 49% was female population of the total patients examined and then on the left side of the screen you can see the business process how a patient would come to a bhu and then he would be able he or she would be able to get a specialized or tertiary level consultation while physically being present in a bhu Uh, hundreds of kilometers away for the business process uh, i am running a small video only a minute long and uh, then we we'll come back to the presentation please this project of government of punjab is aimed at providing clinical consultations at basic health units where placement of doctors has been a challenge In its first phase, patients are receiving doctor consultations in four BHUs in Mandi Bahaudin district of Punjab from a telemedicine hub located in Lahore. Patients coming to these BHUs are registered in the system using biometrics. 
After taking their ticket from queue management system, patients' vitals are recorded in electronic medical record system. Upon their turn, each patient is seen by doctors based in telemedicine hub. After the consultation, computer-generated prescription in Urdu language is handed over to the patient and medicines provided are recorded in EMR. Expanding this project to around 250 VHUs of Punjab will not just increase availability of medical services in rural areas of Punjab, but will also create job opportunities for female doctors. Doctors from the horse see the patients now and good medicines are given and I'm very happy with the complete process. I, have a, I hope the video could explain how we have used telemedicine and the technology to provide specialized and kind of very uh, superior healthcare service to people who are physically present hundreds of kilometers away. Uh, you can see the BHU clustering. I have already told you how we how we clustered BHUs and uh, and placed one doctor to cover two to three BHUs. Uh, while physically being present in only one center. The specialized consultations in our pilot, uh, there is this hospital in Lahore, which is known as SIMS, Children Hospital Lahore, which is one of the premium children healthcare hospital in the country, and uh, DHQ Hospital DG Khan. We, we connected these hospitals on a rota basis uh, for maybe one or two days a week with, uh, with primary healthcare facilities in DG Khan, which is around six, 700 kilometers away and provided specialized healthcare services to the people living in that area. On the right side, you can see the process flow and statistics. The probes model, as I've already explained, we have also tried this, that uh, these six, seven readings of a patient, while he is sitting in a distant facility, the readings would be available to a doctor sitting in, in, a, in a remote telemed center in real time. And we have used this system on uh, five, six, seven kind of readings that you can see for glockometer, ultrasound, digital pulse oximeter, e-stat, thermometer, ear camera, and hepatitis rapid diagnostic assays. And, uh, and this worked very well for the doctor as well as for the patient too. In future, uh, the title of the presentation given to me today was as to how does the government or the political will uh, looks at the at the idea of telemedicine from the pictures you can see on the screen you can see the president of pakistan chairing a meeting in which uh, the the uh, uh, health minister of pakistan is also sitting and the ceos of leading companies of telemedicine in pakistan are also present so so i can i want to assure all of you that there is a good deal of political will and good deal of ownership at all levels, even to the topmost levels in Pakistan for introduction and for development of the idea of telemedicine in the country. This is a policy that our ministry has recently de uh, developed and drafted. Uh, this policy is in consultation stage at the moment and certain very important consultation levels uh, in coordination with the Pakistan Medical Commission have already been undertaken. And we hope that we we will be issue uh, we will be ready to issue and implement this policy in next couple of weeks for Pakistan. And uh, after this, inshallah, we believe that the idea of telemedicine will go forward. And uh, while I say finally the word thanks, I would like to add a note for the for for all the respectable audience which is hearing me at the moment that in the last one and a half year. As we went through COVID, and like uh, uh, with the rest of the world, the COVID has helped us, the healthcare system in public sector or the healthcare leadership in Pakistan, the, the COVID has helped us understand the importance, significance, and relevance of telemedicine. And uh, now we have started it, and I'm pretty sure and confident that in the months to come by, we will be able to put the idea of telemedicine on an institutionalized basis in our country. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mr. Nabil. That was a very interesting talk. And I like the idea how you help the rural areas to, to get the specialist treatment they need. 
Um, right now, I don't see a question from the audience, but I have one for you. Uh, in this BHUs that you, that you have placed, there is always a doctor present, a GP? Uh, I, strictly speaking, there is supposed to be a doctor present during the day hours, not over the night. The BHU does not serve the people on uh, for emergency services, but it is basically meant for primary health, for preventive health, and for uh, population services, the family planning, etc. So the doctor is supposed to be there during the daytime. A male doctor and a female doctor, both of them. But as I as as I indicated in my presentation, uh, because of uh, infrastructure, because of uh, HR, and because of other problems. We usually kind of don't have doctors present in all BHUs at all times. I understand. It's a process. It's a process. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much and, for that. And, and importantly, and importantly, yeah, as you rightfully said, that it is a process. The telemedicine is helping us in bridging the gap. The exactly. gap was always there. The gap was always there for the last yeah. maybe 100 years. But, but telemedicine is helping us bridging that gap. And that is the beauty of the technology, I believe. I have here a question from uh, our audience. Uh, the question is, do you have stats for other regions of Pakistan? We have... Uh, telemedicine has been tried a bit in, in Sindh, in Karachi. And it has been tried in KPK as well. But as I have already stated, that it is not kind of uh, footed on an institutionalized basis as yet. Like I showed you in the last couple of slides in my presentation that we are formulating a formal policy uh, at the level of federal government for introduction of telemedicine. And after the introduction of this policy, I am pretty sure that we will have it started in other areas as well. In other areas, in Sindh and KPK particularly, there have been pilots and experiments, but they, they are not based, even in Punjab or even in Islamabad, they are not based on an institutionalized basis as yet. Understand, understand. Thank you for that. So if there are no other questions, I want to thank you again for your presentation. And we will move on to our next speaker. According to my plan, the next speaker would be Dr. Samir Alaham. Is that correct? Uh, he's actually not available right now. So you can take up the, the speaker after that, please. Excellent. Okay. So the next talk will be by Mr. Charles Loaf. Uh, the title is The Technological Evolution of Telemedicine Based Infrastructures, Past, Present, and Future. Mr. Loaf is the past president of the Telemedicine Unit of the Royal Society of Medicine in England. Mr. Loaf, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so uh, I, I'm showing my presentation now. Can you tell me whether it has been uh, displayed? Can, can Not you try it? Can, can you see my presentation? If you're using okay. a MacBook, it might be a problem, but try try and share no, the I'm screen. Not, I'm not using a MacBook. So you just have to use the share screen option, not the video option, on the share screen tab. Well, I'm pressing the share screen option and nothing seems to be happening. If you, if you click on share screen, it will give you two options, video or share screen. And you can That's choose the I'm share screen. Entire screen. Yeah, you got it. Try, try now. So you've now got it, have you? We, have, we haven't seen the your screen yet on the backstage it's coming up now you got it now go ahead. yes right good okay we'll go then 
Right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, um, I am going to be uh, talking as the chief executive of the Digital Health and Care Alliance, which is a group of about 850 uh, SMEs uh, based in the UK. We were set up by the UK government in 2013 uh, to encourage the, uh, the, the development of digital health in the UK. Um, and uh, starting off immediately, um, I, I, my first, the purpose of my first slide is just to make the point that in the past, um, uh, m many uh, uh, treatments, medical treatments, uh, are, were episodic in that it starts off with the patient booking an appointment, uh, the patient describing symptoms, the doctor ordering tests and diagnosing uh, the doctor making a treatment, recording the uh, the, the uh, treatment, and then uh, ending that episode. Uh, and uh, my reason for making this point is to to uh, to uh, uh, in subsequent slides to draw out the fact that uh, telemedicine enables you to do things completely differently. Um, looking specifically at the past, I was one of the uh, three leaders of whole system demonstrator sites in the UK. We were meant to be demonstrating the benefits of telecare and telehealth. Uh, the Department of Health um, invited tenders in 2007, uh, and I did it for the London Borough of Newham. There were, there were just three long-term conditions in those days that we were uh, expected to look at. One was called heart failure. One was called COPD, which is uh, uh, otherwise known as chronic bron bronchitis or emphysema. And the third one was diabetes. The program was just one year. And critically, uh, the, the, the uh, telemedicine was treated as a single intervention uh, and it was and it was delivered on top of existing care, and so unsurprisingly, uh, there were marginal benefits demonstrated. Uh, and uh, as a result of that experience and subsequent experiences, uh, I think many of us have realised that digital is really very different. Uh, if you look at uh, medicine, or or what other people tend to refer to as analog medicine. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's very established. It's a single intervention. Uh, typically, it's a single intervention and you just take a pill. Uh, the impact is normally biochemical. Um, if, if you want to record data, uh, then you have to record data, but it's a manual recording. Um, there is, it, it's, it's genetically variable in its effect. Um, there are uh, adherence issues because you don't know whether people have actually taken their medicine or not. It's a slow development process uh, and uh, um, it's very much something that randomized control trials were designed to evaluate. Um, so when you look at digital, you see something really very different. Firstly, um, with uh, digital, it's typically not the technology itself that 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 that, um, that that does the curing. It's the change in care pathways that the technology enables that does the curing and 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 uh, generates the benefits. And so, th therefore, uh, you've immediately got two interventions there. In addition, you typically have to train staff. You might have to, uh, to, to let some staff go. You might have to recruit some staff uh, and you might have to train patients too. So you've got multiple in interventions which randomized control trials really struggle with. Uh, as I say, the technology is just the enabler. It doesn't deliver the benefit. You've also got multiple customers. You've got to satisfy doctors uh, as well as satisfying patients. It generates lots of data and this is really, really important because it generates lots of data that you can then go off and, and uh, use. Um, you, can, you can test specifics in a way that you can't do uh, with, with, with analog medicine. You've got lots of network effects, too, in that the, the, the more people join to the network, the uh, greater the, the benefit. It's not genetically uh, dependent. 
Um, and there are typically no adherence issues because you know immediately if somebody isn't actually using the technology um, uh, because, because you're not actually getting any response back from them. And so you can talk to them, find out why they, don't, why they aren't using it, uh, and either give them technology that they can use or regretfully say, I'm sorry, we can't help you. Um, there's a very rapid development process for, for uh, medicines. You're looking at something like five years. For technology, it can be down to one week. And so it can be very challenging sometimes to assess the, the uh, benefits. Now, co what COVID-19 has done has directly impacted the uptake of medicine very significantly. There's some really profound moves. And these are the three really important changes that have happened. Um, firstly, we've moved from, from, from taking snapshots of people's health, um, the, the, the basis of episodic care, to providing a continuous view of, of, of somebody's vital signs, uh, how they're feeling, and so on and so forth. Um, we now can, can look at an individual over a significant period of time without relying on an aggregate measure. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a really good example of that, um, when, when I was in London Borough of, of uh, Newham, we had a problem uh, with, um, with the uh, ambulance service that they took some of our uh, people with COPD, this is with uh, uh, congestive lung, lung uh, problems, uh, they, 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 the ambulance service took them into a hospital and when they measured their their, the oxygen content of their blood, they found it was sometimes under 90%. And so their immediate reaction was to say, uh, this is why this person uh, uh, has been, ha we've been asked to take this person into, into hospital. And so they gave them oxygen. And in one or two cases, they died of hypoxia because they just weren't used to that much oxygen. And so uh, one of the really good things we were able to do with our, with, with our, with, with our telemedicine uh, at that time was to be able to pro provide the, the doctors with the average uh, uh, oxygen saturation that these people were living with. So if they were going into a hospital uh, and they, they, they had an oxygen saturation of 89%, say, but that had been their average for some time. Nobody gave them oxygen, uh, and uh, uh, which was a, which was a, obviously a huge improvement of the over their their uh, care. Uh, and finally, um, generic disease as now be, because we're able to look in much finer detail, people have realised um, that 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 some generic diseases are actually a whole range of different ones. Uh, uh, sa sadly, uh, in, in uh, 1992, uh, my first wife died of, of, of uh, breast cancer. And in those days, it was breast cancer. Now there are something like 24 or so variants that have been rec recognized. And uh, maybe many of the people that I'm speaking to know of even more. Um, uh, and so each one of those needs to be treated differently. And of course, that explains why uh, in, in, in the past for things like cancer, um, whilst there were some medicines that treated some people, um, the, 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 the success of, the, of many of those medicines was so low because they were essentially treating a, a whole range of different diseases. Um, uh, so uh, moving on, um, the, the, the role of the primary care physician is therefore starting to change very significantly. Um, and, and of course, there's a serious danger of accentuating uh, health inequalities because the only way you, you, can, you can get uh, telemedicine is if you have access to the equipment. Uh, and there is lots needed to make it happen. So um, in, the, in the future, uh, the original episodic uh, uh, treatment is going to be short-circuited by the, the technology. And we're already seeing in the UK now um, the, the use of, uh, uh, of total triage, where um, when somebody books an appointment now uh, with, their, with their GP, they essentially say, I've got a health issue. They don't say, I want an appointment. And as a result of that, 
um, that they, they're they're able to, uh, to 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 get much better targeted treatment. The technology enables continuous monitoring and recording, uh, and so there is continuous care. Uh, the technology can even now su suggest ideas, and that very much retain, returns agency uh, to, the, to the patient. I'm going to rush these two through these two slides because I've only got 16 minutes to uh, speak in total. Um, just to uh, say that wearables are a very important point, of, pop, uh, the very important part of that, and that by by uh, using different wearables. Um, you can measure all sorts of things in this sort of spider diagram I've shown. So this is my last uh, um, uh, important uh, slide I want to, to make, and that is that actually getting there, uh, realizing that future that I've been asked to, to talk about will require a goodly number of things. Um, one of which is that um, uh, we need more clinical trials of uh, telemedicine. Um, we also need to recognize that sometimes the technology will tell people uh, that they should rest, that they should uh, exercise, and it's not always welcome. So we're going to need to encourage patients to, 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 uh, to, to accept what the technology says, just like they accept what doctors say. Um, then there's the issue of patient-reported uh, uh, measures, otherwise known as PROMs. Uh, in, in that the, there is very little standardization of PROMs at present. And, and clearly, if you're going to expect machines to understand these things, uh, then you need some standardization. There's going to have to be a significantly uh, uh, improved regulation too, because people will now be relying on what machines say uh, rather than relying on humans interpreting those machines. Then there is the issue of uh, suppliers. Suppliers hang on to uh, data uh, and uh, it's not always accessible. So uh, suppliers should be, should be uh, encouraged to share data more. Um, uh, one of the big tests of the technology is when you're taking a, a patient into, into hospital, the paramedic at present calls forward to the hospital or can call forward to the hospital uh, to, to give a summary of, of the patient that they're about to receive. So how can the technology do that instead? It, it can, it's certainly doable, but it's going to be a challenge. And of course, uh, doctors ha have got to be trained. And uh, in the Royal Society of uh, Medicine, uh, we have, we have uh, uh, on, on a number of occasions, uh, been approached by people saying there's very little training uh, at our medical school in digital health at, uh, at all. And this is very much the, the next step in that. So um, uh, moving on to the final two adoption steps, the uh, first one is getting people to accept uh, the authority of a, of a machine. And finally, the elephant in the room, of course, is that many doctors get very frightened uh, about the technology because currently they're very dependent on the, their patient's dependency on them. Uh, and, and, and so uh, they worry that the technology will, will reduce that dependency uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, reduce their authority, which, of course, it won't do, uh, but they're clearly worried about it. Uh, and so, so there's a final challenge, really, to developers uh, that I've given there. So uh, what does this mean uh, for, for doctors? And the answer is uh, a, a change in their role. They'll increasingly likely become care navigators. Uh, they'll, able to be, they'll be able to be more proactive. Um, the challenge will be changing the patient dialogue. Um, uh, with clinicians from what can you do for me to what do I need to do to manage my own health and do I need your help in doing that? Um, uh, a final comment from a doctor on, uh, on one of our webinars was that the digital icing looks great, although it's often on an analog cake. So referral can mean going back to paper processes. There's therefore a need to understand the entire health system and in particular to integrate administration. And uh, that's my presentation. I'm sorry to have done it so quickly, but uh, as I say, I was given only 16 minutes and I think I've just about used that up completely.
Thank you very much. This was indeed a lot of information. And uh, I think one of the most important parts of your presentation was the potential resistance from the practicing physicians. Uh, yeah. Because as you already mentioned, they may feel threatened by it. Uh, you already said a little bit about it, that they shouldn't feel threatened. But what do you think about the numbers of physicians that will be needed, let's say, 15 or 20 years from now? I would assume they, they could decrease, right? Uh, they could decrease. And um, uh, the, 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 some, some of my colleagues paint a future uh, where, where, um, uh, where, where uh, technology will be superior to doctors. Uh, my own view is that um, there will be very few doctors in the future that don't use technology, um, but there will be there will be very very few cases where the technology can treat people without doctors. I think doctors doctors will be in if doctors embrace the technology, it will enhance their craft. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation and. If there is no other question, I don't see one from the audience. I would move on to the next presentation now. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you. So the next presentation is uh, with the title Mother and Child Healthcare via Telemedicine, a case study emerging from a success story. And it's by Dr. Sarah Kuram, digital health strategist and CEO Sahat Kahani in Pakistan. Dr. Kuram, the floor is yours. Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I just want to thank Medical City Online, Dr. Sohail Chukhtai, who's a friend, philosopher, mentor uh, for Sahat Kahani since a long time, and also other colleagues, um, especially my one of my teachers, Professor Shahzad Ali Khan, is here today. So welcome, everyone. I'll spend these next 14, 15 minutes telling you about our work at Sehat Kahani and what we've been able to create with telemedicine in Pakistan. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So please let me know when you can see it. Is it visible? I'm not, not, okay. not yet. Uh, now? Uh, no, it's... Uh, you have to select the screen share and then the, yeah, you got it. Okay. So um, again, my name is Dr. Saar Saeed Khurram. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sehat Kahani. Sehat means health in Urdu and Kahani means story. Uh, we're trying to change the way health stories are written in Pakistan. We're aiming to democratize healthcare for all using telemedicine in the country. And Sehat means, so Sehat Kahani means story of health. I'm a medical doctor by profession. Uh, I've done my postgrad in radiology and public health. And this company has been created by me and my co-founder, Dr. Ifad, who's also a medical doctor by profession. And just why we thought to create Sehat Kahani in Pakistan, we saw two big and very strange challenges. Um, and one of them is very specific to our cultural context. And one of those challenge is the challenge of missing doctors in our country. Um, so Pakistan has a total medical workforce of more than 200,000 doctors. 63% majority of our medical workforce is made up of female doctors. But unfortunately, due to social cultural barriers, a lot of female doctors don't practice after graduation. They become doctor brides. Um, they get married, have children, settle down, and don't practice. 85,000 doctors, female doctors in Pakistan, don't work after graduation. Additionally, a lot of male doctors leave the country for better work opportunities. So in short, the working doctors in Pakistan are very less. That means that we have one doctor for 1,700 patients in the country. And majority of these doctors live in the urban areas and work in the urban areas, creating a big deficiency for patients in the rural areas in Pakistan. What it does for a country like Pakistan is that we rank 154th out of 195 countries in terms of accessibility to healthcare. And we have a lot of maternal and child healthcare issues and issues that can be solved at a primary healthcare level. 
Um, so we're the second worst country in the world for newborns to be born. One woman dies 37 in 37 minutes due to pregnancy. And we have 40% children with stunted growth and extreme high fertility rate as well. Now, all of this is very concerning. But in the middle of this, we have a potential possibility as well. So Pakistan is also one of those countries in the world that has 98 million smartphone users, which is essentially half of our country. We also have 40% internet penetration, and the technology sector in Pakistan is growing. So we thought that since we have a network of female doctors who do not work after graduation and sit at home and leave work at some point of their life, and we have a huge population of patients that do not access physical health care, why can't we connect them through the bit of tick tick technology? And since a lot of work, a lot of talk has been done on telemedicine, we tried to explore the same technology to connect this un untapped, underutilized network of doctors to connect them to patients using a telemedicine solution. So what Sehat Kahani does today is we connect a network of female doctors to patients who need healthcare using a chat, audio, and video-enabled telemedicine solution. And we do it in three ways. So in low-income communities where patients don't have access to healthcare, we create nurse-led telemedicine clinics. These are physical spaces where nurses are sitting, the patient walks up to them, the nurse takes the history and examination, and the nurse connects the patient to the online doctor. But for patients who are smartphone users and live majorly in the urban areas, for them we have a mobile application. And this mobile application can be downloaded by any user, and they can connect to a doctor directly, and the solution is available for them 24 seven, and the doctors are available in less than 60 seconds. These clinics are majorly situated in rural communities or low-income areas. The population that uses the mobile healthcare solution is in the urban areas. And for patients who come to our clinics beyond the clinic hours or who do not know how to use the mobile application, for them, we also have a 24-7 support helpline, which can be available on a feature phone or a button phone as we use it in Pakistan. The mobile application, as I just explained, for the urban users, we further fabricated it for two markets. So it's used by normal consumers, people like you and me, so we can download it and connect to a doctor individually. But we also launched a product for the corporate market because outpatient coverage or OPD doctor coverage is a big question in Pakistan again. So we provide this application to corporates so that their employees can have access to 24-7 healthcare as well. So what's the patient journey for a patient who's using our clinic as well as our mobile application? So when a patient walks up in a low-income community, they walk up into a clinic, which is a two-room space. There's a nurse sitting. The nurse is trained to do their history and examination. And then the nurse connects the patient to the online doctor. After the consultation, prescription is given. And this prescription can be printed at the clinic. In case an urban user uses our mobile application, they create their profile themselves. They have the ability to find a doctor online. They can pay for the consultation, or if they're a corporate user, they, their corporate has paid for it. They can also consult a doctor um, through a chat, audio, or video consultation, and a prescription is shared with them, which can be used to buy medicines uh, through our partners on the application, or they can visit a physical pharmacy as well. We also pride ourselves in becoming an impact business because sustainability is always a big question when you use, when you're creating social enterprises. So Sehat Kahani has always been built with a sustainable model. In our clinics, we charge $1 to $3 for our, for our range of services in the clinics. If the patient uses our consumer application, they can pay as they go per consultation or they can pay through a subscription plan. And if a corporate is using our application, they can use our application through an annual subscription plan, which is based per employee and per year. So Sehat Kahani has been actively working since the last four years in Pakistan. We started humbly, uh, but now we, are, we have the largest network of private telemedicine clinics in Pakistan. We run 35 clinics across all the four provinces. We cover 753 corporations today. We work individually with corporates and also with different insurance partners becoming their online consultation ring. We've done more than half a million consultations till date. And our consumer app has almost 300,000 users. Collectively, we cover a base of 7.2 million people using our application in the low income areas, as well as in the corporate and in the consumer sector. 
If I talk about the disease analysis, then 60% of our users are women, specifically in our clinics, where 90% of the footfall is women. We see a, a lot of primary healthcare diseases, which range from maternal child healthcare issues to diabetes, hypertension. We've seen a lot of COVID-19 patients and mental health as well. And overall, we maintain a 93% success uh, patient satisfaction rate on our client services. In this journey, we've also been able to create a network of 5,000 female doctors, 81% of our doctors in Pakistan and 19% uh, live globally as well. So it's not just a Pakistani, but a global network of female doctors that have been tapped into back into the workforce. Um, when COVID came in Pakistan, we were already working in telemedicine, but te COVID helped all of us understand that how telemedicine can solve a big challenge in Pakistan as the additional secretary Nabil Awan also mentioned. So Sehat Kahani worked actively in the first wave of COVID-19 with the federal government and institution of the federal government called Digital Pakistan to disseminate our app free of cost to the market, to all the individual users so that they can get treated at home. We also recruited a lot of diaspora doctors into Pakistan through um, a project that was launched by the federal government called Gelani Watan. We also worked with the federal and provincial governments in Pakistan to do a tele-ICO project that disseminated our app in ICUs across Pakistan. This was done in collaboration with the Health Services Academy, um, the NCOC, as well as the UNDP Pakistan. We are also integrated with the National Institute of Health Telemedicine platform called Sehat Express as a backup telemedicine provider. Individually in provinces, we've done a lot of work. Um, so with the Balochistan government, we've done our tele-ICU project. With the government of KP, we have worked with their BHUs to upgrade them into telemedicine clinics. We have actively followed up all the patients of COVID-19 um, in the province that I'm in, in Sindh. And we are also actively working with the government of Azad Kashmir in Pakistan to upgrade their basic health units into telemedicine centers as well. We've also made sure that mental health is included into our projects. So we've worked actively in COVID-19, post-COVID-19, to make sure that wherever our consultants are sitting on the Sehat Kahani app, mental health care is also being provided at subsidized rates because mental health care is very expensive in Pakistan and the, there's very little uh, health workforce available for them. Uh, we've, we cover a large corporate base and something that I'm really proud about is that we've not only worked with corporates, but we've also made a solution that can be integrated in other third party applications. So Sehat Kahani app is used as Sehat Kahani app, but in other banking apps, for example, HBL and Bank Alphala in Pakistan, we also white label our solution so that their consumers can also find it easy to use a telemedicine app within their app. And this is something we're replicating for other lifestyle applications as well. Uh, I'm very proud to have a 75% female leadership in the, the company that I've built. We have almost 300 employees in the company. 60% of them come from marginalized areas. And again, 75% are female leaders. We've also become uh, the first female-led company in Pakistan to raise a pre-series A round right, right now. We, we pride ourselves to call, call ourselves our impact business. And we're on our way to raise a series A round. Our plan in the next 18 months is to increase our dissemination uh, of clinics across Pakistan, enter into more public-private partnerships with the government, as Mr. Nabil was also mentioning, upgrading basic health units into telemedicine centers, make sure that our app is available for major players in Pakistan in the corporate sector, as well as we can disseminate it for a consumer market as well. Our overall vision for the next five years is to make sure that we bring back 50,000 female physicians from all over the world and make sure that our platform is so efficient that it can provide good quality healthcare to patients who are coming, not only providing healthcare, but actually working to alter their disease journey, increasing their quality of life. We also plan to expand beyond Pakistan into other regions. Um, and we look at Bangladesh, Sia region, and the MENA region as possibility for expansion because they have similar healthcare challenges, specifically with the refugees that they cater and with the female workforce that they have that does not work as well. We're also heavily working uh, to make sure that technology is better. Um, since I'm, I'm, repre I'm representing Sehat Kahani, I would like to mention here that for the first few years of our business, Dr. Sohil Chukhtai in Medical City Online helped us in tremendously uh, in our clinics providing the telemedicine solution. Now the telemedicine solution that we've created um, within Sehat Kahani, we're working on it to make sure that it has a better disease surveillance system, 
We have a COVID-19 chatbot right now. We're extending that to mental health care as well. Um, we have created a data-driven clinical support system for our doctors. We continuously integrate it. And we're also trying in different ways on how to make sure that our uh, patient journey process is simpler, easier, uh, and efficient for the patient. We also intend to make a revenue of at least $10 million in the next few years, making sure that we're sustainable and growing to a point where we can scale our services within and beyond Pakistan. Um, something that I've seen as my work as a telemedicine player in Pakistan, and I'm so very glad to be a part of the telemedicine revolution at this time in the country, where there is being created uh, a digital healthcare framework for telemedicine and digital health whole as well. It was just launched um, on Friday across the country. But I think that some things that are really going to help standardize the process is A, there's a lo lot of need of training of healthcare professionals in telemedicine, because a lot of healthcare professionals, when they're providing telemedicine services, are not aware of how they should be sitting, how they should be talking to patients on telemedicine. There has to be minimum standards set, and I'm sure that the government is working on them so that we can have legitimate platforms providing these services. There has to be HIPAA compliance available. Um, there has to be data security maintained on these platforms because I see a lot of telemedicine being given on Facebook and WhatsApp and other non-verified, non-secure channels. And most importantly, there has to be reimbursement or incentivization for doctors who are providing telemedicine so that more and more doctors see this as an alternative career and make sure that they're providing. Because if we get more doctors into telemedicine, we can really shorten this gap between doctors and patients in the country and make sure that the same doctor is providing services not only to the patients in their own city, but to the entire Pakistan as well. I just want to thank you, uh, thank you here for listening to me and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Sara. This was a very dynamic and passionate uh, presentation. Um, I don't see any questions right now from the audience, but I have a question for you. Um, out of curiosity, what are the legal liabilities and implications if a patient uses an app and communicates with the doctor and in the patient's opinion, something goes wrong? Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, I think we just uh, lost the connection from with Dr. Sarah Khurram. She may oh, be trying to get back. That's unfortunate. So she's back. Shall we, she's shall back. We move on? Ah, she's okay. Back. She's back. I'm back. I'm back. My apologies. I think my internet was waiting for the right time to disconnect. <laughs> <laughs> so could you hear my question at all? No, I did not. I did okay, not. So I'm curious about the legal implications and liabilities. If a patient uses an app, and communicates with the doctor and the patient's opinion something went wrong yeah can you elaborate on that yeah so um i think that as a medical doctor we're very very aware of medical malpractice and mal negligence that can happen potentially on the platform so when we get a doctor on the platform we have an online learning management system that in which we train the doctor on how to recognize a, um, a primary healthcare, a secondary healthcare, and a tertiary healthcare in issue. So it's actually an algorithm based method in which, for example, if a patient is coming with a primary healthcare issue, they'll deal with the patient. But if there's an emergency, they'll refer the patient to a tertiary healthcare center. So that's how we avoid taking serious patients on the application. The second is that we have an alarm system on the application. If a patient is um, mistreated or if a patient is mal there is some malpractice, they can raise an alarm on the application and let us know. We also have malpractice coverage or, or insurance, which is a small one, but it is there available for our, our, our patients. And then we have very strict uh, audit systems in place to make sure that we are taking feedback from our patients and also auditing our doctors so that if there's any variation uh, for a patient in the treatment of a patient as compared to our guidelines, we can know quickly. Um, and help the patient, help the doctors get their get their um, get their diagnoses or their their processes better. Um, the digital healthcare framework that is now being presented and created, I think that will help all telemedicine companies or digital healthcare companies working in Pakistan really regulate their processes, um, so that if there is any issue or any potential issue of malpractice or mal negligence that can be sorted uh, according to a standardized level. But at a company level, we do really make sure that we're covering all our bases uh, for accurate healthcare diagnosis, treatment for the patients. 
Excellent. Thank you very much for the answer. If there is no other question, I want to thank you again, and uh, we will move on to the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you once again for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. So our next presentation is titled, Is Telehealth Commercially Viable in Africa? Opportunities and Challenges by Dr. Funmi Adewara, who is the founder and CEO and the World Bank multi-award winner in telehealth industry. Do we have Dr. Funmi online? Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon, yeah. everybody. Good Thank afternoon. You for to speak here at this very important um, discussion and debate. I'm happy to share my slide from here. Can you see my slide at all? Um, Not yet. Um, I'm not sure. There is a slide share button at the bottom. Yeah, in the middle. I've clicked on that and I'm using Google Chrome. Are you using a, lab, uh, a Mac or a Windows? I'm using a Mac. So there could be some security issue. Mac has recently updated. Can I send it to you? Yeah. Can you? Can you use Chrome browser rather than Safari? I'm, I'm using Chrome actually. Try try the Safari browser first. There may be some permissions allowed there. Okay. Um, sure. So you have to log off and maybe log in again. Okay. Is that yeah? All right then. Let me try and log off again. Um, we, we we doctors uh, need troubleshooting all the times, whether it's clinic or technology, and I think. Uh, I'm glad that all of us are learning and gaining that momentum to solve our own problems, not just with the patients, but with the laptops and computers too. So, Dr. Gufrani, this is uh, uh, your session is very packed, and uh, after Dr. Funmi Adivara, you've got Professor Dr. Shahzad Ali Khan waiting, and I, he's in the uh, backstage, um, and then we have a Mr. Abdullah Butt. So we will probably not take. Uh, lunch we'll take a working lunch with the audience here and uh, people who are waiting at home uh, will respect their time and may i suggest that we will not take a lunch break and then we will proceed to the third session that's okay. a little announcement um, so so uh, how is telemedicine in emirates in uae at the moment are you using a lot of telemedicine in Emirates, uh, Dr. Gufrani? As far as I can see, we are not using it as much as I would hope. But again, it's a process. And once the physicians see the benefits of it, I'm, I'm definitely sure it will increase in usage. Uh, right now, it's more on the very basic level of patients want to reach out and are not able to travel to see the doctor. There are uh, Zoom meetings and Zoom calls which is the most basic way of telemedicine, if you want to say. And uh, definitely the Zoom consultations have increased significantly during the COVID pandemic. I'm sure everybody has witnessed this uh, across the globe. But uh, yeah, if you want to call it, this is the, the first baby steps towards telemedicine. You, you rightly said baby steps because Zoom, as you know, is video chatting. It's not yes. telemedicine. Exactly. But maybe this could encourage people to get confidence in the use of video-based software. Uh, but video, live video, is a very small part, as you know. We got Dr. Funmi Adivara. Let's yes. try it now. Okay. Keeping your audience engaged, Dr. Funmi <laughs> Thank you. I've actually shared this uh, slide with you. If you want to project it for me from your end. Right. Dr. Suhil, I've, I've shared the slides with you on uh, WhatsApp. Oh, I can't do it on WhatsApp. No, I mean, if you uh, could download it and then share with the presenter. Oh, I, I, have to, I have not connected my this phone uh, to the hospital auditorium. There's okay, a firewall. Okay, Can okay. you email that to me? Okay, then. Let me see. Or, or perhaps, I, are you um, able to share your desktop from that browser? Yeah, so it says here, um, share screen and screen sharing i've done that but it's not sure it's just showing 
your own page and it's not allowing me to show my allow does it not allow certain screens to be shared oh i see okay so let me send it to you by email so does it not allow that it does allow but it doesn't show my own uh, page so let's try okay. that and if i can get that through email i'll quickly share it okay then please drop me your email again on the chat sorry <laughs> i'll do that so let's do that quickly and i'm just sharing in the chat okay And there so you can email your slide this one but this is again uh, an example let's take it as a positive thing that when we are struggling we have ways yeah. to ways to do and come around this is one way uh, we all have become digital but uh, we are in the process of becoming digital and we will face problems and we will solve problems this happens also during patient consultation. Um, I know the last speaker did speak about um, the fact that we have to use HIPAA compliant mechanisms. But where, when you are working in remote areas where there's quite limited options and somebody's life is at stake, you have no option but to use whatever tool is available to you. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I haven't uh, I seen your Apple email. Mac has some issues with the screen sharing in certain software. So I uh, once so I receive your email, I will drop this. Yeah. Um, I haven't I'm seen it. I am refreshing, and as I receive it, I will be able to connect quickly. Okay. What's your email? Uh, I've shared in the chat. Uh, it's not showing the chat. <laughs> okay, so hail ZB, my first name, S U H A I L Z B. Z B B for Bravo and G at gmail.com. Okay, fantastic. It's a public domain email, so I can I can share on the on the public domain. So I'm gonna send that to you. I'll now. probably increase my fan mail on that. <laughs> so we kept a couple of practice sessions, as you know, um, and and that was the, the reason why we did okay. that. I sent it to you. Mm, okay. Um, okay. Uh, not yet. In hospitals, the, the emails usually get um, sometimes scanned, and that is the delay. So while we are sorting, uh, for me, is it appropriate if we can move to the next speaker and then we can have a chat privately? Is I is that reasonable? So. Yeah, yeah, I think so. so. Funny, may I suggest you to take the next speaker while me and uh, for me will discuss on WhatsApp and we start. I was just about to suggest that. Okay. okay, so we will see Dr. Fumi later once the technical issues are uh, sorted out. Uh, the next presentation is by Professor Dr. Shahzad Ali Khan, VC Health Services Academy from Pakistan. The title of the presentation is Telehealth Prospects and Public Health Systems of Pakistan. What can be done? Do we have Professor Shahzad online? Sir Afshin, thank you. Uh, can you can you listen to me? I'm audible. Yeah, we can He's hear not. you. Yeah, okay. we can hear you and we can see you. Okay, thank you. So, um, trying to do the same which uh, she was doing. Uh, and, and let me see this screen share. So you can choose the right tab now so that the screen is shared. So uh, if you can open the presentation, it'll come on the screen now.
So if you can run the presentation, it will come on the screen. Yeah. So I, are you able to share your uh, presentation on the screen? Your screen is now shared, and all you need is to display the PowerPoint on the screen, and we will see it. So try, try it now. Uh, Professor Shahzad, is it uh, some issue with the bandwidth, with the internet? Uh, are you able to move to a better internet signal? I think we are having some technical bandwidth related issue with Professor Shahzad. Um, because I can see the signal very choppy, the way it, the, the voice is coming in. Yeah. Um, Dr. Shahzad, you will have a problem presenting your slides with the low internet. Would you, would you would you like to move to a better area? No, uh, I think uh, Dr. Shahzad, we, shall we shall we retry it? I'm trying to add you to the stream, and if you can just share your presentation on the screen now, we will see your slides. Uh, I, I, may, may I request humbly that we should give it uh, another 30 seconds try and then we can move to the next speaker and we can request you to come back after the next one. Is that okay, Dr. Gufrani? Yeah, that's fine with me. Can we go back to Dr. Fulmi then? Is, is the presentation ready? Uh, I think the presentation has arrived, so I'm going to open the presentation on my side. And I'll share my screen. And Dr. Salat, can we can we humbly request you to join back after the internet signal is better? There is a slight problem with the signal. So we are taking Dr. Funmi next now, and let's see if we can, she can join. She's in the backstage. Yeah. I'm back online. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. We, 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 we're getting the slides up on the screen. OK. Okay, I'm sharing my screen now, and you will be able to see your slides after that. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry about the glitch. <laughs> um, Fumi Adewara, I'm a UK-based physician of Nigerian heritage, and um, I'm the founder of Mobi Health International. Thank you, Dr. Suihil, for this opportunity to share my thoughts and experience working in African market and to discuss the topic, um, the commercial viability of telemedicine in Africa, the opportunities and the challenges. So today I'll be looking at covering, um, giving you a brief background introduction, next slide please, um, about Mobi Health and my journey, and also to then uh, give you an overview of the market opportunity for telemedicine and telehealth across Africa. Discussing, next slide please. I will also be covering on the digital health trends and enablers for the adoption of telehealth in Africa using Mobi Health again as a case study. Um, I'll touch on the challenges that we face um, providing this technology and this um, service in Africa, the investment activities in telehealth companies in Africa, which is a very key component and key factor when you're looking at um, the scalability of the businesses and the commercial viability. Um, and then finally, I will also just give a few commendations, uh, recommendations on this. Next slide, please. So we are a, an integrated digital health provider. Uh, we are registered in the UK and Nigeria. We have a plan to expand into other African markets. We have a bias for Africa because we felt at the time we started November 2017 that that was where the need was greatest. Um, and then, so we launched commercially in January uh, 2020, just before COVID-19 started. Um, but before then, we had been providing pro bono medical advisory services um, online to uh, people across Africa. And um, our mission is very simple, is to make affordable healthcare a reality for the world's population, leveraging on sustainable development goal. So we offer, we started off by offering on-demand uh, video consultation, teleconsultation across our platforms. We offer an end-to-end -end solution. So you come on our platform, you get genuine medic, you don't just get the teleconsultation, you are able to get genuine medication, diagnostics, we do referrals, home health, health education, and local capacity building. We thought that the, the best way to approach the, the um, African healthcare market um, compared to what we have in the West, where you have to build from ground zero up, is to provide that one-stop solution where people do not need to go and look for where to buy medicine again. So um, that's why we created this um, integrated platform. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So we have a, a board uh, and management team cutting across all um, various spectrum of, of this of healthcare, finance, uh, legal, and regulatory uh, um, sectors. So we have here we're privileged to have Professor Jay Sanders as one of our board of um, director and advisor. We have Dr. Rodney Du Palma from here. Professor Jaya Simi is also um, heading our um, clinical governance and um, ethics committee coming in. We have Dr. Bernard Bua from the US, um, who is an expert in echocardiology and has written several te uh, te uh, textbooks on, on that, using point of care ultrasound as well. So we have myself, I'm a, I'm a physician, I trained in Nigeria. Um, I left Nigeria about 15 years ago, and I came here like many of my colleagues to train. I work in the NHS as a stroke physician, and then I worked also in pharmaceutical medicine as a drug safety physician. I have a master's degree from Cambridge University in bioscience enterprise. And I immediately saw technology as an opportunity to change this poor narrative of healthcare. And the next slide, I'm going to be talking about the various uh, reasons why telemedicine can help Africa to leapfrog our healthcare challenges. Next slide, please. So uh, we started off in November 2017. Um, we went and started off in Nigeria. Uh, trying to study the market to understand what is the best solution that will work there, what is the willingness to pay, the ability to pay, and how the service can be scaled to the last mile. Then we also opened the UK office as the headquarters uh, because before then um, it was quite difficult, to be honest, to raise funding. But having a UK status definitely helped us in terms of validation and um, the trust that investors will have in, in our company. And that again, when down the line, I'm going to show how this impacts on ability of uh, entrepreneurs in Africa to raise finance. 
So we uh, did our beta testing and completed that in 2019 while offering pro bono services, and then went on to have the commercial launch um, in, in January. We've today, um, we were able to raise funding through the Villa Melinda Gate Foundation to uh, pilot this uh, platform uh, and test it across, demonstrate proof of concept across um, local government areas, three states in Nigeria. And today we've been able to raise over a million dollars total uh, comprising of both angel investors and uh, grant opportunities. Uh, we have a plan to reach 2 million subscribers by end of 2023, 2022-23, and 10 million subscribers by 2024. Very um, audacious goal indeed. Next slide, please. Yeah, so till date, we've been able to impact over 100,000 lives, providing um, teleconsultation, remote consultation, uh, preventative care screening. We, ha we have an opportunity to use the platform also to support national pandemic response uh, and also on a global stage. Next slide, please. This has cost, uh, earned us several awards globally, including the World Bank Sustainable Development Goal Award last year. I was one of the seven winners in the world across um, um, competition across 2,400 women. Uh, we're also being supported by the Africa Investment Bank and Africa Investment Forum. Uh, we have won the Africa, we were one of the top 100 solutions for Africa versus virus challenge. Like I mentioned earlier, we got the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation grant. Um, we made the finalist for um, Cisco Global Problem Solver Award. We won the Sanofi Africa Tech Challenge Award last year in Paris as well. And I was one of the uh, female tech founders uh, winners of the Female Tech Founders Award, sponsored by the UK government last year uh, in here in the UK. Thank you. Next slide. So why is telemedicine um, right for Africa? Well, uh, like the previous speaker uh, who spoke for, uh, about the situation in Pakistan, uh, I kind of share some of the sentiment, but our reason is a bit different why we have shortage of doctors as one of the critical barriers to access today. Africa bears 25% of the global disease burden, but we have only 2% of world doctors. And it's not because they're sitting at home uh, uh, as women not working. No, it's because... Um, 70% of our workforce leave the continent to the West in search of greener pasture for various reasons, poor remuneration, lack of access to um, uh, robust uh, postgraduate training uh, and so many other factors. So we have a shortage of doctors because we have only 72,000 registered doctors to a population of 200 million people. But of that 72,000 registered doctors, more than half of us work outside the continent. Um, and 90% of those that are left behind want to leave at the earliest opportunity. So it is a common problem across Africa, not just Nigeria. Um, and, and again, that creates a big barrier to access. And that's on top of various other poor, um, uh, various other barriers to access, including poor infrastructure, lack, uh, the long distance travel to health facilities, the exposure to counterfeit medicines, and the high cost of treatment, the poor health insurance coverage. Less than 5% of African population have any form of health insurance. And a continent with terrible, um, with a, a very massive number of unemployment and poverty, 70% of healthcare expenditures come out of pocket. So it is not uh, surprising that we have high morbidity and mortality. The continent accounts for more than two thirds of maternal morbidity and mortality. And every two minutes, a child in sub-Saharan Africa dies from complications of malaria. Well, but Africa is one of the fastest growing market when you look at it in terms of the mobile technology adoption. We have nearly half a billion mobile subscribers, 30% smartphone penetration. Why should this be that every two minutes a child will be dying from malaria when we can use technology to change that poor narrative? And that's why I founded Mobi Health. Next slide, please. So you all know about the global telehealth market. I don't want to bore you with the details, but it's growing exponentially. This slide was even before COVID-19. We saw um, that we've seen the trajectory um, for most established telehealth companies like Teladoc and American Well um, and, and, and the rest of it. We have seen tremendous uh, increase in growth rate, CAGR of about 20%, 20 to 25% across um, various um, telehealth uh, pro product segment. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So in Africa, you have 
a tremendous opportunity to to deploy telehealth uh, and and this is because 95 percent of people of africa's 1.3 billion population lack access to basic health care and telemedicine can is a fraction of a face-to-face -face visit as we know it is cost effective time efficient and it is a solution that will help africa to leapfrog our health care challenges so we have an opportunity in Nigeria, over 200 million population, Ethiopia, 109 million population. But there are factors that you would like to consider when you're entering into this market. You want to think about the mobile penetration. Um, Nigeria, like I said, 90% mobile penetration. Ethiopia, not quite so. Uh, you're thinking about the ease of doing business in the, com uh, in the country. Government policies are there, cohesive digital health policies that will attract investment into your venture. And of course, the size of the market. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at the global telemedicine, telehealth market opportunity, it's estimated to reach 130 billion by 2025. Uh, Africa and Middle East will account for $5.4 billion of that market. It's growing quite fast as well. Um, the total CAGR of 20 to 25% globally, but Africa is, it, uh, is estimated to reach about 10% growth rate. Currently, Nigeria's medical tourism accounts for over $1.3 billion. During COVID-19, um, many of those who could afford the services, who could afford to travel for medical tourism, actually could not travel because of the lockdown. So telemedicine came handy as a safety net for them to be able to see their doctors abroad and pay a premium price for that. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at the enablers of adoption of telehealth across Africa, you're looking at the population that have access to mobile phones. You're also looking at the smartphone users, but you're not just looking at that. We have created a solution that cuts across all spectrum of the population, whether or not you have access to tele uh, mobile phones or whether you are digitally um, savvy. So we have over 45,000 applications that have been developed or that are in the pipeline in Africa. So Africa is not really... Um, uh, is not deficient at all in terms of innovation from medication dispensary applications where you have smart box where people can use SMS to get their medication to Matiba Boo that you use for uh, malaria parasite diagnosis, 83% um, accuracy. And then you have the um, RX scanner that helps to detect whether a medication you're taking is genuine or not, again, addressing the counterfeit medicine problems. And then you have the, of course, uh, the remote monitoring and management using point of care diagnostics, uh, and then the EMR and telehealth um, uh, companies like ours that have been created. So all these are factors that are en enabling the adoption of telemedicine across Africa. Next slide, please. Uh, but yes, with this comes challenges. Uh, and one of the uh, greatest challenges that we face in Africa, again, has to do with poor funding. Uh, if you look at the um, amount of funds that has gone into uh, various sectors, we know that fintech is way, way, way up there and healthcare is way, way, way at the bottom. And, and I'm going to elaborate on that because that's a critical factor when it comes to scalability of these um, uh, technologies across Africa. We have the lack of digital infrastructure. Again, uh, the high cost of internet means that people have to pay times four, four times the cost of one gigabyte of data compared to Western counterparts. So when you're building a solution for Africa, you have to factor that in that, um, how are they going to be able to access the services? Because if you're having a teleconsultation and a patient ran out of data, it's going to, of course, impact on your diagnosis and the user experience as well. Uh, we have, uh, of course, existing uh, digital um, divide and existing healthcare disparity. Like I said, 75% of people who live in rural areas and most of the doctors who are left are in the urban areas. Most of the facilities are in, in urban areas. But the good thing is that technology can help to uh, narrow this disparity if you create a solution that speaks to that um, group. And then we have the lack of co local content adaptation. Like I said, there are over 45,000 applications that are being developed in Africa, uh, but they are developed in, you know, in the economically predominant, economically dominant languages, English and Chinese. Um, and Africa is a very diverse continent with over 2,000 languages being spoken across the continent. We need to create uh, solutions that uh, speak to those narratives. Next slide, please. So the lack of digital... Um, uh, cohesive digital health policy is a barrier to access uh, and a barrier to access to finance and obviously an, an a, bar a big barrier to access 
to healthcare uh, and, and to and to the and to driving telemedicine to the last mile. If you look at the the investment in telemedicine across Africa compared to what we have in the West, um, only about sixty dollars has been invested across fifty four companies in Africa from two thousand and twelve till two thousand and twenty. And the reason is because again there's lack of coercive digital policy. Investors are very weary to put their money because a, a policy today can come and wipe off all your um, investment. Next slide, please. I won't talk about the various other, um, yeah, I just here um, try to break down the kind of investment that's coming into different sectors. And I think you will have access to these slides after that. Next slide, please. After that, uh, where we went to the business models. So what we have done um, as a com company was to look at the solution that will work best for Africa and created a business model uh, based on our market research and the willingness to pay uh, we have developed our business model is focused on B2B, B2C, and B2G through PPP um, arrangement. So when we, when we went into the market, we were looking at individual and individual selling B2C directly to the client, but also Dr. Fumbi, Dr. Fumbi, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we have one more minute for your presentation. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Could you please go to, towards the uh, slides on business model and then I'll be concluding after that. Thank you. Next slide after that. Yeah. So, so, so the business models that is rife across the continent, again, uh, depends on what the provider is willing to do. We have technology providers only. We have technology and equipment. We have technology, equipment, and specialists. And what Mo Mobi Health has done is to adopt the last one, which is to provide the technology, provide equipment, and also provide specialists. But we're able to adapt depending on the client needs. And to date, we've been able to launch this platform in the Nigerian Armed Forces as a model that is commercially viable. Uh, and in testing the willingness to pay, we, we found out that uh, most of the organizations, the only way that this can be sustainable is if it is integrated into the health insurance scheme. So in our partnership with states and government, we have integrated this into the state insurance scheme and we're talking to so many other uh, partners in a way that they're willing to pay not up to $1, about seven, seven, uh, seven uh, pence per annum per enrollee. And how can this be sustainable? It is, of course, going to be if you have big volume. So if you have like 2 million subscribers on your platform who pay about $1, then you can make this commercially viable. Of course, task shifting is a very critical component of what we do so that we, we have community health workers and extension workers that we train to do the work that doctors do. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk and presentation. Um, if there are questions from our end or from the audience, we will make sure to uh, send it to you via email and you can then answer to them because we are a little bit running out of time. But thank you again very much for your presentation. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So, can we now go to Professor Shahzad's presentation? I cannot hear you. So, hey, I can't hear you. Uh, doc, Dr. Shazad, I've got your presentation, but the internet on your side is slightly choppy and it's not really smooth. Uh, I'm going to put them on the screen, your slide. So your slides are on the screen now. Please go ahead. I think we are, we are facing, as you can see, the low bandwidth issue from uh, Dr. Shazad's side. Um, we'll give it one more try. And Professor Shahzad, are you able to connect? Mm -hmm. 
Why don't you use your mobile phone to connect on the same link? I've got your slides up and you can use your mobile phone to connect. Okay. Please try the mobile phone to connect. There could be a better bandwidth. So these problems, you know, nowadays you can see that so much uh, presentations and communication is on internet. So whenever we are presenting, the internet is like oxygen in the air when you're presenting. And if oxygen is not there, you will start coughing, you will start sneezing, or maybe strangulating, and maybe choked. So it's like oxygen. So can you... Can you listen to me now? Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think we can. Dr. Sadat, can you try and uh, use a better internet signal? I think there is a problem with the internet on your side. Yeah. So as you can see that we are trying our best and we really want Professor Sadat to speak. He's the vice chancellor of a, of a university in Islamabad and he's very, very keen on telemedicine as one of the mediums to be involved in healthcare at his university. He is working hard to provide uh, faculty for telemedicine. Uh, maybe right now he is not in a good internet signal and that's why he's struggling. Uh, please go ahead. Can you hear me now? Uh, I'm putting my phone next to the microphone so that. Okay, so let's start. Yeah, we have the technology to get, uh, you know, get going. You can see so how hard we tried. Two, three, you're, you're two, on, three on three minutes. My... Yeah, two. Yeah, two. <laughs> So two, three minutes. I am now on. So I'll turn off my camera so to get more better wing. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, so can you hear me? Y yes, we can. We can hear you from the other side as well, but uh, since, okay, try okay. now. Yeah, go ahead. So it's okay. So can you go to the next slide? I'll be talking very briefly about some of the public health system issues. So uh, just, yeah, so this is urban Pakistan. When you see from uh, a distance, next, next, and this is rural Pakistan, if you see from a distance, but if you go next, press all, yeah, this is it. So the picture is very nice when we are talking about, you can press all, just press all, yeah, keep on pressing, that's it, that's it. So, but when we go into the depth, now, now press. So if we go into the details closer to the communities, the picture is not that rosy. The picture changes when we uh, go go into the slums and in the, in the urban to rural areas and in, in depth of uh, where the public is, where the masses are. Next. So people of Pakistan, you know, we are 220 million. Next. And this is a picture of the health system loaded with people. So this, this train represents the public health system of Pakistan. Next. Uh, there is a two, three different categories of people. Next. Press three, four times. Yeah. So this is Pakistan and this is Pakistan. On the other hand, there is another side 
of Pakistan, and you can see these are the two extreme uh, conditions which represent majority of the uh, developing country situation, especially the Islamic countries. So we have to deal with these uh, both sides. Next. Health systems, just press all so that, so that I can narrate to save time uh, because we don't have time of animation. So Afshin is looking at me very angry. So, <laughs> so look at this health system. We have a very large public sector, but low coverage, poor quality, 250,000 doctors, 130,000 beds, 108,000 community health workers. I think WHO uh, presented Pakistan as one of the largest infrastructure in the world. Pakistan has the largest infrastructure of public health in the world because we have a huge public sector and we have a very evenly huge, uh, very high private sector. So population accessing is mostly going to the private sector. 20% you government services. Look at the out-of-pocket spending. Oops, it is 80%, 88%. Uh, due to communicable disease, you know, we have 36% deaths and the NCDs are on the rise, which is 56%. And heart disease is number one. Uh, if we see the double burden of disease, you can categorize Pakistan into what we call it as a, as a mixed health system with pro-urban bias, pro-curative bias, and pro-rich bias. Next. Uh, burden of disease is mostly preventable. So just press all these so that we can see the one slide in order to save time. Look at the diarrhea prevalence in the last one month is one in five. Pneumonia is 6%. Anemia in pregnancy is 44%. Diabetes is 13 to 16% in various surveys. One in four above the age of 18 and one in three above the age of 30, uh, sorry, 40 is hypertensive. 9% has hepatitis C, 4% has hepatitis B, huge number of smokers, and very less intake of fruit and vegetable. That is very sad. Being an agriculture country, not having fruit and vegetable, which is, which is recommended by public health professionals around the world, we are not doing that. Only 10% Pakistanis do exercise regularly. 90% is uh, is actually inactive in leisure domain. If you see the leisure domain, 90% population is inactive. Very high prevalence of overweight and very high prevalence of hypercholesterolemia. 20% adult young people are uh, have hypercholesterolemia where even medication is required. Uh, and and see, this story is similar like the previous one of Africa. So uh, you look at the highest neonatal mortality in the world, third largest maternal deaths, and fifth largest TB cases in the world. Next. So this is the scenario in which we need to develop. Uh, so this is something is really wrong with, with us. It, this is not US, Afshin. Don't mind it. So this is us in Pakistan. <laughs> this is not United States. Okay. So... So, so it's a form of insanity to do same thing over and over. So we need to do differently. We need to do something different. So next, we can't expect different results. So this is the slide I'm focusing on. And this is my take-home message for today. Uh, just press two, three times. Yeah. Then again. There are six levers of innovation uh, whenever it comes to eight of our... Uh, so there are six levers of innovation and you start with value proposition and you, you go for supply chain and then you target the customer and then product and services and then process technology and enabling technologies, okay? Out of these, we started wrong. We started on a very wrong footing. We, ha we brought the products of telemedicine in Pakistan 20 years ago when no, no one was ready. We started processing technologies. We, we, we went to the doctors and people and said, that this is uh, this technology innovation is here so please use this as your uh, mainstay so on the right side the three principles which are layers of levers of innovation they are here in pakistan pakistan has this technology innovation and very nicely presented by sara khurram i'm very proud of her uh, she is doing a great job over here and we are partners and health services academy is partner to sayat kahani as well she elaborated it and, and, and she has done quite marvelous thing in very less time. But I am talking about 2000, 2000, year 2000, 2001, when Asif Zafar Saab and others were starting telemedicine in Pakistan. And then there came the high-tech industries. So what we have done is we have developed products and services without asking the other three. Look at the other side which we need. This is business model innovation. So you have a technology innovation, you don't have a business model innovation. So in Pakistan, 
if you want to have some deep roots and like as shin was talking about in uae uh, you need to develop a business model innovation only then will be the doctor and the patient and the com- and the consumer will be interested so you have to see the value in this telemedicine in, in digital health no one sees currently many i i will not say no one after covid many are talking about so many people they don't see the value proposition they don't see the supply chain issues and they cannot target customer because patient is used to physical touch sitting in front of the doctor sitting uh, feeling the pulse the auscultating so if i don't if i go with a knee pain and the doctor doesn't consider just as an auscultate me i get angry because uh, the doctor has treated the patients just by stethoscopes and uh, fetoscopes to the women and uh, women and a lot of gadgetry and i think sohail is doing a lot of artificial intelligence and a lot of uh, value proposition and uh, and supply chain and target customer so i am happy when i started talking with uh, sohail chuktai i was relieved that this is something which is uh, going to help and he knows what is actually needed and same is with sara so this is something which we should be targeting instead of technology innovation we should develop a business model where the doctors and and uh, doctors and all the, the it specialist and the patient representative and behavioral experts they should be sitting together to create what is needed not what we have we have ad- adopted the wrong model we developed something a product a process an enabling technology and we went to the client no this is not the way this is 2020 we need to develop uh, what value we are selling what is the supply chain behind and what is the target customer so start with psychiatry start with hiv aids start with stigma diseases tb uh, and all such diseases where the patient don't want to come to the hospitals you should target that first and there are huge number of these uh, key populations and high risk people who will not be who don't want to come to uh, come at front next karen ji jaldi jaldi so i am not going to detail there are some internal factors and external factors of course in in medical field i have discussed these and and you can share and so hell this is not copyright powerpoint it is copy left so you can share this anywhere this presentation That's okay interesting thank you can you can give to anyone next so top 10 if you see the top trends you can find artificial intelligence internet of medical things telemedicine among the top 10 okay so analytics cloud computing genomics innovative technology so already in 2021 we are heading towards a technology disruptive innovation next uh telemedicine again healthcare trends to watch in 2021 analytics blockchain telehealth telemedicine telehealth internet of things definitely artificial intelligence and machine learning next this is in pakistan uh, by the way ai use is is huge look at the last one only last one wellness 1.5 times increase if oh, i use in public health wellness not diagnosis not treatment not surgery not rehab wellness next so disruptive innovation has landed in the health sector we need purpose we need more than just medical knowledge like afshin was mentioning like i think charles uh, charles low was talking about this thing i was listening to him and he's a great guy he talked about this thing we don't need we don't need just medical knowledge we just don't need to be a clinician not just acting local not just having public health skill but it skills and i think we have proven myself and chuktai have proven today that even when the when the software app or a, or a, or a browser or my, my mac is not allowing my me to share my screen with an external party in south end we can still go ahead with the presentation within few minutes and we can accomplish the task look at this uh, we we should not be thinking of one patient we should be thinking of communities and especially the poor with no access think about those people who have mobile phones but they cannot travel to the cities travel to the shrikhar hospitals in pakistan tele health is the answer next next so i think this is the pray and and next and this is what i say thanks for patient listening my my goal is to to make patient uh, audible listenable he cannot reach to me but i can always reach to him like you see uh, sara is doing and many others are doing thank you very much sohail and sorry for all the botheration and um, not at all it's just been a wonderful player to speak to you and uh, leave leave it to dr gufrani for the thanks note Thank you very much for the dynamic and very good presentation. 
First of all, I was not aware that Pakistan has the highest neonatal uh, um, morbidity in the in the world. I was not aware of that. And um, you said rightly, if you want to change things, you have to convince people of the value of it. And if to put it in simple words for any business and for any any service, the customer always asks what's in it for me. So we have to show them and convince them what's in it for them if they want to be part of this journey, what telemedicine can do for them. And the same applies to the doctors who are on the other side, what's also in it for them. And that's the learning that we all have to accomplish. Connection is not good. So I, I think the connection is uh, low bandwidth packets. So I've just turned off my WhatsApp. So I didn't know that uh, there was going to be a conversation. But <laughs> let, let's let's take the final final comments uh, before we close on this uh, topic. Yeah, thank you. I think I've seen you. I think I've seen you. I think I've seen you. Afshin, I, uh, you you very rightly mentioned that it is the and in in this case it's not the patient who is the customer only the doctor is also a customer that exactly. is a very very strange strange behavior in technology the first consumer or customer is the doctor if he is not willing and Charles Low actually mentioned it still there are people who are resistant to change and uh, Sohail knows a lot I know a lot of people who are still against it but I I mentioned a word which is known as disrupt disruptive innovation uh, they will become dinosaurs they will be extinct if they don't adopt the only permanent thing in the world is change if we don't change we will be up very simply so that's my last comment thank you there, there is one question if you can take uh, yeah yeah sure sure it's on the screen now yeah so the but basic governance should one set up in a digital healthcare system yeah, this is something which you, uh, uh, I think Ashin also asked and you also asked. That the problem is that uh, first we need to listen to what are the what are the priority areas where uh, the only solution should be um, uh, telemedicine. Like I mentioned in psychiatry, in Pakistan, most people won't need to, they won't want to go to the mental hospital or whatever they call it. Uh, so telepsychiatry should be uh, prioritized, number one. Number two, in the digital healthcare setup, the first thing, the governance model should be like, you don't create products out of the blue. You just talk to the physician, talk to the physician who is good in IT. One who is not good in IT and another one who is good in IT. Make them sit on one table, you become the negotiator. Identify values. What are the values coming out of this innovation? And then, of course, supply chain. Where will the supply will come? The doctor will be uh, sort of uh, not knowing what is the supply chain of this, uh, this IT innovation. He's, he doesn't know what will happen after one year or two years. Or, or maybe he will need another license. So that is the thing. So we have to sit together. We have to create a group. And I think Sohail should do this. Uh, to me, I've seen uh, you can sit. I can sit. But he should lead. And I provide the uh, secretariat. I am open. Health Services Academy yeah, can take yeah, the leadership yeah, role yeah, in Pakistan yeah. if you want to do anything. This is a federal level government institute and we can steer it uh, no way. I am also trying to develop a digital health department in my academy for wellness, for public health. So the so health can be of great help. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think that, that concludes this session. Is this right, Sway? Uh, yes, that concludes the session. And I think yeah, I just want to make a small announcement, taking liberty. Uh, we have taken the working lunch, so we will continue with the next presenter once uh, you've said the concluding remarks of your session. Yes. So first of all, I have to say that uh, I'm very, very impressed by the quality of the presentations and also by the knowledge they gave us all. I have a much better understanding of the topic and also of the different challenges that uh, we see in different parts of the world. And we also see the opportunities which are there for the telemedicine, especially in our region here and also in Africa. 
So with that, I uh, want to thank all of you again for attending this wonderful conference. I want to thank the organizers and uh, wish you uh, much fun with the next session. Thank you. It's, it's been wonderful to have you. Uh, I've seen you manage it very well, and I'm sure people will take good messages, positive messages from this conversation. Thank you thank again. You. Thank you. So uh, everyone, whichever, you, wherever you are, and I think uh, this stream has been subdivided into different continents and people are uh, watching in different zones. It has been translated in some zones in different languages. And I think um, it's amazing that how people now can enjoy learning from their own home. Uh, this will continue and this will improve the quality of uh, uh, people's uh, ability to interact in telehealth space. So with uh, without further delay, I want to start the next session. People have taken working lunches and people at home have already been eating without letting us know and they are enjoying their time from home but learning at the same time. Let's move on to the next session and we have a wonderful presenter, a very experienced man in telehealth space. And I have a great pleasure introducing Mr. Abdullah Butt who is the CEO of a company called Educast. Educast is a company which specializes in online medical training. And I leave the rest of introduction to Mr. Abdullah, but he's sort of wealth experience. Please go ahead. Hi, how are you? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sohail, for uh, giving, us the, giving me the honor of uh, introducing myself and my 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 project i presume uh my my internet will not give some pro that, that problem so before uh, i go ahead with my presentation just a short note uh, my organization educast is uh, in pakistan operating as a medical training institute for telehealth as well as we are the one of the largest telemedicine providers in country also uh, we will show you some of our work and how we work. We, we use uh, underutilized female doctors and utilize them and train them. So let me continue with my presentation. If you allow me, please. Uh, screen share. Screen share. How can I get my... Thing? Just like you do on Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Is my presentation coming now? Yeah, it's 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 on the screen now. Please go ahead. Can you see my presentation? Uh, yeah, yes, we can, and we can also hear you and see you. Why Educast? Okay. Okay, good. Uh, our organization Educast they train thousands of underutilized, unutilized, underutilized, out of practice lady doctors on maternal and infant mortality prevention through innovative e-health platform. E-doctor, this is a project which is a collaboration with one of the largest medical university of the country called Dow University of Health Sciences. Mother and child mortality rate. Uh, I presume before my presentation, there have been some uh, really good speakers talking about some great work and some great information. So just uh, I will not waste time on uh, giving those statistics. We have been estimating a 30,000 women dying every year and about 500 maternal deaths uh, in Pakistan per 100,000 live births. And the major cause have been identified because of not non availability of female doctors, especially physically physically or or even electronically not availability of human doctors because majority of them have left practice 85 percent of these doctors do not practice and uh, our guesstimation and work with pmdc has uh, you know they have given us a data of 25000 doctors right now not working in pakistan and in 27 countries so what we have done we have started online training with the medical university and uh, in, in uh, it, it's, it was a global training we provided them government uh, approved certification in family medicine, chiropractics, uh, prescription writing, and enabling them to bring back, to come back into profession using digital era. Because these doctors 
have been uh, an exuberant amount of $35,000 approximately have been spent on these doctors. So you can very well imagine it's billions of billions of hundreds and millions of dollars spent on these 25,000 doctors, female doctors who have not who, are, who have who are out of uh, work and who are not in the healthcare spectrum. So we have we have established a major network right now in 27 countries. We have got 1,000 lady doctors trained in 27 countries. All these female doctors are trained in digital health mode. The number of trained doctors is, is growing 20% per quarter and creating uh, Pakistan's global out of work female doctors network. You can see some visual of that, of this, this network. Placement of these doctors, 600 doctors we have in Pakistan, 90 of them are in Saudi Arabia, 65 of them are in UAE, 50 US, UAE, USA, and so on. This is our global presence of these doctors, few of these doctors globally present in this, in the, uh, these are all, all trained doc doctors with about uh, two years of experience of getting retrained through tele through in family medicine and in, uh, in other topics. These are our partners working with us in the sphere of uh, training these doctors and utilizing them. These are uh, our international partners, especially we are working with Syria, we are working in Yemen, we are working in Afghanistan, and recently we have we are we have started working with Medical City Online. This is one infographic about how we train our how we promote and how we encourage these out of work doctors to come into into the stream of getting back into the practice these are the topics in which we train them and by the way they are all trained by highly skilled doctors from uh, not only pakistan from overseas we are very very honored to have dr naila siddiqui as one of our faculty trained faculty and advisor from uh, royal college and she has been instrumental in uh, providing a support to these doctors in ops, gynae, and telehealth. This, these are infographics about uh, teaching them how to do video consultation. Then we, 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 have, we also conduct hands-on sessions in different parts of Pakistan with our partner hospitals in the basic life support, first aid, x-rays, ECG interpretation, ops, gynae through mannequins. We train these doctors, the, these women, these uh, out of practice women, they come and they get trained and then uh, not only academically, not only online, but also physically they get trained. These are a couple of scopes on which we train them. This is currently our position. We are one of the largest telehealth uh, network in country we have got 70 centers working right now in remote areas in balochistan and in, in punjab in kpk now we are starting in azad kashmir in karachi we have got in sin only we have got about 50 centers working in which people come in and they get they get diagnosed they get checked up by by paramedics and these paramedics connect them with uh, with hospitals with with our uh, remote doctors who are sitting at home in different places all around the globe we have created job opportunities for hundreds of these female doctors. Okay, now coming back to the success of our uh, these retrained doctors through telemedicine in telemedicine by education, these female doctors, number of female doctors are now offering these services in conflict zones in Yemen. We are operating a telecenter in Yemen, in which uh, in uh, province of uh, governorate of uh, Abiyan in uh, the city of district of city of Zinjabar. We are operating with a local NGO. We are transmitting live, doing live consultation through EMR as well as devices as our uh, probes. And the doctors treating them are sitting in Oman, Saudi Arabia, UAE, UK, and Malaysia. As well as we have also established online skill development for Yemeni women in English conversation, mental health counseling, and frontline workers. This is Yaman operation. And this is all to the same doctors who are out of practice. Who were out of practice, now they are practicing. So they are they have reached globally now. This is some of our media coverage.
regarding working in Yemen. Then beside that, we are also working in Palestine. We have recently started operating a, a, a clinic in Ramallah, a mother and child clinic offering maternal and infant mortality reduction uh, consulting services in Ramallah. In Afghanistan, we have signed up for two, two telehealth clinics for maternal and child. Syria, we are starting one clinic in maternal child at Sayyidah Zainab Tom. This is in some uh, our, our media coverage regarding Palestine. Now, at arrival of COVID in April 2020, we offered our services to the government in the province of Sin, one of our, the, the province with 70 million people. And we deputed 450 doctors from 16 countries, got them trained by Stanford, Stanford University Center for Medicine in COVID care, and they got certified. And as of today, we have treated 450,000 patients of COVID care by home isolation and contact tracing. This is the largest number of outbound calls uh, containing people at home and not letting them go out to the hospitals. We have contained them at their home and saved the healthcare, equals healthcare infrastructure by not letting these, these guys reach to hospital. This is the infographic of our display of our doctors and their, their, their country representation from where they operated this, this project of uh, COVID-19. This COVID-19 project was highly pub publicized globally. Islamic Development Bank promoted this project globally and of course other medias also. Okay, expansion of COVID care monitoring in Middle East. We also are these doctors are also providing support services through teleconsultation and telehealth in Saudi Arabia, UAE, Oman, and Qatar by, by providing COVID care services and uh, home isolation services to Pakistani workers and their families in these countries. This is our map. We are right now in Afghanistan, uh, we have reached Afghanistan, Syria. Um, we are moving in, we are in uh, Saudi Arabia, we are in Yemen, now moving into Hadarmouth, Shugra, Khanfar, Abiyan, for all using these same uh, out, of, out of work doctors, uh, these female doctors who were brought back into practice. These are a few of our projects, earlier projects which we did for the National Disaster Management Authority, for uh, uh, mobile clinics. Our organization have been is in telemedicine, working with federal government, provincial government for last 15 years. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Abdullah Bhatsab. I think you've always been a very hardworking person ever since I've known you. And it looks like that you have not stopped. So uh, I have one question before I move to the next presenter. What challenges you have faced while doing your clinics in the rural areas in Pakistan before COVID? Before COVID, challenges in rural areas in Pakistan, the technical challenges and the manpower challenge. The biggest challenge which we faced in Pakistan was that the doctors were not the, 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 the you know, old school doctors are not in favor of telemedicine. This is the biggest challenge we have faced in last 15 years. That was the reason why I decided to start creating our own doctors. That is how we came in, started e-doctors and created doctors who are now tech savvy. We tried everywhere. We talked with universities. We talked with government authorities of creating, of enabling these doctors into digital health. But now after COVID, definitely scenario has changed. Scenario has changed and everybody is talking about telemedicine now. But I'm talking about to 20, 2010 and 2011, and from, from that time when we have, we have been working in, uh, since 20, uh, 2008 into telehealth uh, uh, field in Pakistan, when there were no smartphones and no uh, WhatsApp and Facebook. And so that, that was a time when we were facing problems. And of course, telecom infrastructure was, a, was, was the biggest problem of creating, and then technology and equipment were very, very expensive. Like I just our one of our one of our colleague mentioned, Dr. Asif Zafar. He's a legend in Pakistan telemedicine industry, yeah, and they were using very very expensive equipment for telemedicine, which was difficult to scale. One important point at this point I would like to mention: there is misuse. There is also with 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 us with the start of telemedicine in Pakistan, there is a very heavy misuse of telemedicine also. Like people are thinking of 
video chats, people are thinking of creating an application and offering it to patients and offering it to doctors on a on a eBay model that doctors will receive calls on on application and they will just re share revenue. This is disaster. This is crime. You cannot do that. You have to have physical people coming in somewhere, going somewhere to some medical institute, uh, 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 facility for getting their electronic medical record, record first of all, checked up, their, 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 their basic data checked up after their telemedicine comes in. But you cannot use application. So we are going into litigation into Sin High Court for getting all these applications banned because already High Court Lahore has made a ruling of getting these applications banned, which are doing without electronic medical record and without proper technology. So, so I, I think that you made a good point of regulations, and I think uh, this is where we need. But regulations, they come, which come too early, strangulate the creativity. So it's very important, and we had an opportunity in Pakistan. We still have the opportunity in Pakistan to take telemedicine vertically up working along with the regulatory bodies. And I think uh, Pakistan, the 220 million people, growing bandwidth, rising quality of the cameras on the mobile phones, rising RAM in the mobile phones. The processor speed in the mobile phone is better than five years ago, which allows you to have a multifunctional telemedicine on your mobile phone. So I really appreciate your comments on that. Dr. Saab, thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for this opportunity. We are all available for all of you, all of you in Pakistan and abroad for any kind of services we can provide for the humanity. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. So I think uh, we, we had very uh, insight, insightful look, a review from the work of a hardworking man, how he set up things and how he got people together, a lot of effort. So we wish him well. Um, moving on, we are luckily in this conference, we are 15 minutes early. So... Uh, now, that's a good sign that we are actually very organized. We sacrifice our lunch, but everybody had lunch, I suppose, from home and from here. So shall we move to the next talk? That talk, uh, we we swapped the slots with uh, me and Dr. Sarah Khurram. So she did this talk on my slot. Now I'm doing the talk on her slot. And my topic here is how do we set up a specialist telemedicine clinic? I gave example of a mobile clinic before where there was a van. But now I want to give you an example of a fixed clinic, which actually we have set up physically in Lahore. And I'm going to use a working example that how was this possible and what did we do there? So allow me to share my screen. And I hope that you can see the screen. It's a PDF file. I'm going to roll it down. Now, this is a facility, a, a model facility where you can do intercity telemedicine. You can do international telemedicine. So the benefit of controlling where the patient comes, that point, that you can add sophistication. So when you can add sophistication, you can improve the flow of information from that point to make telemedicine more meaningful. And I'm going to give you examples of that in a video form that how did we get information from that point and how did the clinical judgment was 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 appropriated made made on that so this facility the design i propose is a reception where a patient will come and report the patient would have called the reception before to make an appointment or they can walk in on a fixed time and they can chance it but normally our experience is that patients have called to book an appointment and they only come and pay at the reception so they are ushered into the lobby area where they are given a questionnaire, either on a tablet form or a paper form about their general self. Like, uh, do they have any medical condition known to them? What medications are they taking? And that information, which is going to help the clinician eventually and save time. So while they're waiting, they're filling a form. They can have coffee while they're waiting and then they move to the triage desk the nurse or the technician who's trained in telemedicine will go up and call them so they've spent about 10 minutes here about five minutes at the reception 15 minutes the clock is ticking now they're called in for another 10 minutes at this point at that point at the triage desk 
they will have their electronic medical record made up. Electronic medical record, they brought some papers, they brought some notes, some wraps of the drugs, some x-rays, even MRI scans, reports. They will be all categorized, structured into electronic medical record at the triage desk. So what will that do? That will save the time. That will save the time so that when the clinician abroad or in another city examines, they don't have to do the, the work which is beyond their clinical expertise, beyond their time's uh, uh, kind of value. They don't have to ask that, show me your paperwork. The paperwork will be in the system. And this will be done by a trained guy, a trained nurse. They will take blood pressure, pulse, etc., body weight, BMR, system will calculate. So now this patient is made ready for telemedicine here. So another 15 minutes here. Now five minutes at the reception, 10 minutes here, and then 15 minutes here, 30 minutes so far. Uh, I'm counting the time because I want to add value to the price the patient pays for this consultation. And then there's a GP sitting here, a local GP or a junior specialist in that field. Who will be calling this patient once the patient gets a message from here? Like this triage desk will message, I'm ready now, the patient is ready. So GP will come out, get the patient and make them sit on this seat and they, the GP will sit next to the patient. So there is the specialist abroad or in other city on the large screen on the telemedicine software. So they will greet each other and the specialist will open the electronic medical records created here. And then the whole consultation will start. Now, how much time this specialist has saved with the presence of this triage desk and by a questionnaire here? An enormous, because now the clinician is only gonna ask the relevant question, the clinical questions, which will help make a clinical judgment. And that is important. In a structured teleconsultation system, you have tiers, you have layers. First layer, second layer, and the clinical decision-making layer. At this point, this GP will have access to ultrasound machine, ophthalmoscope, slit lamp, ENT camera, dental camera, cardiac digital stethoscope, and then also fetoscope, and then gynae consultations, even digital colposcope. So the, the specialist abroad sitting in America, in Britain, or a specialist sitting in some other city will get the information as if he or she was with the patient because of the control we have on this site. So the, the variables, whatever variables we face, we would have trained them beforehand. So the patient just comes and sits as the patient would normally do in a clinical outpatient appointment. Patient doesn't have to learn new things. Patient will come and sit. And then the rest of the technology we've already sorted and fixed. Then it's a smooth process. The doctor doesn't have to change anything. Doctor has been trained on the screen and they will get the scan on the screen. If they want to hear the sounds, they will get the sound on the other side. And then the biggest question here, and I keep getting asked this question, who will prescribe this medication? If the doctor in England is writing a medication in Pakistan, is that okay? Well, if the doctor in Pakistan, the GP, takes the responsibility of the primary care, which he would be, then he is only taking a second opinion from a consultant outside. So what that means, that he will be responsible for the prescription after having agreed with the online specialist. So that gives a leverage to increase the online specialist service because this doctor is primarily responsible for the care of the patient onwards. So that doctor is only taking a second opinion from a specialist. And that solves many licensing problems, regulatory problems, and logistic problems as well. So this is a physical setup. 
uh, just a model, reception, lobby, waiting lobby. So what will the receptionist do as a patient arrives? Three to five minutes. Warmly welcome the patient, confirm the patient appointment on the electronic list, mark the patient as arrived because the whole system is chained. We'll complete the payment if already not made. And then the patient is given a tablet to log in, to fill the form. There's an OTP one-time password restriction here so that the patient can later on log in from home into their own dashboard. Patient will fill the basic history form. If it's simple paper, they will fill the paper and we will be getting converted electronically in the next stage. If it's more sophisticated, it will be a tablet automatically in the software system. And then the patient will be ready once the basic form is filled. So what will the patient do after being guided to take a seat in the waiting room? At that point, after the basic history form is filled, it will be verified and checked and they can watch and just wait for the movement to the triage area. So there is the triage area now, the clinical triage room. The patient moves there 10 to 15 minutes maximum time. They will verify the basic history form. They will make the electronic medical record system here. That is the point where all the information that is required to um, make a clinical decision, what patient carries beforehand will be tabulated, like snapshot of the patient for ID sake, digital snapshot of the patient's papers, and then radiographs, they will be all digitized. And the system uh, which has been designed, um, you can take a look at that's in Lahore, in Gulberg, in Citrus Health uh, Center. We have designed a system where the flow is very fast and everything is incorporated by just click of button and it will be, be in the system. And this is a model system which tells that how easy that can be to have a high quality information from the patient to anywhere in the world. And then all these parameters are recorded, single lead ECG as well for the heart rhythm, record heart sounds for 20 seconds will be stored. Fast glucometer. And then we have incre increased the first uh, spot test kits like th thyroid, T3, T4 and TSH. And some other hormones we have put up there for endocrinology practice. And these are the gadgetry we use there. So once the patient moves from triage room to the specialist room, what will happen? That, that room where the patient goes for triage, they will be logged in in the patient account. I don't want to go into details of this point, but that could be individualized. But the idea is that the patient with the nurse or the triage assistant is there for a purpose. And the purpose is to prepare the electronic medical record, basic system, and then prepare the ID, confirm everything, patient basic history as well, patient which patient has given, and the doctor will verify all that saved and stored and prepared before the patient goes to the consultation. And here is the consultation where now the doctor goes straight to the point. That you got chest pain, three months. Does it radiate to the right arm? So the doctor will ask the missing information. And if he's not sure, he will confirm what the patient says. So that gives a head start to the specialist. And there'll be no delay in reaching to the, con to the conclusion or possible conclusion. Now, I want to show you some of the clips which were actually recorded in the clinics, in this clinic, which show how the system information, how the patient information got transmitted across. Let me close that box and I'm gonna open one of the clips. For example, let's open this one. Uh, you're not able to see. Uh, let me open just a minute. I think it's opening on a different screen. I'm going to bring on this screen. So I'm going to bring this over here so you can all see. Okay. So what you see here is an interface where a patient is lying on the couch with a probe on the neck, ultrasound probe, a normal ultrasound machine. And that probe is gu being guided by a cardiologist in America that put the probe here, I want to see the carotid. And that is the quality of image we get.
Can you see the carotid hair? The lumen of the carotid? Margins, the carotid. So that is the quality of ultrasound scan. And we do not require a technician who is qualified in ultrasound imaging because the doctor is guiding the patients, the technician, to put the probe in the right place and then can relate the live imagery. So that's one. What about uh, the eight parameters which we want to know about the patient? The live parameters. For example, these ones. All we have to do is to put the probes on the, uh, the, 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 the wristband, the chest lead, and then use the interconvertibility kit to convert that monitor into a telemedicine monitor. Now that kit we have designed ourselves and we use that kit to incorporate many devices, uh, almost a device a week nowadays, into our telemedicine system. And you can see the eight parameters visible live instantly. And we can save that and store it for the next visit. And then we have liver ultrasound, for example. And uh, we had Dr. Naila Siddiqui, who's going to be presenting as well, monitoring it from London. And patients, and you can see the quality. That, like, like, just take a look. Uh, this one is important. So this is now that clinic where the probe is being put and Dr. Naila is able to guide where to put the probe and then can review the image, the live image. The latency is 0.5 second on normal Pakistan-based internet. We did not use a special internet cable. We used the normal internet, which is available on maybe small devices or handheld devices or tagged with the phone. The point is that you need superior kind of technology to understand that how telemedicine systems work. And then this is all possible. I want to show you one more clip, which is now, uh, I think I've shown it before, uh, regarding the kidney scan, nephrologist. And you can see that there is this probe being guided by a consultant to watch the kidney shadow. And you can have another consultant in the, in the, in the picture as well to, to, to have a board discussion on a, on a kidney scan across thousands of miles in this high quality. That is where we stand today. That is where we are. We just don't, we're not using it appropriately. The problem is that we are depending on someone else to do it. We want hired wisdom. We want to. We have to learn it ourselves, and that is my motivation to learn technology as a doctor as well. By the way, and I think uh, there is. A, I can keep on speaking on that, but I want to respect time and I want to take advantage of 15 minutes ahead of time, and um, I want to uh, stop at this point. And I think. Uh, uh, this is uh, something we can do a lot more than that. We can do much better. Uh, we are, I, my only concern is that despite all the motive and drive and the reasons, we are still not jumping into the sea. We are touching. If we go into the sea, it will learn how, you to, how to swim. But we are too afraid. And the reason uh, for the last 10 years, over, I've seen the transition of telemedicine Wherever telemedicine has not been taking off well, the reason is not the patient. The reason is the doctor. And because doctors, if they're not giving confidence to the patient, then patient will never want to do anything where the doctor is not confident, whether it's in-person appointment or online appointment. And that applies to any country beyond geographical or language or cultural limits. Thank you very much. I. I think um, this uh, can go on, but I really want to uh, stop here. And uh, if there is any comment or question, which can that can be addressed. And otherwise, we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, we have uh, a very uh, well-trained physician with us today. And he is uh, joining us from States at this time. Uh, I want to introduce him and Dr. Ayub Ali. You're on screen now, joining us from 
Missouri, USA? Yes, um, um, from St. Louis, Missouri. Please go ahead and we're all ears. Okay, thank you. Let me share my thing. So you just have to use the share screen button. Yeah. So how do I do it? I I need there's to... a share there's a share screen button. Yeah. And you can choose share screen. It'll op it'll offer you video as well, but you can uh -huh. choose the share screen. Okay. Now, how do I bring my presentation? Yeah, you got it now. You On the it? screen. Okay. You can just go to the slideshow and okay. then we'll be seeing it all. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you guys can see me and my slides, right? Very clearly. We can see you. Thank and you. We can see slides. Hi, my name is Ayub Ali. I'm one of the uh, neonatologists here at uh, St. Louis University, uh, as I mentioned, St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, I'm associate professor of pediatrics and uh, neonatologist. I'm also, um, um, uh, you know, founder uh, and chief medical officer for virtual NICU. So today I'm going to, um, you know, uh, talk about a little bit a very unique form of telemedicine um, that we are providing uh, to the community hospital. Um, Cardinal Glenn Hospital in St. Louis. It's a level four. Uh, regional uh, NICU where we do transfer uh, babies from the regional community hospitals uh, by helicopters, fixed wings, or ground. Um, those babies who cannot be taken care of um, community hospitals, we do transfer here and provide uh, highest level of care, including ECMO for newborn babies. But the issue was that uh, you needed to provide some kind of consultative services of neonatology uh, in the community, where about 10 to 15 percent of the babies, you know, they they were not as sick that could not be stay with their mom, especially when new ones are born. If they are sick, the first thing happen is they need to be transferred, and that's a very traumatic to mother that the separation of baby from mom. Uh, hundreds of miles away and sometime like i said 10 to 15 percent of the babies they do not require that extensive form of uh, care that can still be taken care at the community hospital so about 13 years ago we decided uh, to look into that and i designed this program tela nicu but as you all know you know from every speaker at that time uh, concept of telemedicine, especially in ICU, was very unheard of it. So it was very hard for people to buy into that concept that you can do neonatology services through telemedicine. So I started this project, started talking to the uh, stakeholder. You know, those were major stakeholder was hospital CEO and an administrator to buy into that project. And then the other thing was infrastructure. Even in US 10, 15 years ago, infrastructure was not well developed. Uh, and so we had to uh, talk to the IT people and nursing staff and make sure that everybody is on board and uh, understand the importance of telemedicine. And the reason was a uh, few. So we can provide those highly specialized consultation to the community hospital reduce cost of transferring babies and empowered community hospitals so they can take care of the babies when highly specialized neonatologists can still uh, log in and, and check on those babies. So so with that thing, most of the hospital agreed on thing. And then here we come, um, you know, ribbon cutting ceremony that uh, we started at one hospital and then expanded to seven hospitals in Missouri. So the first uh, uh, and foremost goal was to provide consultation. 
for example, there are babies, you know, who are taking care of um, pediatrician or hospitalist in level two nursery. Level two nurseries are those nurseries in US where babies can deliver and can be taken care of if they need some oxygen or borderline premature babies or those babies who need some septic uh, evaluation. So uh, majority of the time when a baby has some unusual uh, presentation or unusual characteristics, those babies in those days automatically uh, you know, would transfer to tertiary care hospital to be seen by a consultant. So we decided to provide those kinds of consultation uh, online. Uh, so avoid transportation to tertiary care. This is one of the example, this baby, as you can see, perfectly normal, healthy looking baby, except has very unusual rash on the face. This is the kind of rash we call a Sturge Weber syndrome, which is associated with uh, some brain pseudo tumor. This is not an acute problem. So there is no need to separate baby from the mom but having a consultation give reassurance to pediatrician that okay these babies can still be care at the same hospital but after discharge can follow up at tertiary care hospital to have mri done or evaluation by neurologist so consultation was one of the um, uh, you know main goal to provide services to community hospitals to avoid transportation this is another example as you can see the baby looks perfectly healthy only thing is the baby has very unusual uh, rash around both eyes and face. And, and for um, um, pediatrician, sometimes it's worrisome that there could be something going on like, uh, um, you know, sepsis, those sort of nature in newborn babies. But for um, neonatology purpose, this is a very benign rash, pustular melanosis, which happen in newborn babies and does not require any treatment. Then again, this is another example of these babies, you know, looks perfectly okay in terms of only requiring some oxygen. So as a consultation, we don't have to do anything differently. Just we log into their system and look at the x-rays, look at the baby, examine the baby in real time. And, and like, um, um, you know, other presenter mentioned that we have all these devices that you can zoom in and look at the baby's vital signs in real time and see how things look like. So this is one of the example. If we would not have tele um, neurology services, this baby would have been transferred. But looking in real time, reassurance to the pediatrician, looking at ourselves and making sure that baby just have maybe pneumonia, need little treatment with antibiotics, not extensive treatment that desire uh, or uh, trigger tertiary care uh, um, transfer. Other important thing was, uh, you know, as we progress in our venture of um, this telemedicine, there was a lot of desire to be, uh, you know, provide services when there is a life threatening event. For example, again, these babies are born at level two nursery where they have trained pediatrician, but not neonatologist. As things happen in newborn, for example, in this case, you see the baby has required some positive pressure ventilation and as the complication the baby has pneumothorax so pneumothorax is one of the you know life threatening even in newborn babies and that can be very fatal if it is not intervened um, in a timely manner so with the help of the telemedicine you know uh, we get more and more um, uh, brave in terms of helping community pediatricians so here you can see that you know, with the help of this telemedicine, we were able to help community pediatrician to put a needle in the chest, like thoracostomy, in order to relieve the pneumothorax. That's a very life-saving procedure. But, you know, when you log in uh, with the telemedicine thing, you basically walk in step by step and telling them how to do the procedure. And you can see on the screen, vital sign, everything looks perfectly fine. And the child had pneumothorax with thoracotomy, it got resolved. So pediatrician, usually they have in their training, they have done all those procedures as, as a you know, medical practitioner training program. But since this procedure doesn't happen very often, so you know uh, it is hard for them to respond 
So with the help of telemedicine, it's just like walking, you know, on their shoulder, helping them out, telling them what to do. They are the one, they do those things, but we are watching closely, helping them out, guiding through what needs to be done. This is another example of baby who has tension pneumothorax. And here you can see that I'm guiding them how to put a needle and chest tube in order to relieve this pneumothorax. So this is, you know, like direct guiding to this patient. This is another example that, you know, uh, a child uh, has a significant respiratory failure. And as you can see on top right picture, the child is intubated. And here we are guiding pediatrician in those events to, you know, they usually have some kind of problem to getting IV access or something. So here you can see that we guide them step by step how to put the UVC to stabilize patient. So there's another example, you know, in community hospital, sometimes uh, things happen. The baby deliver very prematurely. Here you can see very small baby here, about like 23, 24 week of gestation. And, and here with direct uh, visualization and direct, you know, involvement, we help pediatrician or nurse practitioner to stabilize baby. These babies are going to be transferred regardless, but the first hour is very critical. Transport team takes some time to get to the hospital. Uh, whether driving or flying, but they need like immediate um, uh, help. So we do help to stabilize those smaller baby. Here you can see, you know, uh, uh, baby has been intubated and in one of the uh, picture they are putting lines in. This is another example that, you know, it's not so critical uh, baby, but the, the baby has some issue with uh, respiratory depression and uh, on CPAP and they are trying to get the IV access on this baby. So other uh, aspect of um, teleneonatology was need of like people started uh, demanding that, OK, you know, since we can stabilize baby, we can uh, look at baby in real time. So, you know, can we also be present as a virtual attendance for high risk delivery, like those deliveries, you know, which are imminent, like premature babies or babies with shoulder dystocia or those babies who are you know, delivering because of emergency section, because of fetal distress. So we started attending those deliveries. So it's still the pediatrician is there who is going to be the first responder, but we uh, started uh, presenting ourselves with robotic into the delivery room. So here you can see this is high risk delivery that we are helping. Uh, there's one of the, uh, one of the uh, guy on scrub, this is an anesthesiologist and the other guy is the pediatrician. So the unique thing about uh, community hospital is, you know, they have, they are good community, big hospital, but most of these uh, hospitals are trained in adult and in pediatrics and, and, and neonatal is a little bit uh, more specialized sort of airway management. So they, they do appreciate if we help and guide them just like, you know, what size of ED tube you need, how would they, you need to put in. So here you can see the child is you know, obviously born with uh, respiratory failure and, and the child, uh, you know, has been uh, intubated and we can monitor everything, like what kind of pressure baby is getting, what are their vital signs without even telling them because this is a crisis mode. People don't have time to tell you. So with the help of our robotic thing, we zoom in to the patient and help them out how to intubate, what size need to be done. Then with our camera, we can look at everything. What kind of CPAP is given? What are the vital signs at the time? What is the oxygen saturation? And not even that, we look at, you know, to monitor if the child is intubated. So here you can see the PD cap is attached, which showing the color change to yellow and obviously depth of ETQ by looking at the number. So, so attending uh, high risk deliveries help in order to have a good outcome on those baby before we transfer. This is another example of some other hospital, as you can see, very extreme premature babies is delivered, which has been wrapped with a sarin wrap just because a 26 week baby. Here, again, you can see early resuscitation did help baby, not requiring intubation, just CPAP, you know, stabilizing this baby before transferring. So this is another example, you know, very high risk delivery. And here again, you know, we are guiding them step by step how to stabilize baby. Unfortunately, this baby, as you can see, is bradycardic and requiring chest compression. Again, these kind of events are very unusual for pediatrician. So with the help of 
consultant guiding them through you know intubation and how to do chest compression what profession need to be done and and that would help to support uh, you know um, uh, resuscitation in newborn babies besides that teleneonatology we're also using for education and simulation studies here nrp uh, neonatal resuscitation program training we do uh, using the same robotic you know having the nursing and other neonatal resuscitation provider we use that robotic to teach them and do mock code in order to you know enhance their quality learning uh this is another uh, um, um, venture that we were doing using our own um, virtual um, uh, neonatology uh, cart and device and here we use medical students yeah you know different procedures like you know intubation uh, teaching them how to put center lines like UVCs and how to do face mask breathing and, and uh, having practicing with them and endotracheal intubation. So these are the things that, you know, we have been doing with the virtual NICU and, and um, uh, part of that uh, later on I transformed into um, our um, new venture we call virtual NICU. That's a startup beginning of that thing. So teleneurotology have been doing for past 13 years. And we strongly believe that the importance of virtually presence of neonatology in community does help in order to improve the quality of care. That's not the only one. And now we expanded our services from acute care to follow up care, like those babies who are high risk have been discharged from hospital with the help of this teleneonatology, we can do like nursery follow up visit. Those babies who are extremely premature, like born at 23 weeks of gestation and discharge home, we can do their developmental follow-up. So there are many services that uh, teleneonatologists uh, has been providing in the community hospital. And we are expecting to expand these services uh, throughout the US as well as um, uh, globally. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ayub Ali. It's been now a player uh, listening to such depth of knowledge in a very delicate field of telemedicine. And neonatology itself and then telemedicine on top of that makes it uh, really a very uh, interesting area. And I'm sure the work you're doing, uh, are you publishing your work? That's one question I wanted to ask you. I'm sorry, what did you say? Are you publishing your work? Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, I have published some of the work here in U.S. about the teleneurotology. There are, there are only very few places in U.S. they do this telemedicine. I actually started this project with InTouch, which is now a part of Teladoc. And I was one of the person who was uh, designing those uh, robotic things. So we did, you know, uh, publish some of the data uh, about the patient outcome. And then actually, if you go on Teladoc, there is a case study on my, I'm one of the very earlier adopter for the teleneonatology. So, you know, I I am very excited to provide these services globally and, and because I still believe it does help to improve outcome. But the, like uh, somebody like mentioned, the major problem is, you know, uh, buying in by the physician. It's still there are a lot of neonatologists. <laughs> they don't feel comfortable. Like the services I'm doing, I just showed you this line placement. I don't remember any single time the, the other side they are so so grateful that outcome is good here there's a very you know rewarding part of it is that you help those people and an outcome is good so not everybody feel very comfortable and this can be done internationally as well and that's another part where training of junior uh, yeah. neuro consultants icu consultants can be done it's not just beneficial to the patients i believe it's beneficial to the doctors as well because they will have a senior consultant's uh, presence from across the borders. Yeah. So I, I totally am I am very much convinced of the value it creates. And again, I want to thank you before I move to the next speaker and hopefully we'll connect again uh, uh, on this topic uh, at some point. But thanks for giving me opportunity to share my work. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you, Dr. Yu. So where do we go from here? I think uh, we are now 
we've discussed the clinical side of things we've discussed the benefit to the patients but we've not discussed the business it brings and for survival of any new specialty new technique new trade new business business efficiency is very important if it's not business efficient if it's not creating revenue it will it will go plummeted down because how long philanthropy can survive without revenue so i have mr bud zuroski uh, with me today uh, i want to welcome mr bud zuroski uh, and I'm, i want to see whether he's able to join from his laptop he's on the backstage but maybe because we are going slightly early and there is there has been a presenter in between uh, so maybe he is actually uh, away from the screen so i want to take this opportunity to invite um, a physician in fact we we got mr mr bud zuroski here thank you bud thank you for i'm just going to unmute your mic here we go you know? Sorry, I'm a little early. <laughs> well, Bart, thank you very much for always supporting Medical City Online work as the CEO of the company, and also as a great friend and a great uh, motivation for telehealth business. You have been the business executive for Polycom in what in telehealth, and you have been a telehealth executive for industry in terms of business promotion for God knows many many years. Let me give you the stage. It's yours. Thank you. I am so honored to be part of the uh, conference today because I've been listening to a lot of the uh, presentations and they've been very, very interesting and very insightful. I'm very excited about telemedicine. I have been since 2004 when I got engaged in the industry through a, a company that produced equipment for video conferencing. And the industry has really taken a very sharp interest spike in the last two years because of the pandemic. And it makes everyone look at the business a little different. I wanna take a business view of telemedicine and give some insight on how exciting it is, not just to the clinicians, but to those that are supporting it, specifically with capital. And it, there's a story to be told. So let me see if I could share my screen with you. If you don't mind, I'd so hey, I'd like to go through a please, little. Please, please go ahead. Please go ahead. I hope I could uh, do the technology correctly here. All right. Let me uh, get my PowerPoint on the screen. Can you see that now? Uh, if you can share it, there's a share button at the bottom. I'm in the share, but it doesn't have my screen, so I'm going to select uh, right screen. Right screen. Okay, hold on. Uh, it's as you do in Zoom. Okay. You got it. Now, what are you seeing now? So I know. We are now seeing your slide <laughs> and yourself. Okay. This is the, um, I'm seeing the, uh, agenda on my screen. Do you see yeah. my slide? Okay. Let me get my slide over the screen. You see your desktop now. Can you can you run your slide and we'll see it on the screen? Okay, hold on. You know, I've been in technology for a while, but still it tricks me, right? So there's a tab next to uh, I think wherever your presentation slide is, it will it'll come on the screen. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. I'm going to reshare. Let me pick my slide. There should be a, uh, nope. I can't, I'm trying to get my PowerPoint on the screen. So, hey, so yeah. bear with me for some second. So, first of all, you can share the screen and then go to PowerPoint. Well, I'm going to put my PowerPoint on another screen here. I've got two screens, so let me. Yeah. Now, do you see my PowerPoint now? I think we can. Yes, we can. Okay, so, let me get this into uh, 
presentation mode. Yeah. How's that look? Th that's a presenter view. You want to show I that? I, well, I'm, I don't. I'm. I want to get you into my. So you can share that, but it's best to show the slideshow view, which is. All right, let me get out of this for a second. I, I, well, the problem is I'm on a, two different screens, I think. And, okay. um, I can guide you on that. You just have yeah. to go to slideshow menu and turn off the presenter view option. Slideshow, okay. On my uh, PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. I'm on the PowerPoint now, slideshow, yeah. uh, from beginning. Yeah. All right. There it is. Oh, man, I'm sorry. We might have to go from the presenter uh, mode. OK, that's fine. There, there's a way to kick off. Instead of fooling around with this, um, let me present, share the screen. You'll just have to know what my next slide is. How's that? that that's OK. It's no secret anyway. You're going to show it anyway. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you got it. All right. Let me make this a little larger so it doesn't yeah, you can, you can, and we'll go right into the slide show. Close, 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 all the, close, uh, close the other window, the format background window. You can close that on the right-hand right. side so that it well, takes I'm going to go to slide show. Slide show and just yeah, go to slide show. Not, not this, not this. Oh, no, okay. So I, got go it. To I, I can guide I you on it. that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, I have to apologize, guys. It's fine, but let, let, let me do it. In a tip here, if you go to slideshow menu and just tick off the presenter view, many people might benefit from it. Okay. Yeah, try again. How's that? A little better. I'm not getting off. Getting off. Let me go from. Right. Let's do that. All right, let me uh, do this. Can you see my slideshow now? No, you haven't shared the screen yet. All right, let me share my screen. Yep. So uh, let, let, let me just show you what to do here. Just go to the top menu of slideshow. And go to setup slideshow. Yeah, and there's a setup slideshow. That there's a button called setup slideshow. If you go to there, in the second row of the menus, set no no set go to setup setup setup. Next 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 down down below, this one. No 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 go to setup slideshow. Next one. Next one. Oh this yeah, one. got it. Yeah, Thanks. and just just tick off the bottom right option of presenter view. Just no 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 just tick off no no on this menu. There's a presenter view option. Just tick off that at the bottom right. Yeah, for, just further further down. No, 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 further down to the left. Yeah, tick that off. OK. Now run the slideshow from the bottom end. If you run the slideshow now. Uh, from the beginning? No, you don't. I don't know why you use that. Just go down. There's, there's a slideshow button at the bottom right. Yeah, this one. This one, this one, this one. Yeah. Click on that, please. I got it. OK. So now you've got a full slide. But you're on, on the other screen, perhaps. Yeah. I'm uh, going to So you can sh share that screen, which, which where the slide is. All right, hold on. I'm sorry about this. It's fine. This so my usual uh, gig here. So you just have to share the slide. Uh, once you tick that option off, it will not go into presenter view. 
Please go ahead. Yeah, fine. Well, we're going to go ahead with this because yeah. okay. I think fine. this looks beautiful. You, you can close the click to add notes column below down. Just drag it below. So slide takes most of the space. Well. The click to add notes. Just close the, just drag it down, minimize it. No, further up. Yeah, yeah close that. Yeah, okay. Well, here we go. All right, let's start from the top, okay, Sohail? Yeah, please go ahead. And I want to thank everybody for uh, bearing with the tech technology glitch, but here's what I want to do today. I want to show a little bit about where we take telemedicine from an investor standpoint or from a business standpoint. And start off with a... Um, a look at the industry trends by looking at where the money is. Where's the capital? In this slide, if you can't, if it's tiny enough um, uh, for not seeing this, this dark area says 63% of those surveyed show that they are very interested in advancing more money into telemedicine. This part is we're going to stay the same. So there's a huge opportunity here for money, funding, and grants. This gives a little idea where we are in terms of money. This is from a uh, CB Insights uh, um, report. And just last quarter, the second quarter of this year, over $5 billion has been invested in telemedicine type companies. And the first, the top five deals alone were worth $1.6 billion, 30% of the funding round. Next companies have now joined, telehealth companies have now joined the Unicorn Club, which means their valuation is over a billion dollars. And the, there's over 163 deals, so to speak, that took place during this time. This is very significant in that this runs from uh, four years ago to, to, to this year, the last quarter, or two years ago. And you can see that it's steady, but it's increasing. And so that is an indication that telemedicine is here to stay. Everyone knows this slide. In 2026, there's going to be a $200 billion global market. But this is very important to emphasize as well because the investors see this too. There's a 27 or 23% uh, growth rate, uh, which is also very robust. So this is encouraging sign. The COVID, everyone knows how impactful this has been in the last two years. But we see that telehealth has surged to become 76% interest in the marketplace now from 11% interest prior to COVID. This is another item that investors see and also startup and entrepreneurial companies see. Let's take a look at what's happening in some of the sectors. This is the hospital and payer sector I'd like to focus in on. This is a picture of a $54 million facility in St. Louis, Missouri, the state of Missouri in the United States. It has no waiting rooms, no beds, no patients on site. It serves 38 hospitals in a hub and spoke telemedicine framework. This is a heartbeat for delivering remote care in the same, in the Missouri area. And it's, this is an example how telemedicine is facilitating innovation. Hospitals are, are struggling. They're, they're gonna be in the US. Uh, they have to add wellness incentives because of the value-based reimbursements coming about. They have severe staffing shortages that is felt around the globe. 
they want to expand their rural coverage. It's no different in the U.S. than other places. That's where the need is, the underserved populations. And in the U.S., they have reinvented home health care. They now can bring the hospital to the patient in their own home. So it's a real exciting market that the healthcare providers, the hospitals are facing. Are This is a very interesting slide. I wish it was a little larger. But what this shows from McKinsey um, consultants is that there's a $1.2 trillion market that is represented by outpatient, office, and home health spend in this example. Approximately 259 billion or 20% of this is can be done virtually. That's significant. There's a huge market here that is trending to become a significant portion of the total healthcare spend in outpatient services. And inside here, there's if I can read these for you, there is uh, urgent care, virtual urgent care, virtual offices visit, non or near virtual, which I believe is like telephonics or potline, home health, and tech-enabled medication. These comprise in their study, this is McKenzie and Company, saying that office visits or the medical practitioner now has a, a huge opportunity in taking advantage of this 20% of the Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial dollars available for reimbursement. Very big and very important um, item here. Here's another interesting way to stack up the interest. Uh, American Well, which is a big, uh, large uh, international telemedicine and uh, co consumer health company, had did a study and they lined up, they asked the question, where are from a uh, private, uh, from a um, primary care doctor standpoint, where do you see the most value for getting consultations into your practices? And one to ten is dermatology, psych uh, psychiatric, infectious disease, pain management, neurology, cardiology, rheumatology, gastroenterology, uh, sports medicine, and oncology. So the primary care doctor is dependent on consultations, and they're using telemedicine for that type of input in their practice. And on the converse of that, specialists have been tapped as experts in the field using telemedicine. From an investment standpoint, it sort of, it sort of parallels this. 37% of the uh, marketplace has, or, or the funding deals in the second quarter of this year, uh, were in therapy, coaching, and care management, which follows fairly well these uh, these lines line up. 20% were in remote monitoring and 19% were in, involved in investing in platforms for the providers and the marketplaces that the physicians are investing in. So you can see that things are starting to line up dollars and cents wise, along with the feelings that the physicians themselves are exp expressing. I want to bring up finally a, an example of an entrepreneurial bend on this and what a, a actual case study, if you may. Inside Optic is a startup company, uh, three years old here in Atlanta. It's getting a huge uh, uh, following and uh, has a lot of attention. What they do is they, they are an innovative medical practice business solution that embraces asynchronous telemedicine to improve the at-risk diabetic population of health. Now that's important because diabetic, diabetes is an issue around the globe. What they've done is strengthen the primary care and ophthalmology specialist referral relationship, which is to date has been very siloed. And they add patient revenue, patients and revenues to both. So they're, they're a, an accretive type of program that says right now 
you're functioning fine as a primary care and you're functioning fine as an ophthalmologist, but together with this software, we can bring a little more value to the table. And they've got the rewards. They just recently received a $200,000 grant from United Way up in, in uh, Texas. And they work with Emory University in their, um, th these are the support. So there is support out there for entrepreneurial solutions that can come to market. Okay. Let me uh, show you a little bit what, more what they do. The problem is that the specialist, uh, the, the patients go see a primary care doctor, but they don't see the specialist. So what this company does is through their software and hardware, provide the linkage between the two, the, spe the primary care and the specialist. So that test can now, their platform allows the primary care doctor to pre perform pre-screening tests which typically have been had have been sent to the specialist for the diabetic uh, ophthalmology uh, test. Blindness is a big issue in diabetic. So the the key here is bringing technology to bear, telemedicine technology that allows these two specialists to communicate and both add revenue patients to their practices and create a stronger bond. Very, very important. And this this box here, it says 70, uh, 154 million uh, patients in the US are at high risk for uh, blindness due to diabe diabetes and hypertension. And 90% of uh, vision of uh, vision as um, there's over 90% that have an issue with getting their testing at the right time. So this is a very robust model. If someone's interested, their website is here. And I like to just close by saying that there is an exciting market out there for uh, for not just analyzing telemedicine and looking what the needs are in countries, but also engaging the physician now from a personal standpoint. Having the physician get excited about this, as they said in their website, telemedicine, this telemedicine thing is really not that hard. And it can also add volume and revenue to people's practices so they can go out and do more uh, good for the uh, environment. So that's my message. I think it's very exciting and there's money out there and grants out there that uh, will encourage getting this into the marketplace. So I'd like to leave it as that and I'm sorry for the delay and if there's any questions that you may have, Sohail or others, please let's talk about our discussion. Um, thank you, Bud. It's been, uh, it's been really very informative, the business perspective as you use the last uh, very valuable word, there are grants out there. That means there's need out there. Yeah. There's need to bridge the patient care. There are gaps in healthcare, and that is why people are investing into it. Thank you, you know, very much. Very there's a big gap, if I may ask, there's a big gap, Sohail, in everybody getting excited about telemedicine and making it actually happen. And I think we're reaching the cusp now that the money is there, the, the support is. And I think everyone should be encouraged by that. So what, what do you think of the investments? What is investor looking for in a telehealth project? I don't think they're looking for anything different than any other investment. They're looking for something that solves a gap or a need that isn't there right now, either makes it easier, more convenient, or makes the market expand. They're not necessarily looking for a ha-ha and a brand new uh, game changer. They're just looking for a better mousetrap. And technology now with 5G coming down the road and uh, the last mile was mentioned in an earlier presentation, getting connectivity down to the rural areas in the last mile. Once that is surpassed, we've got, the, the world is, the, is, is just open up for new ideas like telecaregiving global support of research in medicine. So that's where it's headed, and it's very exciting.
And I may add, to give a little sideline here, Medical City Online, with all the 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 uh, advancements that have been taking place in Pakistan, shows that the technology can actually be in place. It can actually be engaged. And that's very, very exciting because it's an actual proof case, right? Well, but I think that this is um, a way to move forward is to get investor on board because you can do small projects from your own pocket. But when it comes to big projects, you would require support of investor. Not only investor, a business has to survive through expertise. And doctors mm -hmm. or entrepreneurs may not have that much experience of doing business. So they will require support of people who can who know how to how to run the business. So thank you very much again. I appreciate your uh, valuable time, uh, and hopefully we'll catch up next um, through other platforms. Thank you, Bud, for your always thank valuable you. contributions. We have uh, now the next speaker, and we have one uh, uh, Dr. Mazen Gadar, who is. Uh, not available at present. Uh, we don't know whether he would be able to join later, but we want to invite our next speaker now, uh, Dr. Naila Siddiq, Dr. Naila Siddiq Kamal Siddiqui. She, she is the Harvard certified in e-health management. And I think this is an important, um, a very, very, very valuable experience she's gained. She, she knew the value of that. She went for it. She spared time to get training. So I respect that. And that is why I thought she could um, share her thoughts and vision, how e-health management can help doctors be better doctors, be more connected doctors, and be more value to the patients. So I'm waiting for her to connect. And I've just got a message from her that I'm coming. I'm just joining. Uh, and she will be here any moment. Uh, we, we heard from last speaker, Mr. Budzurowski, about the investors looking at telehealth as a as a viable option and why they're doing it because there's a parallel growth of technology of hardware technology with the software technology like the resolution of the cameras getting better the ram in the mobile phone more now six four to six gb ram is fairly standard in a modern smartphone then the multiprocessor, multi-core chip or processors are being introduced in smartphones. A multi-core processor allows more functional telemedicine because it has a boost tendency, whereas a single core processor cannot go beyond its final capacity. And that is why mobile phones, you can do a lot more with mobile phones as compared to before. Um, so I think there is this is a good news for people who are looking to develop software, there is a parallel growth in the hardware industry. Imagine that you've got a great software, but the hardware industry is stagnant. That is where the, the two things do not marry. So the third variable would be the people mindset. People who are not very educated, even they want to see a doctor on video, and that's a consumer-driven market, which has a great implication and the positive um, side. I've got Dr. Naila Siddiq with me. Welcome, Dr. Naila Siddiq. Uh, Dr. Naila Kamal Siddiq. Uh, <laughs> you're, uh, you're having a little bit of a difficulty with my surname, so it's all, I'll make it easy for you. So Dr. Naila Siddiqui Kamal. Siddiqui, Naila Siddiqui Kamal. Thank you very That's much. For right. you. Yeah. So uh, you are Harvard certified in e-health management, which shows a lot of time investment and investment of part of your life into this uh, technology. Uh, can you perhaps introduce yourself a little bit more and go right into your topic after that? Thank you. Thank you so much. I would, um, I've had a, a go at uh, getting my slides to share both on Mac and the other uh, Dell computer, but I would um, request you to share my slides if you can. Uh, in the meantime, um, I will give a little bit of introduction to myself. So my name is Dr. Naila Siddiqui Kamal. <clears throat> Originally, I come from Pakistan. I'm based in the UK, having been affiliated with the National Health Service for the past 30 years or so. So um, my interest in technology-enabled healthcare has been right at the beginning. Uh, as I'm a senior lecturer at Imperial College London, 
and have been lead for Opsangaini undergrad courses um, at Imperial. I did a master's in medical education, and this is going back to 2006. My the thesis was based on game-based learning, and <clears throat> I was using technology-enabled um, educational resources and was lucky enough to develop a resource which was an award-winning uh, resource for medical students using technology. And uh, uh, this actually um, uh, resulted in my being having an innovator status at Imperial College. So um, uh, you correctly said that I done a certification program from Howard uh, in 2016 in health informatics purely because of my interest in disruptive and sustainable technologies in healthcare because I could see that uh, healthcare is not going to be delivered or practiced or uh, taught in the way that the traditional models is. Uh, can I have my slides, please? Because I can't see my slides here. Yeah, so right that's, my, that's my introduction. Um, if we go on to um, uh, one other thing that might be relevant with my introduction is that during COVID, I thought there is there needs to be something more that I should be doing uh, academically. And I got myself board certified from the American Board of Telehealth. So that's another um, accreditation in this respect. So let's get on to the to topic that you have uh, requested me to talk about, which is in um, you know the role of telehealth in uh, tele-surveillance and audits and clinical trials. But I will be giving you a little bit of an overview of all the relevant areas for the interest of uh, our viewers and listeners uh, across the globe, because different opportunities for different people. So the broad definition that is used for telemedicine, and often people get confused with telemedicine and telehealth, which sometimes are used synonymously, but for the <clears throat> technical people and people who are involved in this, they know that there is a subtle difference. So telemedicine is the use of communication and information technologies to provide healthcare services without barriers of time and space. Now, when it comes to technology, you know, traditional uh, uh, training of medical uh, uh, people um, does not really address technology as such. So uh, let me give a little bit of an outline for people to see where we are in the landscape of technology. So we are almost at the cusp of our fifth industrial revolution. So the first one being the wheel and then the steam engine, then the uh, you know, the compute, the electricity, then the computers. And then we have entered uh, artificial intelligence and um, robotics. And, uh, you know, the difference between the, the um, trajectory of the industrial revolutions in the initial phases and the recent one is the speed of change. So we need to be wary that, you know, what was what um, it took actually many years for one industrial revolution to get into the next. What we are seeing right now is a very fast momentum of change. So you can say that if the communication was a way of, uh, um, you know, communicating with various remote access people with um, information about disease or about different things related to health. And it goes back to almost 500 BC when human messengers are used to transfer medical advice or even like smoke signals were given that when there was uh, an epidemic or a calamity in a health related calamity in ever, any community. So it really dates back. We can't say that this is telemedicine is the new thing on the block. I've heard a few uh, talks in uh, earlier in the day and very much so that it's not something which is new and it is not something which is um, something that we have to grasp with basic um, concepts. So one thing that I'd like to mention here that technologies are of two types. One are the disruptive technologies and the second are the sustainable technologies. So disruptive technology means that when a technology is totally put aside and something new takes its place. For example, at one time we used to use the floppy disks 
for saving um, uh, data in the computer, but we never know, we don't use floppy disks anymore. They were taken over by CDs and then um, memory sticks, hard drive. So this is kind of, you know, disruption in the technologies that take over while as sustainable uh, technologies are that the technology itself is improved. For example, your iPhone or any phone, you know, you have version one, two, three, four, and so on, because the basic technology is being improved. And I see that in telemedicine, we are going to see both type of technology innovations, which are going to be disruptive as, a, as well as sustainable. And I'll give you examples as we go along. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so here is um, something which I've taken from literature uh, published uh, paper where they talk about various uses and your different presenters have actually touched upon how uh, telemedicine is used for various purposes. So you have telesurveillance, telediagnostics, teletherapeutics um, in different specialties, telesurgery, cardiology. Um, a conferencing is something which is not just for health related uh, conferencing is wide widely used and uh, teletriage um, and there are certain um, adjuvant I would say I mean as clinicians we we are very familiar with the term adjuvant my background is that I am in um, gynae oncology and hence uh, my patients uh, I, I look after or see cancer patients and um, there is the term adjuvant therapy, which is, you know, you have the mainstream treatment and adjuvant therapy, which actually is used in order to support your primary treatment. Similarly, telemedicine has got adjuvant technologies in which you have the M, M Health, which is mobile based um, delivery of uh, healthcare. Similarly, you have the um, devices or wearables and th this goes on, so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So at one end, we were talking about smoke signals and now the futuristic use, and this is not just in, in research, this is being used at the moment and has been, has been used for the last five years, which or last two or three years, definitely five years in research, uh, which is using HoloLens. This is just an example of bringing the doctor to the patient's bedside. And this is an excellent example where in certain situations, such as in care of elderly, and especially in COVID, you know, there has been a catapulting of use of these technologies um, in a rapid motion. What I have had been talking to my, um, you know, the stakeholders in my circumstances and my trust uh, for years, it took only months less or weeks in order to get them to agree to some of the innovative things that I wanted to do in cancer, in gynecological cancer because of COVID. So in adversity also, we had certain opportunities. So here uh, is a perfect example using HoloLens. You can bring the clinician. The clinician can be very you know, far away or uh, they can be in a hub and spoke model or remotely based or second opinion for second opinion. Now another, I don't have the slide here, but there can be devices attached to the patient. For example, um, a telestethoscope, which is attach, attached to the patient, and then you, the clinician far away can get the real-time vitals and monitoring can be observed by the uh, clinician. Next slide, please. Similarly, mixed reality is being used um, in telemedicine in order for you know, medical education, as well as I can foresee there will be a time where this will be the mainstay. Already in, our, in the UK, there are some ambulance services which are using Google Eye in which uh, they can transmit the current situation to the uh, A&E or the emergency department where the patient is uh, uh, being taken to, and already the management from the experts has started. One example I think is very relevant, especially because we have a global audience here, that um, there, uh, there is an example, an excellent example set by uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Rain, who's from, who was actually originally uh, from Afghanistan, and he set up uh, a uh, trauma room and 
trauma room which was linked with Balgram in Afghanistan and he was treating real time war affected um, you know casualties that were coming so we have quite a good um, collection of examples that it is practical next slide please so coming to research and trials uh, which is my mainstream um, uh, topic of the day. So as I was mentioning, because I'm based at Imperial College, in 2007 and 8, we had published something uh, which was game-based learning use, using technology. And some of you might be familiar with Second Life, which is a virtual world. And this enabled not only using telehealth uh, or type of technology or also uh, other um, technological advances using um, Second Life where the patient could have their anonymity because, for example, in my speciality, there are there is a section in under genital urinary um, medicine, which is where, um, you know, people have a taboo to attend. And in Spain, the, um, a gum clinic was, um, you know, developed on Second Life where patients could come in their avatar and their identity would be totally anonymized and a medical um, clinic would be running and giving them advice. So we had actually published this and it was being used in um, medical education. And this is going back 2008. So we are almost 12 years ahead now. Next slide, please. So tele-surveillance, I mean, COVID gives an excellent uh, opportunity for how tele-surveillance has been done over um, various, you know, in various parts of the country. So it was so important to collect accurate data. When we are talking about clinical research and trials, one important thing is the validity and the reliability of the data that is collected. So hence, you know, there is a lot of... Um, focus in setting up clinical trials and research in um, ensuring that the technology that is being used, your data doesn't get dilute and you have accurate uh, methods of collection of data, as well as the next thing is analysis. So in both of these very important pillars of research, uh, telehealth uh, or telemedicine portals are, have proven to be an excellent resource. So here is a study which showed how they did COVID-19 surveillance, mapped it out on a health map. Uh, it was important to have real uh, time information um, and predictive models were built on it using the outflow data. Next slide, please. Similarly, this is the same study which showed the technology bits of it, that 5G networks and robotic technology. Earlier on, um, Dr. Suhail had, um, uh, had shown how he is, has set up clinics where telemedicine and ultrasound uh, remotely is being done. Here is another example where they are using the 5G remote robotic ultrasound. So you don't even need an intermediary person to hold the scan. Uh, scanner um, probe, while as the robotics are doing, and you can maneuver the probe remotely from, you know, a distance. Next slide, please. So um, I'd like to give some examples of how, uh, in my experience and um, uh, practice, what has been happening. So I've been honored to be a uh, speaker at the United Nations WSIS Forum, which is World Society of Information uh, Technology, which is a very um, kind of, you know, credible organization. And uh, in 2018, I was invited to um, present an inaugural workshop on healthcare. So, so far, ICT-related technology-enabled um, you know, uses were discussed, which were not healthcare related. And um, I was uh, honored enough to present that. And since then, every year I've been uh, presenting. This is uh, this year's presentation where we had collaborated with Educast. And I think we, uh, Mr. Abdullah Bhatt was a previous speaker 
on the forum here today as well. And in collaboration, I was in Madrid is the is our uh, Madrid Academy is the umbrella under which we do the educational um, activities. And um, we trained uh, a group of almost 100 uh, public health clinicians uh, with collaboration of Educast. And then this th these trained in ops and gynae clinicians were, used, were uh, helping in the uh, remote access facilities through telehealth. Um, with the collaboration of Educast. So this was presented at um, uh, the WSIS forum, and there was a lot of interest to show a real um, you know, practicing model. Next slide, please. So tele-surveillance, I wanted to show this slide because can you see that it was published in the Journal of American Medical Informatics Association going back to 2007. So it is not something new. Telemedicine has been practiced and you can see the different types of uh, 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 pathological conditions that were being monitored, and especially you know, the ones which are chronic diseases, which are also are uh, amongst the sustainable um, goals set up by the United Nations, such as diabetes, such as cardiac disease, hypertension, pulmonary conditions. These were all being monitored with some form of home tele-surveillance. Next slide, please. Uh, here, um, again, is another um, slide which shows that when you set up a study or a clinical trial, as I was mentioning, earlier, the data that is collected should be extremely um, clean and valid and reliable. The important things in setting up a trial, obviously, you know, we all have been as clinicians involved in uh, research, etc. But the important thing is that here in telemedicine, you will also have to justify the use of telemedicine. You will have to produce ethical and um, legal documentation which show that it meets all the important criteria which enables safe use of telemedicine for clinical trials. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so multi-site trials in telemedicine, this is an excellent paper which, which actually gives a blueprint for the conduct of large multi-site uh, trials in telemedicine. And again, this is not something that is new and we have clear ident uh, you know, clear demarcation and uh, clarity on what are the basic essentials when you are setting up a trial using this technology. Next slide, please. So like anything, like today's example as well, you know, we are all um, experienced in using technology, yet we did have some hiccups. So there are some issues and challenges in implementing multi-site telemedicine clinical trials. So they can be related to technology, they can be related to regulatory reimbursement, they can be the design and initiation. So you have to have very clear designs and uh, you know uh, outcomes and then implementation sustainability. I think uh, one important thing that I would add to this list uh, here would be that, you know, the analysis of the data is extremely important. The same type of data, if analyzed in diff using different framework can give different results. So hence that is extremely important to bear in mind. Next slide, please. So this was another one of my workshops at the WSIS conference this year. Uh, we collaborated, when the pandemic happened, I was contacted by a colleague who's based in uh, the Caribbean and uh, she's purely into ICT and not um, in, um, she's not a, med a medical person. Her company is called the Geotech Vision. And they said that we have a problem here and we would like to bring an app for our community, which is user friendly. And this is before the time that the CDC and the um, NHS had brought in their uh, apps. So I designed this app for um, for them. And it um, is an excellent resource which looked at not only the risk um, stratification of an individual for COVID, but it also looked at 
the general health and well-being of an individual because we wanted it to carry on further on to change a mindset change a behavior of individuals of being more conscious of the health risks and also it was linked with um you know recommendations uh, for um, and uh, you know mitigation of whatever risks there were so this was an excellent workshop which we presented it was the app's name was covid check which i had devised next one please so um this just shows the engagement in telemedicine so um i was invited by the association of telemedicine to, uh, on this particular uh, webinar where we have excellent speakers and facilitators from john hopkins and uh, and um the organization now is called reach uh, which i am a member of and it just shows that we this discussion and this was going back in 2018 or 19 so this discussion was going on for a long time next slide please so um I'd like to share uh, my experience in using remote technology for cancer patients. I know earlier on in the very first few presentations it was mentioned that gynae um gynae patients usually you know remote access may not be ideal but we were in a situation where covid had struck and um cancer patients presenting and their management had to go on and um so uh, as i'm linked with imperial college um through our faculty we presented this webinar to show our experience of telemedicine telenursing and teleoncology how we managed to break bad news what were the um particular criteria as well as techniques we used in order not to lose the personal touch the empathy the um patient centeredness uh, despite being um you know remotely present some patients liked it so much that they said that they would not want uh, they would prefer to have tele uh, medicine because they can be with their family and um uh, and get the information rather than coming to the hospital where their relatives were not allowed at the time so um this is an example of that uh, next please i'm to coming towards the end of my uh presentation so just want to say that the telemedicine in itself uh like i said is not the only thing you have other things which will be and which are um you know contributing towards this effectiveness i blog as the geeky gynecologist in ai med uh forum and this uh, was something that was um published that how we have managed to include artificial intelligence enabled Uh, devices as well as analytics in telemedicine next please i think the next few slides are just showing how the technology has really helped uh, we presented a smart city model at hims uh, 2019 where i was part of the team and this is just showing how technology has changed medical education and practice totally by the way out of interest uh, this is me uh, teaching how to do a breach delivery as you know that uh, or you might not know because you're not obstetricians all of you but um, if a pregnancy is um, a breach present has a pre breach presentation that means the head is not coming first um, it's cesarean section and however sometimes we get caught um off hand when the baby is delivering and because there is not so much of practice our trainees don't get that much practice in these type of uh, situations hence simulation using although you know you can just see my hands there but by using this technology i am uh, i can see the platform where the fetus is coming through the birth canal um you know in a breech pos position while as the trainees who are also linked can see how this is being um uh, delivered i think that is nearly the end of my presentation can we just quickly skip through yeah this is me uh, teaching using hololens and have got a, a virtual skeleton there in front of me 
using HoloLens. So technology is very much in use in medical education, in practice at the moment. My closing remark will, own, will be that watch this space. The way we see telemedicine right now is going to change so rapidly. So the best thing is that people get really engaged with it as it is and be also prepared to um, embrace change. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Naila, for your very uh, deep uh, knowledge and cross-section of e-health management. Uh, several things are really uh, new kind of discussions further. One of them is um, disruptive models. What is actually disruption? And that's uh, you, you very nicely explained. Um, I also want to draw your attention on one point, that how can we use this technology in your view for research, for medical research. Can you perhaps throw some light on that? Yes. So as I was saying that medical research, the most important thing in research is collection of data, analyzing data. Um, uh, and for that, you know, data is what? Data comes from patients. And uh, in order to have methods using telemedicine, which can help in accessing that data, as well as storing it and then analyzing it. All these things can be done using a, um, you know, a developed model of telehealth, which has got the technology in there. So for example, if you have a hub and spoke model and you're delivering healthcare, but you also would like to analyze your, uh, uh, you know, or have a clinical research model there, you can easily, ensure that that data is collected in a secure manner and it is clean data as we call it in research terms and it is analyzed to the outcome that you are looking for. So um, this is something that can really accelerate the publication of material. I think there's so much of work that is going on in all, by going through all the presentations that have we've had today and it will be um, a lost opportunity if that is not published because I think we should publish that um, so that you guys who have done such a hard, so, such a hard work can ha get the recognition academically as well. Thank you very much Dr. Naila again for sparing time and uh, a lot of information on your slides certainly will be shared with your permission if that is the case yeah. i want to invite uh, i want to now uh, invite uh, to close this conference and i have uh, two people with me who will be uh, help, uh, who will be helping me to close this conference one of them is uh, dr abdul wahid and he's uh, at moment uh, not present in the auditorium but he's going to come and he's going to give his insight on what he felt today as an orthopedic surgeon, as a clinician who is taking up to telemedicine. So I'm adding Dr. Abdul Wahid uh, in, the, in the stream. And if he's available, we'll take his remarks. And then we have another gentleman from uh, Namibia to uh, share some thoughts on that. And Dr. Abdul Wahid, are you there? Uh, I don't. Dr. Abdul Wahid is an orthopedic surgeon based in Basildon, and he has been uh, listening to all the conference this morning. And we want to take your view as a doctor who's taking up telemedicine. How would this conference help you? All right. Uh, thank, you thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chutai. I mean, I would say really it has been very useful to attend this conference. Uh, and I, I know it's a very long day. I won't keep people uh, any more busy uh, with us. So I would really just want to say, I mean, uh, we know that uh, we have, as a, like as a whole mankind, have been a very difficult time over the last couple of years because of the pandemic. But where pandemic has given us a lot of grief, it has also given us opportunities to explore the avenues, various avenues to talk to our patients, to communicate with them, to treat them via various digital uh, technologies, 
you just name any like I have done so many clinics and have seen so many patients here in the UK uh, where telephonic consultation, Zoom consultation, WhatsApp videos, just name any any digital like uh, technology. And I think I believe strongly the digital this uh, telemedicine uh, is the future and uh, it most of our like most proportion of our medical practice is going to be via uh, telemedicine in the future. And I think we can, especially in remote areas in very in most of the countries, we can reach to our patients while they are sitting in their homes. I think I will just conclude with this one. So uh, I will uh, back to Dr. Chuktai. Thank you, Dr. Wahid, for um, um, your kind thoughts. Uh, before we close and before we say you bye for today, we have a gentleman who's traveled all the way from Namibia with the president of Namibia uh, as personal physician. And he has a lot of insight on how telemedicine can help Namibia, which is a country of 2.54 billion people. So I invite with a lot of player, Dr. Pohamba to come and join. And he has been, please join me. He's been listening to us all day long. And please say a few words on how you felt today. Good day, everyone. Um, my name is Trianes Poamba, as uh, stated earlier. Um, I'm from a country called Namibia. It's uh, situated in the southern region of Africa. And um, I'm um, a general practitioner based in the capital city of Namibia, which is Windhoek. Um, so we have a very small population um, which is basically in a very big country, if I may put it that way. So our people are kind of scattered all over the country. And, um, you know, we have, you know, specialists, few specialists from, from different disciplines who are also seem to be, you know, grouped in the capital city. So then you will have patients that will need um, um cares in different disciplines, which you can only find in Windhoek, and also looking at um, affordability of traveling all the way about 700 kilometers from the northern part of the country to seek for an orthopedic um, services in Windhoek. It, it's a little bit, it takes a toll on our, on our people. So I think telemedicine will come in very handy um, where our people can basically be 800 kilometers away from the capital city, but still benefiting from the orthopedic services, which you only find in Windhoek or Obsengaini or whatever type of discipline it can be. So I'm looking forward to, to, to see this happening in our country. And uh, yeah, maybe I should just leave it up today. So i um, very happy that um, I came through and uh, it's an experience and uh, looking forward to have this in our country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pahamba. It's, okay. it's, been a, it's been a pleasure having you. You've been here all day long and hope that you carry some very positive message from here. Very much welcome. Thank you. All right. So before we close, um, I want to say a formal thank you to Adam Global. And uh, fortunately, we have the chairman of Adam Global, Dr. Tahir Akhtar here. And uh, I think uh, it's most appropriate if Dr. Tahir Akhtar says bye uh, before Medical City Online formally closes this conference. So Dr. Tahir Akhtar, please join us for the formal closure. Yeah, uh, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jukhtai. It's been an absolute pleasure today to see uh, such a good participation in this global uh, conference which which have seen very high class speakers, all of them experts in the field, and they've all uh, participated from all corners of the world. So well done to everyone. Thank you for your participation. And this is not the end of it. This is only the beginning. So see you all soon. And thank you to Dr. Chuktai uh, for organizing all of this. Thank you to Professor Ruthimi. Uh, our Vice President for Adam Global for uh, organizing this together with uh, uh, my my dearest brother here, uh, Dr. Chuk Thank you so much and uh, see you soon.
Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Afshin Ghafrani from Dubai as well. And Kevin, who's been behind the stage and managing all the difficult tasks. Uh, yes, my, my thanks to both. Uh, we've not forgotten you. So thank you, Dr. Ghafrani, the president of Adam Global Healthcare, and, and Kevin, who's been beavering away in the background. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye now. <laughs>